those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. I've watched your video on Behemoth. You've lectured on Behemoth and you've made some fantastic points. So I wanted to um, ask you, what is the best response to these critics who make the argument that Behemoth was not actually a dinosaur and was probably just a hippo or an elephant, if you've heard of that argument? Um, so to me, that, uh, that evokes a response that you might not expect. It's sadness. <laughs> because as, as someone who humbly approaches the scripture, when I look at Job 40, and I've read it in every translation you can possibly think about, I've, I've talked with Hebrew, people who unpack the, the Hebrew of it. I've looked at that myself. Um, God is himself in the clearest, crispest way possible. He provides 14 characteristics that can only paint to a massive sauropod dinosaur. Let me just give you some, some clues. Some of the biggest clues are, the uh, thanks for pulling up that, that slide there. The, it's number eight. In, in, encourage someone to unpack the Hebrew of number eight, where God calls this the chief or the first in a rank of all of my creative works. Number one, he's talking about land creatures. Number two, he's talking about the chief, the first, the number one in a ranked list. That's the, the implications that the Hebrew is, is trying to convey there. So what other creature in all of history, extinct or living, uh, can fit the chief, the, the biggest, baddest thing that God ever made, only a sauropod dinosaur. Some other things there is he it says that he's playing with and around the beasts of the field. Well, hippos and elephants wouldn't, wouldn't be doing that because lions to this day and tigers wouldn't eat those things. So uh, you've got other clues like what other creature could stand in a river and rage, but it, it's not going to be disturbed. But of, of course, number 14 is the key pin and it says, look, it's unapproachable by anyone other than its maker. There's not a tribe of a hundred people that could get anywhere near a sauropod dinosaur. All it's got to do is turn around. It's got a 250 foot kill zone with a 9,000 pound tail swaying around that the Bible says can sway like a cedar tree. So if you humble yourself under scripture like a child and come to it, and read it in Hebrew, read it in the King James, read it in the NIV, read it whatever version you want. It's not talking about a creature like a hippo or an elephant. They don't have tails that are large. All of those creatures have been tamed by man. They can be approached by man. They're hunted by man. Uh, the, it, so it really, really doesn't fit. And certainly a hippo or an elephant or some would say a crocodile, um, they're, they're certainly not the chief or the first in a list of all God's creations. So my, it's funny. My wife says she's not the biggest fan of dinosaurs. She can kind of take it or leave it, you know, but I disagree with her. And I say, honey, when you go to the new heaven and new earth, if God decides to revitalize the behemoth and bring it back to the new heavens <laughs> and new earth, you and I will sit there with awe and magnificent and magnificence and just gawk at this creature and go, oh my gosh, what it does for me, it evokes worship to see a titanator, a titanosaur or a dreadnoughtus or patagotitan, any of these huge versions of the behemoth that are 130 feet long and 77 tons. It's nothing other than God demonstrating his creative power. When you've got the behemoth, you can't have the long tail without the long neck because there's a, a tension loading and a compressive loading that has to happen with those two things offsetting each other. They demand a creator. I mean, the, the neck vertebrae of, of a behemoth, the higher that you go up of a sauropod, they become more moon pneumatic. They're filled with air. They're 90% honeycomb or filled with air because that the vertebrae have to be strong, but it has to be light. So they demand a creator and God takes credit for it in Job 40 and says, Job, after his friends get done whining for, for 39 chapter, God shows up on the scene. He doesn't console Job. He doesn't offer him any sympathy. He says, Job, have you considered these 12 or 13 animals that I made? And he talks about a deer, an eagle, all these other things. And he says, oh, by, by the way, Job, consider behemoth, which I made along with you. You know, it, it, it goes around the grass, it's not afraid of the beast, it can drink up the Jordan with its mouth, it's got a tail that sways like a cedar tree, and it's a first 
thing in a rank list of all the creations I ever made. And only I can approach it. He's telling Job to sit down and shut up and regard him as the creator, the almighty God who made this creation. So I think it's wonderful to look at Behemoth through that lens. Amen. In light of um, the information you provided uh, regarding the history, including uh, church fathers, what would you say to one of these theistic evolutionists who claim young earth creation is a new invention? The church fathers did not believe the Bible taught a young earth or a global flood for that matter. And apparently modern day uh, young earth creation is a seventh day Adventist invention. I'm not sure if you've heard that, but that claim oh, has yeah, been yeah. thrown around a lot. All right. I'll share my screen very, very quickly just to do a couple of very quick slides. And we probably should hand on to John after this so he has enough time. Um, yes. It's very, very easy to disprove. And by the way, there's a whole like two or three hour program that me and John do. John predominantly does into this, right? But let's just run through a few quick quotes, right? Is the 6,000 years the result of modern fundamentalist thinking? Uh, and again, one of the promotions is that it was this sort of Seventh-day Adventist thinking that was introduced very, very recently. Um, we've already talked about Theophilus of Antioch, right? I mean, this is AD 115. So, you know, only just a, a very early into the church before the real takeover of Roman Catholicism. Creation occurred at 5,529 BC, plus or minus 2,000 years. So, again, you're looking at what we would currently or, you know, around today refer to as a young earth. It's certainly a date of under 10,000 years. It's around 8,000 years. Um, not the tens of thousands, as Plato has written. We've dealt with this quote as well. Um, the fact that the whole philosophy based on the old Chaldeans is wrong because we know that the world has the 6,000 year has not yet completed. Um, 280, 100 years after or so after uh, Theophilus of Antioch. Augustine, another 100 years after, 6,000 years. You're starting to see a bit of a pattern here. Martin Luther, and I think John may even comment on Martin Luther as we go forward, because he was one of the first people to actually talk about fossil wood, right, based on his father's experience from the coal mines. Now, we know from Moses that about 6,000 years ago, the world was not yet in existence. 6,000 years. John Calvin on the age of the earth, albeit the duration of the world now declining to its ultimate end, has not yet attained 6,000 years. God's work was completed not in a moment, but in six days. John Calvin. William Shakespeare. The world, poor world is almost 6,000 years old, from 1599. I mean, this is William Shakespeare, right? And you love the old Shakespeare. Now, I find it a bit boring myself personally, but you've got to admit the influence that he had on language and the way that he would take language and actually manipulate it to make a point that the modern uh, or the modern for his time but the ordinary person could actually understand was incredible 6,000 years popular belief even 1599 Archbishop James Usher is the famous one of course 1581 uh, expert in Semitic languages, historian and scholar. He, in, in Ireland, he was one of the only archbishops to be the archbishop of the Catholic and the Anglican Church. Um, he said the world was created in 4004 BC, or around 6,000 years ago. So now, it's not a modern invention in the slightest. It's based directly out of Scripture. You can find lots of references throughout Scripture as well, talking about things in the past that refer to a young earth as well. Even Jesus himself referred to the implication of a young earth when he said, from the beginning, I've made them male and female. Right? So you'll find not only in Scripture, but also in history, it's a common belief that the earth was less than 10,000 years old and somewhere around the six to 8,000 years old at the most. Um, not a modern day invention in the slightest. So I'll just leave it there. It's a very easy one to kind of uh, get rid of. I'd well, encourage I the listeners, uh, Donnie, uh, the guy who gets most abuse out of this is Augustine. Um, he's the one that the old earthers like to claim as a hero as not believing in 6,000 years and they never quote this verse uh, that Joseph put up uh, and yet there's no, no beyond a shadow of a doubt Augustine may not have known uh, some of the things about Genesis because he talks about the stars did that mean angels uh, he's got all sorts of interesting questions but he is emphatic 
on the 6,000 bit because it was popular. I mean, from Tortalian, you know, the guy who had the fossil shell and that introduced our subject. Uh, so those of you who've been misled by books about Augustine's liberality on having no value for the age of the earth, wake up, open your eyes. You have been deceived, sadly, by, I've got to say, at the best, ignorant uh, Christians who are misusing Augustine and they need to get back whether it's Calvin, Luther, uh, any of the reformers, or even good old Shakespeare that Joseph, did I detect that you didn't like Shakespeare? <laughs> no, 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 I do. I do. I very yeah. much appreciate Shakespeare. Um, it's just my my first experience of Shakespeare was being forced to watch through about three hours of it when I was first dating my wife. So <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be, hey? Exactly, okay. yeah. Uh, you mentioned, we were talking about it before we went live, uh, Topo Isomeres. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, could you touch on that maybe for the audience? I think that would be a good topic. Okay, now the thing is, think of DNA, it, it's it's a double helix. You know, it's like a, a, a long coiled molecule. I mean, some of you who are older might remember when you had landlines with telephone coils, okay? I mean, I'm showing my age a bit, uh, I guess. Um, the point is, it's uh, DNA of each of your your trillions of cells. It, it take one of the DNA from one cell. If you lined everything up end to end, it would be about two meters long. But it's only a few atoms thick. And you think of coils; they get tangled up very easily. So, in fact, living things all have a detangling enzyme and different types of them called topo isomerases. And one class is called gyrase. Okay, but what it does, it snips the DNA and does a bit of, of rearranging and then splices it together again. See, otherwise, DNA would be tangled up and you couldn't actually decode it because it would get tangled up when you try to decode it, but you get tangled up when you try to reproduce it. So without these enzymes working in every living thing we have, DNA would be too tangled up to use. So you think of, of what topo isomerase means. It has to, have to do three things. It has to cut, it has to move, it has to splice back together. See, any one of those um, processes would, would be would not be good enough. You'd have to have every one of them working together. So, in fact, one class of antibiotics that you might take if you're really quite sick is called the um, fluoroquinolone antibiotics. And what that does, it stops the topoisomerase putting the thing back together again. So the bacterial topoisomerase go through the, the DNA, they chop it up, but don't put it back together. So DNA is chopped to smithereens and the bacterium dies. Incredible. Uh, but then you've got the other chicken and egg type problem is that the instructions to build to apply a sum rate are coded on the DNA, but you can't read those instructions unless you have topo isomerase in action, making sure <laughs> the thing doesn't get tangled up in the process of trying to read it. So you've got the thing that the DNA can't work without topo isomerase, but you can't build the topo isomerase without the instructions, which can't be read unless you've got those enzymes already doing their work. Oh, it's, it's so bad for them. It chicken and egg problem after chicken and egg problem oh well, it then, goes all the way yeah yeah it's, it's amazing here's the uh the next question that comes in frank what are some good lines of evidence for the existence of god well we talk about three arguments the cosmological argument from the beginning of the universe the teleological argument which is the fact that the universe is designed it's, it appears to be fine-tuned which is best explained by design. And so is life. Life appears to have a digital code in it that's equivalent to say a software program. And if there's a program, there must be a programmer. That's part of it, what we call the teleological argument, also known as the design argument. So in other words, there's two aspects to design. There's the design of the universe and the design of life. And the third argument after the cosmological and teleological is what we call the moral argument. And that says that if one thing is morally wrong out there, just one, you know, say it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a Holocaust, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there's no God, everything's just a matter of opinion. That would just be your opinion against the baby torturer's opinion or your opinion against, say, Hitler's opinion. And we know that these issues aren't just a matter of opinion. It's not just a matter of opinion that torturing babies for fun is wrong, right? 
we, we know that's really wrong. Well, if it's really wrong, there must be a standard of really right out there. And that standard is what we call God's nature. If God doesn't exist, there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. There's no objective or subjective. Everything's just subjective. So those three are now, now we can get into evidence for these if you want, but those are the three main arguments that we use to show that Christianity is true, or at least that God exists. And then we, we look at the evidence for Jesus rise from the dead and we realize that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1980 something years ago is the same being that created the universe out of nothing. So uh, those are the three main arguments. If you want to get into evidence for those arguments, we can. Amen. Well said. Well said. And um, I've heard the atheists on, on one of those um, lines of evidence that you pointed out when it comes to DNA and the fact that it's a code and therefore a, co a code requires a coder. I've, I've heard them say over and over again, oh, it, it, all we're looking at is just chemistry. It's not real code. And I laugh when they say that, Frank, because I find that analogous to saying the information in a book is just ink on paper. It's not real information formulating a a message. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, I guess, the critic or the atheist that kind of downplays um, the significance of DNA being a code? Well, the people that really study this, people like Stephen Meyer and uh, Herbert Yaki and others uh, say it's a digital code. It's your DNA is these chemical uh, chemicals in a particular order down the spine of your DNA. And there's no known physical, biological, chemical process that puts them in the order up and down the spine of the DNA. There are chemical processes that make the nucleotides go together this way, uh, but not up and down the spine. And that there is a program it's a series of nucleotides in a particular order, and that particular order helps make you you. That's your unique DNA. And all those letters of your 3.2 billion letter genome are all in the right order, save a mutation here or there. And if you're walking along the beach and you see in the sand, John loves Mary, you know that that wasn't done by the crabs or the waves lapping up against the sand. You know there had to be an intelligent being. Well, if John loves Mary requires an intelligent being, then a message 3.2 billion letters long would also seem to require an intelligent being. And that's really what the argument says. And the genome or the, the I guess we can call it the genome, the, the letters in the, in the uh, DNA molecule are 3.2 3 billion letters long. They're all in the right order. Why? How, how does that happen? Amen. And why, why are your letters different from mine and, and who put them in this order? Because the four natural forces don't have the capacity to create all these unique DNA codes, right? Uh, these, these unique genomes. How does gravity, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and electromagnetism, the four known natural forces, how do they have the capacity to, to, to come up with all these unique programs? I mean, you know, Donnie, the atheists could, and the secularists could easily refute this argument by simply answering one question. And the question is, what natural laws or natural forces can create digital information? Amen. They, they can't answer that question. Why? And it's not a God of the gaps argument. Why? It's not just that we lack a natural explanation for, to use the old analogy, John loves Mary. It's that John loves Mary is positive, empirically verifiable evidence for an intelligent being. We don't just lack a natural explanation. I mean, it's, it's true we lack a natural explanation, but we're not just saying, well, we haven't figured a natural explanation out yet, so let's plug an intelligent being in there. We say, no, John loves Mary as positive evidence for an intelligent being, and so therefore should be a 3.2 billion letter code that's in every one of our 40 trillion cells. Amen. I would not want to have to be an atheist, you know, sitting back and, and attempting to answer that question or countering uh those arguments so here's a question um john that i want to get to it's a question that came in from a skeptic of the young earth creation and global flood model the question is how could any vegetarian and in brackets um he put trees bushes and grass survive being submerged or even destroyed 
by salinated water? Okay, it is a good question, and it's one that I asked in the middle of the desert of Western Australia. Um, you see, my background is geology. Uh, I went and did three years of genetics as well. I'd grown up with a dad who loved gardening. My first gardening book, even as a non-Christian, was the old Yates Gardening Guide. Some of you may remember that it started with man was made to live in a garden. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea. Later on, I discovered it straight from Genesis because God made a garden and he put the man in it. So man was made to live in a garden. But that didn't help me figure out how does a gum tree survive a flood? We're here in Australia. We're noted for gum trees because A, they can actually send their roots down and find the water. But B, if you flood the earth, this dry land plant, how does it cope? So I had an opportunity. I was with the head of the agricultural section in forestry, and I asked him, I said, see that, that gum tree over there? Um, how does it actually survive? How would it actually survive a flood that went not just 40 days, but over 364 days, plus a few extras, right? And uh, he said, well, oh, simple, actually. He says, the same way they do now. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, built into the tree, and we don't know why, but every now and then in Australia, we have a year where there's a massive rainfall. Some of you may have read up on Jurassic Park. Back in 2011, we had 16 inches of rain, 400 millimetres in four hours. It overwhelmed everything. And now we've got the opposite. We've got a drought. Now, the gum trees live through both. And I'm out in the desert, and this guy said, well, look, come and have a look at this. He said, this tree grows in this pan. He said, this is a little lake bed in wet seasons. And the gum tree stays alive. And he said, sometimes the lake gets so deep, the gum tree should drown. But he said, here's what we've observed. They have a mechanism to turn themselves off. And he says, as soon as the water level gets to the right, you know, humidity, they turn themselves back on again. Now, I had my students, after that conversation, I had my students run Charles Darwin's experiment for seven years to see if those sort of statements held up. What experiment? Well, Charles Darwin still got bottles in the basement of the university uh, in which he collected seeds, dry land plant seeds, wetland plant seeds, grass seeds, vegetable seeds, etc., and he put them in a bottle, filled it up with water. And then every week they would take one out and they would plant them to see what survived. Here's the general results you got. And by the way, I got exactly the same results in my students for seven years in a row. So feel free to try and disprove it. You're not gonna, not gonna be successful. Domestic plants, corn, wheat, peas, all the things that Noah would have taken on the ark as feed for himself, um, they don't survive very well underwater. You put them in water, you end up with pea beer, right? It ferments. They don't do well underwater at all. But all your grass seeds, all of the wild plants, they survive like crazy. I mean, we see it in the real world out here. We have dams. We build massive dams in Australia compared to many countries. And what you find is you flood the dam. The dam will be underwater for 25 years. Then there'll be a mega drought and it will dry out. And instantly the grass comes back up. Now the seed has been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, it's not affected by the water at all. So as much as the question seems impossible, when you test this real world, you'll find that the sort of plants that Noah would have taken on board for food actually need to be on board for food. The sort of plants that are gonna be outside the ark anyway, the wild animal food, the vegetarian stuff, no trouble at all. It survives now under, underwater at all. And by the way, you have an assumption when you say it was flooded with salt water. Hmm. Uh, we, we do have salt water we dig out of the ground with bores, and we can supply it to most of the plants. Um, they, do, they don't seem to struggle too much with it here in Australia, but if you assume all the floodwaters were salt water, you are assuming too much. Here's your assumption. Whatever the sea is like now, it's always been. Charles Lyell's Principle of Uniformitarianism. Uh, don't assume that the present is the key to the past. When God made the world, it was very good and there would have been just enough minerals in the water to do the best for all the fishes that they ever could do. 
Uh, that's why many saltwater fishes can move into freshwater and vice versa. Uh, and year by year, the amount of salt is actually increasing in the sea. Can you get it? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. In the last days, a third of the sea will die. That's the inevitable result, which means one thing. When God made the world, he knew how it could end. Interesting thought. I got to say, uh, John, again, great answer to a common question, a good question with a, a solid answer. I find even the best so-called objections to a young earth and a global flood have uh, very good answers ready to uh, ready to go, as, as you've um, demonstrated here, John. Uh, George, did you have any comments or anything, brother, before we get to the next ne next question? Yeah, I'd just like to confirm what John uh, had mentioned. Um, one day when you come up to my lake house, John, I'll uh, I'll show you exactly what uh, you were saying about the water the water level of the lake when it drops in those drought years. The banks, it's amazing how quickly they come up with vegetation. The wattle trees, the grass, the weeds, they'll come up. And the other thing, of course, after the flood, the soils and the materials would have been rich in mineral minerals perfect sort of composition for seeds to grow in. Uh, yeah. One other thing I might throw in there, now that I've been a gardener for many, many decades, here's what I've observed. There are some plants that if you submerse them underwater, the first thing they begin to do is swell. They take a certain amount of water in and then they form on the outside an impenetrable barrier. They lock themselves in. It's built into the seed. And that barrier will begin to disintegrate as soon as the humidity outside the, search of the, the seed in the ground gets below a certain point, then they'll germinate. So they have an inbuilt mechanism to cope with the right amount and the wrong amount of water. So intelligent design, way above the normal level we used to think about. <laughs> And these inbuilt mechanisms that we frequently talk about, they are evidence of forward thinking, which points us back to the forward thinker. Um, so those are some great points. And, and as you uh, pointed out, John, correct me if I'm wrong, Darwin himself, Charles Darwin himself, helped us with this answer yeah. through his experience. Yeah, got to give credit where credit is due. Yeah. St <laughs> st standing, there's, there's another Australian, I think it's the bottle brush. Uh, John, doesn't it uh, rely on a bushfire to actually germinate? It does. Uh, there's two ways you can take this. One is that it's adapted to actually become fire resistant. But the real history of the plant is that you have a plant which all the non-fire resistant ones have been eliminated to the point where the seed has got such a thick uh, coat on it, a fire is needed. So it's become mm -hmm. degenerate dependent. Right? So it's not an example of creation per se. But it is an example of forward planning to a world which you would have terrible conditions like we have in Australia six years out of ten. Yeah, and evolution doesn't do any forward planning, does it? No, it doesn't do any forward planning. No brains. My next question would be, and it's it's an exciting one, and I believe will lead into some solid follow-up questions and discussions. Uh, what would you say are some of the best lines of evidence against an old universe and for a young one, Dr. Lau? The best ones we have the birth certificate of the universe. The Bible is a history book that records when the universe began. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, human beings are made on the sixth day and from adding up those genealogies and so-and-so to get so-and-so. Uh, you find that it's about 4,000 years between Adam and Christ's earthly ministry, which was about 2,000 years ago. So something like 6,000 years. That's the best evidence because it's recorded history. Now, I think there are lines of scientific evidence that confirm that history, that confirm a recent uh, time scale. But that's the best because it's it's history. right? I mean, uh, if you want to find out when uh, the last world war happened, you read a history book. You don't do a science experiment and mix chemicals. It might confirm that. But the best way to to answer a history question is with a history book. That being said, I think there are a lot of lines of evidence that confirm that. Uh, lots of stuff in space, that's of course my area of expertise. There are things that can't uh, last billions of years. Comets, for example, they can't last even millions of years really because a comet is made up of ice and dirt and it orbits the sun in an elliptical path. And when it comes close to the sun, that icy material is blasted out into space. That's what forms a comet's tail. Uh, we had a really nice one this last summer, actually. I hope you got to see a nice naked eye comet. It was very beautiful. Uh, but every time you see a comet, it's getting smaller. It's losing mass. 
We can calculate the amount of material that's there. We can calculate the rate at which it's being depleted. They can't last millions of years, 100,000 years maximum for a typical comet. In fact, in my uh, uh, doctoral research, I used the SOHO spacecraft and it, it's, it looks right at the sun. And one of the instruments on it blocks the sun and looks at things that get real close to the sun like comets. And I've seen comets that have gone behind the sun and been totally destroyed uh, in one pass. So they don't last millions of years. And my secular colleagues don't even dispute that. They would say that there must be some kind of source of new comets. They call them Nort cloud. Uh, there's no evidence for that in our solar system in terms of observational evidence. Lots of things like that. The rate at which magnetic fields decay. Magnetic fields don't last millions of years. Magnetic fields are caused by electrical current in the core of a planet like the Earth, and that has been decaying. We know, we know Earth's magnetic field has been decaying. We've been able to measure it for the last almost two centuries. It's definitely decaying. It seems to be an exponential decay, which is what we would expect on first principles. It's not oscillating, not today anyway. It might have during the flood, but uh, other planets as well. There's evidence that Mercury's magnetic field is decaying. Jupiter has an enormous magnetic field. They don't last millions of years. With Earth's magnetic field, based on the current rate of exponential decay, you run it back 60,000 years ago, it would have been stronger than a neutron star, which is enough to rip the atoms of your body apart. And so uh, it's it can't be anywhere near that old. It's not even a million years. It can't be anywhere near that old. Or uh, carbon dating, a lot, of, a lot of times people think carbon dating gives the millions of years. It doesn't. Uh, now it's, it, all these all these dating methods are based on certain assumptions, but the fact is a lot of them give ages, even if you assume secular principles of uniformitarianism and naturalism, a lot of them still give ages much less than the billions of years, including uh, the fact that C14 has been found in things like diamonds that are buried deep down in layers of the earth that are well insulated from cosmic rays. C14 doesn't last even, even a million years. Uh, it, it decays very quickly. And so you, the fact that you find it in fossils and in just about everything that has carbon in it is a strong indication that the Earth is not anywhere near billions of years old. Lots of stuff like that. Wow, that's a great response. A lot of good information there, um, Dr. Lyle. With the, with the comets one, for example, that, that limits the age of the universe, I've seen, as you pointed out, this Oort cloud that's constantly being invoked. But like you said, this Oort cloud is not actually based on real observable em empirical evidence. Is that right, Dr. Lau? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the idea is with an Oort cloud that and it's named after Jan Oort, the guy who came up with the idea. The idea is that there's a vast supply of potential comets out beyond the farthest planets, out way beyond Neptune, but we couldn't possibly detect them at the, that distance. There's no way to detect them. So it, it, it's, it really seems to be a rescuing device, a hypothesis that the seculars have invoked to protect their worldview from what appears to be evidence to the contrary. And they'll say, what you can't disprove an Oort cloud. And that's true, I can't, it's undetectable, but there's no evidence for it either. They'll say, well, we find evidence of Oort clouds in other solar systems. Not really, we, we do find solar systems that have some kind of debris orbiting them, but we don't know that it's billions or trillions of comet nuclei. And even if you did find an Oort cloud, there's a problem and how would you, how would you make it you, under naturalistic assumptions? The idea is that some of those have been flung out, maybe Jupiter um, flung some of the original ice in the solar system out to the, to the um, ex extremities, but uh, the simulations I've seen of that don't get nearly enough of them out there to, to make an Oort cloud. So it's, it's problematic if it's there and it's problematic if it's not there, but since there's no evidence for it, I, I, pr I presume it's not there. <laughs> right. Great response. I've even seen a lack of confidence sometimes in the response from the uh, uniformitarians and the evolutionists with the Oort cloud. Um, yeah. So great, uh, great response. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special presentation. This has been the biggest question in all of the creation versus evolution war. Who can better explain the diversity of life that we see on Earth today? And which model makes the better predictions? The atheist critics have also made a challenge for young Earth creationists called the phylogeny challenge, and by other names. Basically, where do we draw the line dividing ancestry? Is there a line? How do we draw this line? And how can it refute universal common ancestry and prove creation? We answer that today. So buckle up and get ready as I try to explain it so that everyone can take this and share it with everyone they want to. Now let's jump right into this. 
How do we draw the line of independent ancestry, separating life in the biblical model? Well, this is best explained by the Rockefeller University study done in 2018, because it explains how and why genetic diversity answers this question by using mutation rates. Since I have already tried to explain this multiple times in the past to the critics, they are unable to grasp what I mean. So it must be a failure on my part at explaining it. So this time, I'm going to try a few different approaches and different explanations. Let's begin with this. At the very beginning of creation, you have mitochondria that doesn't have any mutations in them. Then, all of a sudden, it starts collecting mutations. And now we can trace these mutations that we have today back to a point where there were no mutations. Unfortunately, we can't go all the way back to creation because there was a global flood bottleneck. So the best we can do is trace mutations back to Noah's flood. Now, to know what is related, all we have to do is look for and ask, was there any convergence during that time following this mutation rate back to the bottleneck, like there is with cats and dogs, but in this case, when it comes to humans and primates? The answer to that is no. Therefore, humans cannot be connected to primates at any time in known history, because there is no genetic connection via convergence or overlap to prove this supposed relationship. This study has shown us that independent lines of ancestry exist. Let me try to explain it to you in a different way. Since mitochondria acts as a type of battery, I figure that an analogy using batteries will work well enough. Now, different life forms would have different types of batteries depending on where they live and how they need to function. The more similar the organism, the more similar type of battery they would need. Why would an aquatic fish have a more similar battery to a dog or a cat than it would to other aquatic organisms? Well, it wouldn't and it shouldn't. And guess what? It doesn't. Now let's zoom in. Take a human and a primate. Both were created independently, but they have very similar batteries. Since each were created to live in a very similar environment, eat the same type of things, and both have a similar physical body plan and layout. That should be expected if young Earth creation were true, and this was predicted beforehand. This was not predicted by evolution. Now, here is where this analogy explains how we know nothing ties us to primates, and how even other primates do not converge with one another. Each battery drains its life at a little bit different rate, but not by much. The real difference comes down to different generational times. So a human would have less mutations than a chimp, but not because the human is a newer species like evolution presumes, but rather because humans have a higher generation time. Science has now confirmed that both humans and chimps both came out of the exact same bottleneck at the same time. This explanation is the only choice we have for what we see when we look for relation. So we can therefore look at how low the battery is today in each species and then take that back to a point when it was a full charge. This would be the global bottleneck. It is at this point where we find both chimps and humans have a full battery charge in the very recent past. Now in my analogy, the battery is getting lower over time, but this in reality is in the form of mutations and the battery is the mitochondria. The question arises, does this mean that going back to this bottleneck that the batteries are now identical between chimps, gorillas, pongo, and humans? In other words, no mutations and identical mitochondria? No. And that, my friends, is why there are independent lines of ancestry. Humans, Denisovan, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnum, Erectus could not have, and did not, split from apes we would need genetic evidence of divergence coming from a split to confirm this idea, and we just don't see it. All we see is that all humans, and all the different species of gorillas, and all the different species of chimps, and all the different species of pongo, all go back to a single bottleneck, which they all came out of together as a single species. 
This is called the isopoint. And tracing all these species back takes us directly to a single ancestor species that gave rise to each and all of the related species of that creature that we see today. Exactly what the biblical story of Noah tells us happened. If you were to zoom in on the originally created battery placed in a human, it would be a different built-in code than it would be in a primate. Why? Because these areas that are without mutation all have beneficial functions, just like today. Mutations change the original function, and unfortunately, the vast majority are for the worse. So the similarities and the differences that we see should be expected because the same programmer designed all life. What is causing these new changes are mutations. And we can use these mutations to trace back to a point in history to see what is related and if we converge with any other species. Or is there evidence for independent ancestry with clearly created design diversity built in where mutations that arise cause problems? That is the real question of ancestry and a paternity test has not, nor ever will, show us that we are related to a primate of any kind, because we are not and it can't. So mutation rates help us explain this entire scenario and the pattern that we see. So the question of, can evolution or creation better explain the diversity of life we see today? Well, that question is no longer on the table, as young earth creation answers it way better. And since all life is essentially the same age genetically, then there is only one explanation for all of these things we see. Between fast mutation rates with few total mutations, few fixed substitutions with fast substitution rates, with no mitochondrial mutation saturation in anything alive, and a single paternal line leading right back to Noah in the recent past, and a single maternal line leading all the way back to Eve at creation. There is no other explanation than the biblical model of ancestry to explain what we see. Now let me break down the evolutionary tree of life real quick. They tell us all life evolved from bacteria billions of years ago. Well, bacteria have as low as 1,500 genes. So over time, they supposedly evolved more genes and eventually became different organisms that we see in the world today over long periods of time. Along the way, as they produced these new organisms that eventually became a common ancestor to a new evolutionary line of species, this is a convergence point. After that, this new line diverges from that common ancestor. This is the idea of how evolution works and why all things are related. So over time, something will spawn that is a new parent species and all new species from it will get more genetically distant from it and over time, they will become less genetically similar to one another. Because of this way of thinking, Harvard's leading evolutionary theorist, Ernest Mayer, predicted that finding similar DNA differences between very diverse organisms would be futile. He claimed that random genetic changes over millions of years explained the differences in creatures' traits and that those many changes would have obviously obliterated genetic similarities. And he would be correct if evolution was true. But then we go to the biblical model, and in 1975, prior to any detailed genetic analysis, the Institute for Creation Research founder, Dr. Henry Morse, asserted that there would be a common underlying design pattern to explain similar structures. He said, the creative process would have designed similar structures for similar functions and different structures for different functions. In the creation model, the same similarities are predicted on the basis of a common purpose designer. What do we see? Taxonomically restrictive orphan genes, species-specific endogenous retroviruses, extremely high genetic similarity between all life. Now remember, evolution predicted the exact opposite. We find what young earth creation predicted the entire time. This is why evolution had to invent a genetic bottleneck as a rescue device for their falsified prediction. Yet, to this very day, they still have zero evidence for this mythical bottleneck that they have to invoke 200,000 years ago 
in their very own fossil record that they created. So imagine the problem that they have. So evolutionist Ernest Mayer was correct in his assumption because deep time evolution is not true. And this is where they were forced to conclude that a global bottleneck had to be true. It was a retro diction made after the fact. And now look, they try to use this genetic similarity as the best evidence for evolution when it was a falsification of evolution. And even though they hate the idea of a biblical catastrophic event killing off 90% of all life on Earth, they are forced to invoke it anyway, because there is such low diversity in all life today. How could that be the case if deep time is true? It cannot. Therefore, a global bottleneck genetic reset in all life was a rescue device that they had to use, but was written about in scripture long before. The Bible told us to expect to find a global bottleneck because of Noah's flood, and it ended up being 100% true. And I think the funniest part about all of this is now they have to invoke a global bottleneck, and this is what our model has said all along. Now, let's go back to the evolutionary tree of lies. Let's take a primate species as an example. If these were the first of the species, and they had offspring, let's say over 2,000 years, then, for sake of argument, let's assume there are multiple speciation events over that 2,000 years. Let's say three new species now exist. Then a bottleneck happens. Well, who survives? Which species makes it? Let's say a single species from line three. So now we have a single species from the primate family who has incurred loss of genetic diversity from its beginning, as it is the last species to arise after creation. It now goes into a new bottleneck, and now it is the parent ancestor for all new species that arrive after this point. So now, all mutations in all future generations can now be tracked back to this, and only this, most recent common ancestor. No further back in time. Unless, of course, there were other species in that family that survived the bottleneck and we just don't see this in the data. So when people say, oh, we have a shared most recent common ancestor with a missing link primate seven million years ago, well, they can say that all they want, but there is no genetic evidence for this whatsoever. It would be impossible to obtain the data, even if we wanted it to be true, because even according to them, multiple bottlenecks have occurred since that time. And now that you know, since we can only go back to the last most recent bottleneck, and no further, we definitely know that we can't trace back past multiple bottlenecks. And what do we see in genetics? Well, we only see individual lines of ancestry all dividing animal species into the groupings that we would expect to see as young earth creationists. Individual lines of ancestry. Humans, chimps, gorillas, pongo, and baboons all have their individual branches of ancestry that all their related species can be traced back to this bottleneck. And why do we see this? Well, scripture tells us because Noah only took one species of each of these kinds on the ark with him, and that is exactly what we see in the genetics. No tree of life, no universal common ancestor, not even different lines of ancestry within these different apes. Think about it. Even if there had been only two different primate species from the same lineage, we would see that, but we don't. Yet we do see this when we look at humans. Why? Because Noah's son's three wives had different mitochondria, so we can trace back further. But we can't do that when looking at the male Y chromosome lineage. Why? Because Noah's Y chromosome was the only lineage left on Earth so we can trace his mutation rate right back to him 4,500 years ago. While these ape species, they can be traced back to a single common ancestor of their own family which survived this bottleneck, which just so happened to kill off every single one of their related species, exactly what the Bible describes. It's impossible for this evolutionary phylogenetic chart to be true, because now we know that all life went into a bottleneck recently. Therefore, how could any species be older than another one? It can't. They all have to be the same age. This is a case-closed argument. The reason 
the Tree of Life chart connecting ancestry was made is that they have to assume genetic similarities evolved over time to be similar and then diverge. Thus, the oldest species in the family, with the most genetic similarity according to them, is the one with the most mutations. But this fails, because as I stated earlier, the only explanation that there is now is that all individual primates and humans are the same age. Therefore, different generation times are what caused more mutations to build up, making it appear as though one primate family diverged from the other because one is older than the other, but this is easily solved by simply looking at generation times. Now, look at the door in the background. That door represents the bottleneck. Everything that walked through it survived. This means they were all the same age. So why do we see charts like this one, with the pongo, then the gorilla, then the chimpanzee, and then eventually human, showing the evolutionary pattern of life? Well, as I said, this was made based on assumptions that more mutation means it's older. That's all. So, why is a panda bear evolutionarily older than a brown bear according to evolution? Mutations. They have more of them. Since they believe that all bears mutate at the same rate, then more mutations mean an older bear. The truth? Panda bears have the lowest generation time of all bears, almost three times lower than the average. So obviously, they have more than twice as many generations than the average bear species since the last bottleneck. So of course they would have more mutations, and of course it would make them appear to be evolutionarily older, but it doesn't necessarily make them any older than any other bear species. And now you know why. This exact problem is what we have with the out of Africa hypothesis, but that's another topic for another time. So you might be asking, why do humans have so few mutations? Well, since humans have the highest generation time, we have the least amount of mutational differences because there have been fewer generations, while the Pongo has the lowest generation time, so they have far more mutations in them because they have had more generations that have passed since the bottleneck. This has led scientists to misconstrue them as being older. It's the paradigm driving the conclusion. They've been looking for any type of evidence they can to tie man to the Pongo, all because of Charles Lyell who eventually passed the idea onto Darwin. Evolution theory believes in neutral theory, which is the idea that everything mutates at the same rate. But this should be a dead concept by now, because we know that even other humans don't mutate at the same rate as others do, let alone other animal species. So going back in time, in the human lineage, we converge on a single human ancestor with nearly identical mitochondria, especially when we look in a single gene in the mitochondria called the CO1 gene, which is one of the fastest mutating genes in all of the mitochondria. Therefore, it is the best gene to test ancestry. When we do this in all the different chimpanzee species alive today, we also go back in time and converge on a single chimpanzee ancestor of all living species. Their mitochondria today are a lot more mutated than ours. But even going back to the bottleneck, it's still different than ours was back then, showing separate ancestry. These differences can only be explained by having independent lines of ancestry that went into a bottleneck and came out the other side. If it was true that we shared a common ancestor with any other primate species like evolution claims, then we could find evidence for that in our genetics, and we simply do not show that. This has been confirmed by the 2018 Rockefeller University study, and this is what was so surprising to them, and again, a prediction not made by evolution. Only young Earth creation. To prove common ancestry, we need to see a convergence going into the past, and we don't. So if there was ever a split, then we would see it by removing mutations in both humans and chimpanzees going back in time to having identical matching mitochondria. We do not see that going back in time. We see individual lineages. Because we don't see that, 
they had to resort to a rescue device and say, well, this split was before that last bottleneck. That's why we don't see it. Well, now they've just admitted they cannot prove genetic relation to a common ancestor in the past and must resort to storytelling because they have just tossed out the observable evidence. What we see are independent lines of ancestry only. And sure, they can say whatever they want about convergence in the past, but they can never prove it observationally. What we do see and can prove is separate ancestry. Therefore, all cat species and breeds should have the same mtDNA tracing back mutations that would land on a single common ancestor, and that is exactly what we see in all lineages. So yes, we see it in humans, and yes, we see it in chimps, and yes, we see it in gorilla. And this goes down the line. Bears, dogs, wolves. Now if you really want to get into the details, then hold on. Because all we have to do is look at genetic similarity at the time when the bottleneck occurred. What would we expect to see if 7 million years had really passed between a split between humans and primates? with what we know about the mutation rate and how fast it is. Well, evolution has a huge problem because we see far too few differences over a 7 million year old time frame. Think about it like this. Mutations are arising over 4,500 years. This has caused around 65 mutations on average in all of the chimpanzee species alive today. This is looking in the CO1 gene. And though evolutionists agree with these numbers, they reject the fast observable mutation rate for the assumed bottleneck 200,000 years ago, even without any physical evidence. They just invent their own mutation rate called the phylogenetic rate. Okay, fine. Let's say that that is true. This is easy to put to the test and show how easily it is to refute deep time evolution common ancestry. Now let's go back in time 7 million years. Okay, now we have a common ancestor with its mitochondrial DNA, especially in the CO1 gene with no mutations. Now the human line starts. Then we have all the different chimpanzee species. So if over 200,000 years have passed and chimpanzees have around 65 mutations in their CO1 gene, how many would 7 million years have accumulated? Well, the math is easy. Let's help evolution and say with only 50 mutations on average every 200,000 years, then over 7 million years, we have 1,750 mutations that would have built up just in the chimpanzee line to separate the ancestry commonality between humans and them. But here's the thing. How many mutations can the CO1 gene hold before it fills up? Well, the CO1 gene is 650 base pairs long. The entire mitochondria itself is 16,569, and it can tolerate up to 12,000 mutations for saturation. The same rule applies to the CO1 gene. That's a 75% saturation point before equilibrium. Therefore, we would land on finding 487 mutations in the CO1 gene before this saturation point is reached. Is this what we see when we look inside this gene? Not at all, as you can see. We were all created very similar, but with subtle differences. And not a lot of time has passed since then to make us very different. If deep time was true, genetic similarity would be exactly what evolution predicted, and we would have little to no similarity at all, especially with how fast the mutation rate is. We should either see an identical match going back to convergence, which is going back to the bottleneck if they wanted to prove common ancestry. Or we should be extremely different than chimpanzees if deep time were true. We don't see either one. Evolution tries to say that this CO1 gene mutation rate is actually slow, only 1% every million years. But the slow rate of change is based on the fossil record, as I stated earlier. And this is easily refuted when we look at how many mutations are in human beings today. Modern day humans range anywhere from 0 to 10. Now who has the 10? It's the Africans that have the most diversity. This is where the out of Africa idea even comes from. So therefore, since African people haven't existed until about 200,000 years ago, according to the evolutionary theory, where they emerged out of this last bottleneck, then there is no possible way that the 10 max mutations that we do have did not arise at any other time than after this last bottleneck time period. 
So whether or not you want to believe this was 200,000 years ago time frame or just 4,500 or so, it doesn't even matter because either way, it's just too fast of a mutation rate for evolution to have so few differences between humans and chimps, either way you look at it. So even if we're going with the slowest evolutionary mutation rate, and we find 10 mutations arising in 200,000 years, then it's impossible for evolution to try to explain the few differences there are between humans and chimpanzees over 7 million years. The differences between us and them would be in the hundreds yet we only find there is around 65 to 75 differences. So what model best explains these differences? The Young Earth Creation Model, where God created and designed genes to function similarly in similar created kinds. And from creation till the bottleneck, mutations had arisen, causing diversity within the species. Then we have a single lineage going into a bottleneck and coming out the other side. And that is exactly what the genetic evidence tells us, even in their very own evolutionary literature. But where does Neanderthal fit into all of this? We realize that they said Neanderthals and Denisovan are much older than this because they have more mutations, right? Well, let's go to the CO1 gene yet again. Looking at Neanderthals, we find 18 mutations there maximum, and Denisovan 20. But this is not really all that high considering they lived in small populations of around 20 people and were isolated and inbreeding people for around 800 years. This actually falls perfectly into what our model says and should expect to find in it. Why would we say that? Well, look at chimpanzees. They're the perfect example of this since they never went extinct and today they have around 65 to 75 mutations on average. So everything in our model lines up perfectly. They were mutating at the same rate so it's easy. If you had tested a chimpanzee 800 years after the flood, they would have been mutating at almost the exact same rate as the people we call Neanderthal, which would have had around 15 to 20 mutations at that point. We know that Denisovan, Neanderthal, and modern-day man all met one another and interacted. Therefore, that immediately rules out interacting with them before a bottleneck, because according to evolution, modern humans didn't even exist to interact with. Therefore, we have the smoking gun refuting evolution, and that all of these people were just living together at the same time, and mutation rates show us that there is no possible way that they could have lived before the bottleneck since they were all on the same side of the bottleneck together, and mutations all line up and take us right back to the same bottleneck together. Now we know that the high amount of mutation accumulation that we see in us and them had to all take place after the bottleneck. And this fits perfectly with what we've been saying all along, based on what we know about isolation, divergence, and population size. So the genetic boundary already existed at the bottleneck. It is the boundary of the genetic differences that separate different kinds. This boundary cannot be bridged by just assuming common ancestry is true and using imagination to bridge these gaps and go back in time before a bottleneck. Then presume something that we've never seen happen today happened back then, such as a common ancestor splitting into different animal families. Believing a split between humans and chimps happened is fine, but it's faith-based and without evidence. As I stated earlier, that if it were true, there would be far more differences if this split actually happened in the deep past. We just don't see that. Nor do we see this convergence in the deep past with any of these so-called splits. Take myocids, for example, which supposedly split into dogs, bears, cats, mongoose, skunks, otters, badgers, raccoons, hyenas, weasels, polecats, and even aquatic walruses and seals. The genetic convergence doesn't exist for any of these. There is no evidence for it, and there never will be. Do not be deceived. So again, even if this evolutionary scenario of common ancestry was true, there would be no way of proving it, since there is no possible way to connect ancestry to anything past a bottleneck event. And even they were forced to admit that a global bottleneck genetic reset had to have occurred. So they are stuck ever being able to prove common ancestry because of it. So they had to save their dying theory by invoking something else that also destroys their theory. That's evolution for you. So, what has genetic testing using DNA barcoding exposed in the last five years? 
Well, it has validated the young Earth creation position of independent lines of ancestry with genetic boundaries that should not exist if evolution was true. It also confirms scripture which states that a global bottleneck happened, even killing the aquatic life on Earth. Evolution never predicted this, and originally stated it did not happen. When the undeniable genetic evidence finally confirmed that it did, they went looking in their own made-up fossil record created by an atheist with an agenda, and they found nothing. The absence of transitional fossils that should be everywhere in the fossil record if it was true, is another telltale sign that the story is another myth based on imagination and lies. We see fast mutation rates, low genetic diversity, independent lines of ancestry with genetic boundaries, and biological evidence of a global bottleneck inside of all life on Earth. All of this only points to one conclusion, the young Earth creation biblical model of ancestry. There's no way around it. So the case for independent origins versus common ancestry is really a dead issue. The sad part is, is that people think evolution is science, and it's not. It's anti-science, because it doesn't allow competing theories. It is also unfalsifiable. It also doesn't make predictions, even on mutations which the theory is based on. And it can't even predict what anything is going to evolve into because the theory is so plastic that they will just say, well, anything can happen. The only reason it hangs on is because it's protected by law. It's sad that kids will only hear one side of a horrible argument, the side that is nothing but a made-up lie invented for an agenda, that tells them that they are related to the very strawberry that they are eating for lunch. Imagine that. There's a reason intelligent design isn't taught in our learning institutions. The legal staff of Freedom From Religion Foundation, a church-state watchdog group, has had remarkable success in convincing many institutions, such as school boards and town councils, that they are breaking constitutional law when they sponsor sectarian activities. That includes intelligent design. When the authorities can't be convinced, Freedom From Religion Foundation sues, and it wins more often than not. If you want your kids to learn real science, and want to get Young Earth Creation taught at your local school, then look no further than Curriculum in Crisis. My book was created for one reason and one reason only, to get your local public school to teach a better model than evolution, one that better explains the genetic diversity of life we see on Earth today. This book will teach you how and why it's so important to get biblical creation into your local public schools so kids do not grow up believing a lie that ruins their minds forever. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. They have an evolutionary creation model, which makes no sense. No, in creation, God can front load the genome, which as much diversity as he wants to. If all variation is caused by mutation, absolutely, it's impossible. You can't get all the variation we see in modern people if we start from Adam and Eve, if they're 100% homozygous. Right. But what if God front loaded Adam and Eve with like 20 million variants? Then we can lose half of them and still have as much as we have today. And 20 million is not a lot. I carry three or 4 million. You carry three or 4 million of the common ones and probably three or 4 million rare ones. That's fine.
So it's actually trivial to start with Adam and Eve and get the people we have today as far as the number of variants. Especially if you had 6,000 years of mutation, you can have a lot of new variants appearing in that 6,000 years. Right. They're coming from their perspective of the evolution having to work in a short time period. Yeah. Well, so what is some of the best evidences for a literal Eve and a literal Adam? Well, the best evidences are the, the fact that we found Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve. Now, the evolutionist puts them in a different place where I would put them, but it's quite clear there's only one human Y chromosome. And all men share a very similar Y chromosome. That didn't have to be true. Because if we came from a common ancestral population with chimpanzees, that ancestral population would have had a diversity of Y chromosomes. And when the population split into the lineages that led to humans and chimps, it's possible that we could have like in this ancestral population type A, B, C, and D. Well, if humans have type A and B and chimpanzees had type B and C, that means there would be a human and chimp who both had type B. They're more closely related to each other than a human is to another human on the Y chromosome. But it didn't work out that way. It's you know mathematically and, and theoretically possible, but it's totally not true. There's only one Y chromosome. In fact, just yesterday, the um, or maybe the day before, they redid the Neanderthal Y chromosome which is really, is really weird to me because for a long time, we only had female ancient DNA. All the Neanderthals, all the, the Denisovans as they're sequencing them, they're all female. Like, well, why is no males? We got like 20 females and no males, something really weird. But they finally published a partial Neanderthal Y chromosome several years ago, and it was way different. I mean, way out in left field. Like, oh, wow, that thing's really different. Well, just a couple of days ago, they replaced it with a very modern human one. Wow. And the common, the Y chromosome common ancestor to Neanderthals and, and humans, modern humans, is much more recent than it was last week. They totally redated it. Incredible. Wow. Where can we find that study? <laughs> I want that one. But uh, so how about molecular clocks then? Um, do they support a literal Adam and Eve? And uh, can an, uh, all right. Is there a constant clock? Is there an average clock that can actually be made? Yes and no. Okay. If you take a constant average for things we can measure in the laboratory today, you can get an approximation of how long ago uh, Y chromosome Adam or mitochondrial Eve lived. It's only a few thousand years. You don't need tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. Now, they don't like doing that. So they don't like the Y chromosome right now the clock is grounded in the time when Native Americans got to North America. Okay. In fact, the Y chromosome guys, they call that a sanity check that appears in several papers. So they're not using genetics. They're using archaeology to give them a clock so they can figure out how far long ago uh, mitochondrial e atom was, y, y chromosome atom was. Got it. Wow, that's interesting. But if you look at the measurable mutation rate from one generation to the next, it's a lot faster than they want it to be. But I don't like the molecular clock idea. I don't think it works. If you look at um, a Y chromosome family tree and you look at people that are closely related, maybe in the same group, well, some of those people could have twice as many mutations as their cousin or relative that came from a same, the same founder of that group. Mm. So like uh, group R1B, I'm an R1B, 80% of Western uh, Europeans are R1B. If you look at the R1B founder and then you measure the branch lengths of all the individuals that are R1B, there are people twice as many mutations as, wait a minute, that means there's no clock. That means you can't put your finger on the tree and know how long it took for these many mutations to accumulate. And yet, if you just do a rough approximation, everything is young. There's another issue. Um, I wrote an article called Patriarchal Drive. I published it in the Journal of Creation. did some computer modeling. I said, we kind of know that the older a father is, the more mutations he passes on to his children. And I said, but if Noah was over 500 years old when he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and that population was reduced to six people, 
that means those three sons, their father was over 500 years old when they were born. That means they each got a huge dose of mutations. And as that post-flood population starts growing, these really old men are going to continue to have children. And the older they get, the more mutations their children are going to have. I call the patriarchal drive. And what it does is it totally messes up the average. It takes, you know, some kids are being born in this population with 800 mutations and some kids are being born to a young father and they only have 10 mutations. So you can't look at the branch length on the tree and know that the branch length equals time. It does settle down after a while when now, you know, men today aren't having children when we're five, 600 years old. We tend to have children when we're 30 years old. That's a huge difference. Yeah. So there are problems with molecular clock, archaeologically, genetically, philosophically, mathematically. Yeah, we can still use it if we want to. Okay. About dinosaur tracks, eggs, and scavenge bone beds. Okay, maybe I will um, start here. Okay, and so we have our challenges. This uh, the the secular scientists have a lot of challenges too when it comes to dinosaurs. They certainly don't have it made. And our main challenges, which is the only one I'm going to deal with, is how can dinosaur tracks, eggs and scavenge bone beds, this was the main question that was brought up, scavenge bone beds, occur early in the flood. I mean, this was considered to be an unsolvable uh, problem for flood geology. Well, you know, a lot of problems seem unsolvable without looking into them very deep. But when you look into them deep, you discover, first of all, that a lot of times they're problems for secular scientists also, but you wouldn't know it mainly because they usually add a, a secondary hypothesis to paper over the difficulty. You've got to get even beyond that secondary hypothesis and check that out. So they have their problems, and we have ours. And so I'm going to deal with only ours, and let's see. Anyway, these dinosaur tracks have been a real challenge to a lot of people. Here's a quote from the late Glenn Morton. Yeah, on his website. It's not on his website anymore. I guess he took all this stuff off. But anyway, features like these, termite nests, dinosaur tracks, cicada burrows, and channels are not easily explained by young earth creationists. They don't show their followers this type of data, and they have not explained it. Well, that's 2004. I had an explanation in 1993. And anyway, uh, you can form some of these other things by the same hypothesis, termite nests, Cicada burrows and channels can be formed in this hypothesis, which I'm going to talking about. And a lot of people have really been challenged. Here's a guy who was getting his degree in geology out in the field, and he said this, By day, quarrying through the layers of rock, we started to come across footprints of terrestrial animals, says Godfrey. You can't imagine a global flood and animals finding ground to make footprints on. That more than anything, any other experience in my life really shook me to the core. So this is a major challenge. By the way, the Lord has led me to answer major challenges for the 45 years I've been doing research. Evolution, that's easy. I mean, there's so many major problems in evolution that other people are doing that. I don't focus in on that. But I, feel, I focus in on the challenges that are difficult for us to explain. And I and oh, I didn't I, I forgot to tell you that after I find out that um that it's, it's a challenge to secular uh, scientists, half the time I discover a, a good possibility within the uh, flood uh, model. So that's where I find. But there's some channel, there's a lot of channels, uh, challenges left to go that I and others have not been able to explain. A lot of it, we haven't done the research yet because, uh, and some, some uh, challenges no one's even touched. But, a lot of them I have, and so I have a decent amount of answers for some of these, and this is one that I do. Anyway, here's a typical dinosaur track, three-toed theropod, carnivorous dinosaur track from northeast Wyoming. And believe it or not, 
that is a, a large uh, duckbill dinosaur track found on the top of a coal mine in Utah. Yes, indeed, you find dinosaur tracks on the tops of coal mines, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Queensland, and the United and the United Kingdom. At least, probably more. Um, this this can be explained by this model that I'm going to bring up: dinosaur tracks in coal on top of coal. Anyway, here's a challenge: dinosaur tracks. There are millions of them now, and they're finding new ones all the time. In fact, I was just up here in, in Denali National Park in South Central Alaska where they got oodles of dinosaur tracks in that park. And I saw some, got new pictures. And, and so anyway, there's here's one on Spitsbergen, <laughs> island of Spitsbergen. Whoa. <laughs> anyway, we have to explain all that, millions of dinosaur tracks. And by the way, these are live animals that laid eggs, made tracks, and scavenged bones. So they have to be early in the flood, and the sediments are, are uh, accumulating. And here's a picture of eggs from uh, um, Mongolia. And here's eggs generally found in these areas you see here, and they find eggs. I don't hear too much about finding new eggs uh, with time. By the way, these slides are old from the late 1990s. So they have uh, more in more places. Um, but this is a great accumulation of eggs where I live and down south, Wyoming and Colorado and China, Mongolia and so forth. Anyway, uh, the question was, a lot of bone beds indicate scavenging. And here is a bone with teeth marks from a carnivorous dinosaur. Uh, so, yes, we do see these signs in the bone beds. So, yes, uh, and here's a, from the Museum of the Rockies. We have teeth marks on this. Uh, I think this is a frill of a triceratops. Uh, teeth marks. And here is a tooth of a T-Rex found in north, a bone bed in northeast Wyoming. And, you know, when you only find, see, they lose their teeth when they chomp on a bone. It a lot of times breaks off. So when you only find the teeth in the bone bed, and by the way, some of these bone beds have thousands of uh, individual dinosaurs all in a small area. And But when you find the teeth of uh, carnivorous dinosaurs only and not their skeletons, you know it was scavenged. And so they were scavenged during the flood. So, so man, these are seem like serious problems. I thought so, but when I looked at it closely, I discovered some, some interesting things. Well, I'm not going to go into, into this. Okay, I discovered unusual features of uh, bone beds and um, tracks and eggs. And here's a list of the unusual features. First of all, there's numerous dinosaur graveyards, some of which are huge, like uh, in Montana here, uh, north of here, there's a bone bed of 10,000 duckbill dinosaurs, all the same species. And I might add that they're all mixed up. They're, they're, they're totally disarticulated. And it looks like they've died one area and they've been re-eroded and redeposited because sometimes you find uh, the left leg bones of two dinosaurs together. And, they, you know, it should be a left and a right if, it was, if it, they died there. But so um, it indicates that they, they died in a massive uh, graveyard. Then they, that graveyard got re-eroded and redeposited. That seems to be common in a lot of graveyards, but some of these, like 10,000, uh, China and Alberta have a lot of huge uh, dinosaur graveyards. And commonly uh, uh, described as being buried in a flood. I mean, the way they, I, I have some quotes, which I think I'll have to skip. Often the bones are jumbled together, like I was saying. The bones are little weathered. Many bones contain just one type of dinosaur. Now, how would that happen? You know, when we have catastrophes today, It'll bury a lot of different animals, say a huge rock slide or, or a volcanic eruption. When it sends sediments down the mountain, it'll cover a lot. And uh, so a lot of different animals, and it's certainly not the same species of uh, one animal, just a variety. But many of these bone beds contain just one type of dinosaur. 
or the vast majority of them are one type. That That is unusual. That speaks of an unusual catastrophe. Also, the bones of babies and young juveniles are rare. They're found, but they're rare. Now, when, when you find that we're, you know, you find a, a catastrophe, a lot of times you'll find just as many young and baby uh, bones as you will adults and older juveniles. So that's rare. Could it be that the babies and young juveniles could not uh, escape the encroaching floodwaters while the older ones were able to flee for a while? I think that's a good possibility. And here's a, a jumble of, uh, in New Mexico, a coliphus uh, graveyard, about a thousand carnivorous dinosaurs all <laughs> mixed together. I mean, that's flood. That's Genesis flood, not some local little flood. And a lot of times you find these uh, bones in mud all broken up. In fact, these white areas here are, it's, are pieces of bone indicating cata catastrophic mashing, breaking up, and Huge uh, catastrophes for these dinosaurs and ending up in this mudstone here. And here's some, uh, I'll just quote this one. Piled in like logs in a jam. That's how he described bones. So I, I have a lot of quotes. Unusual features of tracks. Tracks of likely poor swimmers are rare, like Triceratops tracks are rare. And Kylosaurus, you wouldn't think they would swim very good. And I think they're finding more of those now. Uh, tracks of Stegosaurus, which you wouldn't imagine swims very well with those heavy plates and the spike tail. They're fairly rare. So you find, why are tracks of likely poor swimmers rare? You find a lot of duckbill dinosaur tracks and a lot of uh, theropod, three-toed dinosaur tracks. You'd imagine with their big, thick body, small arms for the theropods, that, man, they can probably float pretty good. So. And that's how the majority of tracks are from them. And practically all tracks, are, again, are from adults and juveniles, older juveniles, similar to the bones. And interesting, the tracks are practically always straight. I live in Montana, and, I, and I'm an elk hunter. And I like to hunt elk in, in the snow. And when you track them, when they're not spooked, they go all over the place, take sharp corners. But when you spook them, oh. They, then they run in a straight line or a gently curved line. And the tracks are, pra are practically always, if not always, on a single flat bedding plane. I mean, they don't uh, have other bedding planes where they climb up. There's no hills. It's always a flat, single flat bedding planes in sedimentary rocks. And then you have uh, multiple uh, areas where you have multiple track layers a track layer here, and then maybe uh, 150 feet of sediments, another track layer. And at least in Northeast Wyoming, the, the, the tracks were almost identical on the two layers, but yet because there was that much sediment in between, they gave it 3 million years. What's the odds of the same types of dinosaurs coming to the same area 3 million years apart? So on all these unusual features, oh, here's a, here's a straight track. In northeast Wyoming, a, a, a theropod track right in here. And here's the plot of that uh, there. They're generally straight or gently curved. Unusual egg features. There's very few actual nests. That's a bowl with you know, vegetation on it, either or. You don't see hardly any bowl structures, maybe about less than a do half dozen. And you don't find hardly any evidence of any vegetation like from pollen. So there's very few actual nest structures. But they claim nests, mainly when they see a bunch of eggs on a flat bedding plane, they call that a nest. But it's not a nest. You see, you got to watch out for some, some of these descriptions. Got to dig deep. Their eggs are laid on flat bedding planes. Little or no vegetation associated with the eggs. The eggs, and the, here's, the, here's the upshot of this. Uh, the dinosaur eggs are quite porous, meaning they'll the, they'll dry out sitting on a flat bedding plane. So it in indicates that the dinosaurs did not have time to dig a nest or find vegetation to cover it. 
but had to lay it quick on a flat bedding plane once they found a flat bedding plane. Well, how do they find flat bedding planes? Well, that gets into what's called the beds hypothesis. Okay, that's that's one uh, actual nest structure on Egg Mountain, Montana. Anyway, I, I believe the beds hypothesis can explain it. Bed stands for briefly exposed diluvial sediments. Diluvial is an old name for the flood. So the briefly exposed, freshly laid sediments. And why? Because sea level or the flood level, as it's rising during the early part of the flood, it's oscillating as it rises, you see, by five different mechanisms. And so, and there always seem to be in areas of rapid sedimentation. So, uh, and then you have evidence of a lot of sediment piled on top that was eroded. So uh, this, uh, so as you get a local drop, when the, the flood water is shallow, it can expose the freshly laid uh, flood sediments. And then a rise will cover it up because you've got to preserve all this stuff quickly before it, it disappears or decays. So that's the bed hypothesis. So here's a block diagram. Think of these blocks as maybe an area 100 miles in both directions, a big, big area. But this is just narrowing it down so I can get it on a, on a piece of paper. Anyway, here's the top of the sediments at T1. And it's rapid sedimentation, T2, it's up here, T3. It's up close to the top of the floodwaters. Then you have a local drop, and that exposes the bedding plane. And then dinosaurs uh, in floating in the water, swimming, or on higher ground nearby, if there is any, come on to that, lay eggs, scavenge dead dinosaurs, and uh, make tracks. And then you have a local rise that will cover them up and preserve them. And it can happen uh, more than once to have multiple layers in an area. Also, for a log mat, there's probably billions of logs floating on the floodwaters. So a local fall would beach these log mats, you see. And then if it rises quickly enough and puts sand over the top of it quickly enough, it'll pin the, the plants down, and as you, you pile up sediments, it compresses it, forming coal. And dinosaurs could have walked on that plant matter before it was pinned by the next rise to form the dinosaur tracks in coal, explaining coal and dinosaur tracks. And here's the five mechanisms. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, There's probably more. There might even be more mechanisms. But uh, lunar tides, of course, are pretty obvious. Twice a day going up and down. Some of these, like tectonic uplifts in the area, could last maybe a, a couple of weeks being ex exposed. I mean, so there's different uh, spatial and temporal scales in all of this. And here's a little uh, quickie, a block diagram again. Uh, think of a, a, a freshly laid sediments doing a, a drop. And they lay eggs, make tracks, and uh, there's dead dinosaurs around. They get beached. And then a local rise. Uh, it's muddy water, by the way, so it's going to cover it all up. And this is just one possibility. In this case, it didn't drive those dinosaurs off. Um, so that another drop, they can do it again. In other cases, it would rise, and you could put 150, 200, 300 feet of sediment then fall again. So you had a lot of uh, variability and a lot of possibilities uh, to explain features on uh, multiple tracks. By the way, you can explain dissociated features. I think I'm, I would get into this. Yeah, you can actually have true mud cracks. It only takes maybe less than 24 hours to form a mud crack. It, uh, you can have raindrop imprints, which you do have. Bird tracks, there's lots of bird tracks with the dinosaur tracks. Coprolites, paleosols, burrows, social insect nests. All these can be explained with the beds model, which are a lot of these are considered big problems for especially for the early flood. And these are mud cracks. I think I'm going to end it there and go to the questions. This is a picture of mud cracks. Uh, 
in a dinosaur quarry, uh, quarry in um, Utah. I appreciate that, uh, Mike. I really appreciate how informative your, your answers are. And as I said before, I always love the slides. So. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And I am your co-host, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for being here for today's important show. We are joined with Dr. Mark Armitage. And it is a privilege to have you, Mark, with us here on the program today. Uh, the honor is all mine. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And uh, as everybody knows and everybody is looking forward to, uh, we have you here, uh, Dr. Armitage, to discuss dinosaur soft tissue. And again, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I'm pumped. I've been pumped for this ever since we scheduled it over a month ago. So. Well, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I'm ready to get started. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Let's jump right into it then. First off, how have you been? And can you tell um, everybody about the research you've been up to and, and including any new developments or findings? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, uh, we're doing well. Um, we've had a little bit of time to recuperate from, uh, well, we went to Dallas in early January for about a week and uh, taught there. And then we had to drive actually from Washington State all the way down to Los Angeles to pick up our new laboratory. We ordered uh, 20 uh, beautiful uh, high quality microscopes uh, dissecting and compound. And uh, we're actually taking our laboratory out into the towns and villages. We're going into homeschool communities and working with students there to conduct a, a three hour hands-on dinosaur soft tissue microscope laboratory. So uh, we're putting this in the hands of our students uh, who need this desperately right now. They need they need to heal from what's just happened over the last two years. They, they need hope for the future and they need to be encouraged to hang on to the word of God and uh, not deviate. So it's an exciting undertaking. In fact, the laboratory is halfway on the way to El Paso right now where we're going to conduct labs all next week. So yeah, we need energy. We need power right now. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. Uh, Mark, you know, our, our, our prayers are with you for the trip. You're doing fantastic work and you have been a, a huge blessing and a huge help, uh, especially to us and, and this ministry. So, uh, Mark, for anybody who may be new to this, yeah, and specifically this topic of dinosaur soft tissue. Can you briefly explain why the findings of soft uh, dinosaur tissue is, is so important, especially when it comes to the age of the earth and deep time assumptions? Well, I think the implications are obvious really to uh, anybody, a common person. And uh, most people that uh, we interact with, we, we start sharing about dinosaur soft tissue and they're shocked. Most people are shocked. Uh, you had asked previously about the research, and, and I think this is important because the method we have adopted is to build a publication history. And so uh, that's what we've been doing. We, we have been conducting the research, and we are publishing uh, world-first finds. In fact, uh, there's a couple that I'd like to share with you as we go on today. But um, that publication history allows it to be cemented in the literature so people can go and refer to it and study it and understand exactly what was published. So that's the methodology we employed and now we're actually going out and, and just sharing the science. We're sharing the science, which becomes pretty obvious to even those most casual observer. I mean, come on, you wouldn't expect to bury a ham sandwich in your backyard and come back in a year and find some of the ham still there. I mean, intuitively we know that this cannot happen. So. Uh, it really strikes a chord with everybody that we talk to about it. And we believe every human deserves to know that we're literally walking on a cellophane wrapped earth of soft tissue, uh, not just dinosaur. We're, we'll talk about other areas we've dug into as well in the research. So now the research is important as far as the implications. Uh, you know, I just present the science and then I open it up for questions and the questions are amazing and they come from all angles. Uh, so and I'm fully prepared to answer all those, but uh, what we intend to do is present the science so that it's an established thing. You know, it's, and we're seeing this from many research institutions. There's a lot of papers out 
on uh, soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Amen. Well said. Uh, before we get a little further, I guess, into this topic, uh, Mark, especially for anybody, again, who's new to this, can you kind of briefly tell us a little bit about your story um, leading up to, you know, where we are today, um, specifically, uh, you know, with your, your current research? Yeah, I smile because uh, it's it's the coolest story I could ever imagine. I got to live it. I mean, uh, from the moment that I traveled from Puerto Rico, where I was a troubled teen, you know, 16 years old, uh, really troubled in a disciplinarian type family. And I went all the way to the coast of Maine and off the coast of Portland. There's a little island there called Great Diamond Island. And, and I got to uh, work with microscopes and we collected phytoplankton and dinoflagellates and things. So I was bitten by the microscope bug. And of course, then I entered a career in microscopy. I, I became a, a service guy first. I was trained to service and repair some of these big instruments and made a career of that. And then I worked for Olympus. I worked for Carl Zeiss. I worked for Reichert representing their products and had a blast. And, uh, and then I went back into academia. Uh, you know, when I, when I had professed faith in Christ, I was basically booted out of my college career by my folks. And so I had to kind of start over. But uh, and then family came into play. I mean, all of it. I'm amazed that I walked through it. But I tell people my windshield is so cracked and dirty and messed up. But my rear view mirror is so clear because I can see how God brought me to this point. I mean, the very training that, that I received, the academic training in soft tissue processing, I mean, I was turned into a soft tissue processing technician, an expert in that area because we did electron microscopy. I worked at several universities and ran microscope labs at several of them. So uh, when I started reading about the dinosaur soft tissue being published in some of these journals, I was astounded. I was shocked. And I realized I have to go and try to replicate this. And of course, at that time, everybody was digging for femurs, you know, big long bones, leg bones because they felt that those encapsulated bones, what was what was holding the soft tissue together. But we found a, a, an exposed, uh, actually tipped down triceratops horn, a 48 inch long triceratops horn that was at a 42 degree angle down and exposed all the water and silica and calcium and all those things that flowed in. And so part of it permineralized, but a lot of it didn't. In fact, that stretchy red tissue that you've seen me stretch, I peeled that directly from the inside of that horn. So, wow. no, I mean, the, the, the pathway has been incredible. Um, since then, we've had incredible uh, world first discoveries that we can talk about that I'd like to because I, I want people to understand the impact of what's being published and the emphasis on published. We're publishing in the open scientific literature. So, no, I mean, I couldn't imagine a more exciting <laughs> fun career as a young scientist starting out at 16. It's, it's been wild. Yeah, yeah, it, it sounds wild. It's I really appreciate that that answer, um, Dr. Armitage. And and something you said there about uh, publishing in the secular scientific journals. A lot of people, especially the critics and the skeptics, they'll oftentimes, especially if they're ill-informed on this topic, they believe this is just kind of like a young earth creationist argument or we're making things up. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Well, as a person who taught in academia for 12 years uh, at the highest levels, I will say class, class is in session now. So pay attention. All of these papers are published online and downloadable from our website and many other websites, dstri.org, DST like dinosaur soft tissue, RI like research institute.org, and you could download all the papers. And so class, the papers have been available, especially the Octahistochemica paper. I mean, this paper was published online in 2012 and then in print in 2013. So and, and there is a correction that I'd like to submit to you because uh, what was stated in the in the uh, uh, video that you sent was that uh, I had to decalcify the horn before I was able to recover that soft, stretchy red tissue. Remember, yeah, everybody's seen that in uh, is Genesis history. Well, that that came out of a horn that I literally just fractured under mechanical pressure 
and it exposed the horn core and then I peeled it off the horn core. So there was no processing done to that bone in order to pull out that soft, stretchy tissue, which made the cover of American Laboratory with all the cells inside of it. So, uh, and I sectioned that with a steel knife, so it wasn't permineralized. So no, I mean, what's astounding about the find as published in the literature, so class, download it and read it. And you know, if you can't understand it, take it to a biologist, let them read it to you, okay, seriously know this stuff because we fractured open a horn that had selective permineralization. We showed electron microscope pictures of the vessels, the, the blood vessels that had hardened into stone. Why? Because all the water with silica in it was coming down through the rainwater and it turned all these vessels, if I can find them here, into stone. I mean, look at all these vessels that were turned into stone as a result of the water uh, percolating through them. And actually, figure 16, you can see that's the blood clot. That's the first report of a blood clot, which I need to talk about. But look at the cells in 17, 18, and 19. Those were soft, stretchy cells that were on the outside of that hardened bone. So we called it selective permineralization. But no, I mean, understanding this exactly as public <laughs> is critical because the impact then is not minimized. And, and people understand how shocking this is to find this kind of preservation in, in a thing that was exposed to millions of microbes and insects. And I mean, you name it, the sky's the limit. I think we found the DNA of 60 different organisms uh, wow. in the last DNA analysis. So now this thing was under attack, violent attack, and uh, it had to go through freeze thaw cycles every year. There's water percolating it. When, when, when we first uncovered it, broken half, it had a whole white fungal mat growing on one piece of the, the horn. So, no, it's, it's so significant. This was the first of its kind find. It was a world first, and that shouldn't be minimized. Amen. Amen. Well said, uh, brother. It really is a fatal blow to the uh, old earth and naturalistic uh, paradigm and lots of uh, chats and comments coming in. I just wanted to point this out. Uh, Guzman 1611 says Dr. Armitage published a paper this year about Permian tissues. So you're doing <laughs> you're doing great work. Did you want to kind of touch on that a little bit? No, it's a whole new area. And, and you know, I, I was also gratified to see the nerve picture in that video you sent. But but let's be accurate here. It's not a nerve cell. It's a nerve fiber. And it's a it's a wound fiber. In fact, the 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 winding of the epineurium and perineurium, like a coaxial cable, uh, around that wire that transmits the electricity, which is your nerve, that has a characteristic crosshatch pattern that is diagnostic for the fiber. So we're finding fibers. Now there, there are Schwann cells, we believe inside of there. So there's more work to be done, but we're now finding this in the Permian. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so no, it's the work continues. And, and my hope is that folks will download these papers, study them. If you don't understand, look, we, we've tried to do the work for you and now we're trying to educate. We want everybody to understand the significance. And, and you know, you mentioned uh, it destroys this paradigm, it destroys that paradigm. You know, I really don't care about that anymore. It, it's really about presenting the facts about what we're finding out there. Right. Both of the bones we recover from the bone, from, the, from the, these dinosaur graveyards, most of the bones we recover from these digs are bone. They're not rock. <laughs> and so I can dissolve almost every single one of them in this weak acid, which is used by hospitals every day of the week around the world. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're actually using standard protocols to dissolve these bones <laughs> and all the soft tissues are falling out and they're spectacular. And the deeper we dig, the more the, preser the higher the preservation is. There's a whole nother area of study called suspension of cells in calcite. This is where the calcite came in in a liquid form and, and infiltrated everything and then permineralized. And you can see this in the latest Dimetrodon paper that we published uh, in the Microscopy Society of America journal, uh, 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 Microscopy Today. It's online now. If you, if you Google uh, Microscopy Today current issue, you can download it from there or just go to distry.org, it's up there. But we're showing these kind of preservations in calcite in the 
290 million year old tissue. So <laughs> no, I mean, the, the sky's the limit with this, I believe. One of the things we hope to do is to identify students who have an aptitude for this, because I need workers, you know? I, I have to duplicate and triplicate and multiply our efforts here, right? So that's one of our goals with these labs is to identify students. And look, everybody wants to take the lab. I get it, okay? Everybody on earth wants <laughs> to take the lab, but that's impossible. This Right now, we're focusing on the students who are the worst off among us. They're our future, so we want to focus on them. But uh, everything's up for free. All our videos are, are free uh, on the district.org or on the YouTube channel, which I think you were mentioning. And all the papers are available. And our books, you can download our free books and give them away. You give away as many as you want. If you want hard copies, you can contact us through the website. We'll send you hard copies. We print them to give them away. We want you to give them away. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, what do you say about, I mean, there's not many, but there's critics out there that say you're actually just looking at a horn of a cattle species. Um, yeah, there, there's a whole group of folks who uh, somehow erroneously fell on the idea that this is a bison horn. And my reply to them is, hey, you know, I don't think anybody really cares that you're confusing bison horn anatomy with actual horn, uh, <laughs> you know, bone horn anatomy from the Triceratops. I mean, there's a marked difference. And we've shown this in the paper. You, you can see the anatomical things in the acta paper that distinguish it from a bison, bison horn, which is mostly keratin, you know, like your fingernails and, and hair. So no, the anatomy is completely different. The set, you know, the other thing is we found the horn, largest horn ever found on the base ranch, uh, where Schweitzer and Jack Horner and many others have dug. Um, it was it's common there. It's you know, uh, uh, Triceratops horn is common. In fact. Uh, the bone that is is at the base of the skull that lets the skull rotate, that's called the condyle. And uh, we, when we went into uh, uh, Marge Beige's uh, home museum there, there was just a whole row of condyles. So, no, it, it's common there to find these things. And so uh, really it's just kind of a straw man that I think they've set up to tear down because we've superseded that work by far. I mean, we're so far beyond where the horn – uh, was, uh, uh, you know, for example, we published in September of 2020 a paper on UV autofluorescence, and this is a technical term, but we use a special microscope to study thin sections of the bones, and they're full of clots, okay? Just about every bone we found is full of clots. Now, that's significant, that's significant because there's a medical condition, and it's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. And when a, when a victim, particularly a mammal, dies by drowning, their blood clotting cascade goes violently in one direction and everything in their body clots. And so here, here are clots in bright field microscopy, but then we subjected them to UV light. And the iron in there glowed like a neon sign. And this is we're finding this throughout not only all of our specimens, but throughout the literature. And so the clots are like a Polaroid snapshot of what was going on to them physiologically when they died because they remain in that condition, you know? So these clots are still clogging all the bones. Incredible. So it's not only showing that they live recently, but they died from a flood, both things the scripture talks about. Yeah, and this is just the science. Uh, and like I say, we, we just published this in the Dimetron paper, we went to Oklahoma, which is really interesting because most of the Permian specimens are in two locations in the whole world, Texas and Oklahoma. Both of them suddenly have become unavailable. I think uh, the Texas one was flooded over to make a lake and, uh, and the ones in Oklahoma are, they've kind of exhausted uh, what they found in terms of Permian specimens. But we went out and we dug on this open pl uh, plain. And this is all up on the Distri you uh, YouTube and, and website. You can see these videos. We found a dimetrodon femur just right there in the clay on this open plain. Now, that's supposed to be part of Pangaea, which traveled six to 8,000 miles from where it was, you know, back when. You know, we know this is fact because people were there watching this. Who knows, right? Who knows? But this supposedly traveled 8,000 miles, yet these bones are pristine. They have no score marks, no scratch marks, no abrasion marks. 
and I'm pulling fat covered fibers out of them, fat covered nerve fibers, which drip with lipids. Now, here's a question. How long do lipids last? Do they last from the Permian? Can I take a bottle of Wesson oil and walk out of my backyard and pour it on the ground and expect to come back in 290 million years and find Wesson oil? <laughs> so no, look, the evidence is staggeringly stunning to anyone who would listen with an open mind. Uh, I'm just presenting the science, I'm not arguing. What you do with it, that's your little red wagon, right? You get to pull that. But I'm looking for people who want to know the truth, who are Amen. searching for the truth. Those are the folks I'm searching for. Amen. Amen, Dr. Armitage. Uh, great response. And we've already got a great chat with uh, some of the usual uh, criticisms and objections coming in. So I'm just going to get right into uh, those and kind of address them all in one. And the question is, and I'll kind of set it up this way, um, Mark. We all know uh, one of the very frequently repeated rescue devices for why we find preserved dinosaur soft tissue in fossils, supposedly millions of years old, as you're pointing out here, is iron preservation. Evolutionists invoke this argument as a way to say that these amazing cells and tissues could be preserved for millions and millions of years. Can you please elaborate on this argument? And do you believe there is any validity to it? Uh, well, we've discussed this in our blood clot paper from September of 2020. Um, we went into a thorough discussion of Fenton reactions, which are a result of water flowing over native naked iron to form hydroxyls and peroxyls. And of course, uh, it's well known in the literature that hydroxyls and peroxyls chew up tissue uh, living tissue. I mean, this is a condition you can read about in the medical scientific literature. Uh, they're highly oxidative and destructive to the living human body. So you can imagine what they would do uh, to, you know, a dying, just dying uh, uh, dinosaur, because this has to happen fairly rapidly, right? And, and if you look at the experiments that they've conducted in the laboratory to sort of replicate this, I mean, the first experiment uh, the first thing they did was inject an anticoagulant uh, into their specimen. Why? They couldn't abide clotting. I mean, clotting, it happens so fast. And it's a good thing. You puncture your body, your body knows all of a sudden, I got a puncture. I'm going to bleed out. I could bleed out depending on how deep it is. And so it starts this clotting cascade without you even wishing for it. So this happens so fast. They had to inject an anticoagulant to stop that. Then they had to break the red blood cells mechanically to expose the hemoglobin. But before they could get to the hemoglobin, they had to screen out all the platelets, all the protein factors that uh, combined with the clotting cascade. Um, all the cell remnants had to be removed. So they high speed centrifuged this six times in a 30,000 RPM centrifuge. Come on. OK, how much more ridiculous does your so-called science have to get? before you completely paint a picture over what really happened in Hell Creek. This was a cement mixer, okay? Everything went through a cement mixer. Nothing is articulated in some areas of Hell Creek, most of Hell Creek. And so all this stuff was ripped apart and exposed instantly to the dirt. Moreover, when you look at our clots, okay? Here's a clot in Brightfield. And you can see it does not go outside the Haversian canal. Your bones are full of canals. That's where the vessels are. That's where the nerves are. That's where the veins are. They run through canals, openings in your bone. I like to, I like to call, you know, I just say bone, buried bone is like a pyramid. It's full of all kinds of secret passageways with hidden treasures. And that's what we're finding. So it didn't escape the canal. And when you look at it in UV, you see this in UV, my finger's backwards. Look at how the, the iron is glowing and there's a dark margin there where it didn't cross into the bone. So how is it gonna save all the tissues if all the clots are still in the canals? And we're finding this, like I say, you all you have to do is open the scientific literature and look at the thin sections that are presented there and you will see clots in most of them. So I don't know why this is being ignored by the scientific community, but you know we hit it with UV light to prove that it was iron and it's iron. The iron's still there. So you've got those two problems. You've got 
Fenton reactions chewing up tissue and somehow, some way, by chewing up the tissue, they're gonna, they're gonna harden that together and, and that's gonna provide stability to that collagen. Now remember, they only addressed collagen, okay? They didn't address the phospholipid membrane of cells and we have liberated so many cells, beautiful cells, both with scanning electron microscopy and with light microscopy. Okay, here's a beautiful cell that was liberated right here. Actually, it's still attached to the bone, but we have liberated cells in solution. So, no, these things are, you know, all these videos are online. You can see them with your own eyes. But how did that survive the iron? Because iron would chew up a phospholipid membrane like crazy. But what about the nerves? The nerves are covered in fat. I mean, it's just like I pointed out. You pour Wesson oil out on the ground, it's not going to last a hundred years. So no, I think the science when it's properly understood just kind of brushes away these objections. And uh, I'm still stunned. I still cannot answer why these tissues are here. It's amazing. It, it actually, Matt, if I could, because I saw a couple of comments come in, in the chat and I wanted to ask you this, uh, Mark, because what you just said there is so fascinating. And as you pointed out, uh, these images, these videos are online publicly for everybody to see. And yet I still see this comment and I'm curious as to uh, what your thoughts on it. When these skeptics try to downplay the evidence and the data, what they'll say is, well, this is just soft tissue remnants or, or fragments. What are your thoughts when you, when you hear that from skeptics? I'll say it in one sentence. sentence. The, the science when presented just blows that away. They don't look like remnants. But here's my, here's my real comment, okay? Who cares about the naysayers? Who cares about the critics? Why should we spend time on the critics? I think we've wasted enough time on the critics. This evidence is out there for everybody to see for their own. This is why we're taking these labs out so these students can sit there with their own eyes and it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. I'll, I'll teach them how to find nerves. Nerves are the fiber optics of tissues, okay? They light up under polarized light. And it's so much fun to teach them to search for a nerve and then to go into this special form of microscopy and all their hands go up. I found one, I found one, I found one. And, and then we start taking pictures so they can have the pictures themselves of what they shot through the microscope and saw with their own eyes. So no, this is so easy, a 13 year old can do it. And as far as the critics, I figure it's a better thing to train a 13 year old and let them teach the critics. Who cares about the critics? I'm interested in the students. <laughs> I'm interested in the people who want to hear this. And so, yeah, if you want to be a critic, fine. I ask them when they come to my kind of comment on the YouTube channel or on the website, I ask them, why are you here? You know, you're obviously not here to, to learn. And I don't have time to argue with you. Besides, arguing is a sin. I'm not going to argue with anybody. I'm going to testify, right? I'm going to testify. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to talk about what my microscopes are finding. We're publishing it. You know, I'm so thankful for the microscopy side of America. This is part of Cambridge University Press, okay? And, and, and this is why it's important when you talk about the nerves to understand a few things. When you present the nerve information, um, you know, remember that it's published by Cambridge University Press, okay? That's who's publishing this. And, and that's a great honor. It's a great honor to have this, this ability. But when you look at what's being presented, you know, I'll just read you the title because this, this is what's really astounding. The title of the paper is First Report of Peripheral Nerves in Bone from Triceratops. Now, it's an honor to have a title like that. Why? This title could easily just as much have been First nerve discovered in any dinosaur ever by anyone anywhere. I mean, that's the significance of a first report. So we've, we've actually found for the first time nerves. And, and like I say, we're, we're finding them in the, in the Permian and we're going to hopefully publish that soon. But, but that, that is a moment that I think we need to stop and appreciate what, what really God is doing because Again, I said before, I can't explain why these tissues are here. I have no mechanical preservation mechanism can, that can account for these tissues. Remember, the iron preservation theory only talked about collagen and vessels. That's it. That's all they attempted to explain. 
and their explanations, you know, don't don't work. Uh, to to be kind about it, but if these things are are ancient, uh, there must be a preservation mechanism. The only alternative explanation is that they're not ancient, uh, and maybe that this this was buried a short time ago because the preservation is stunning. That's a great response. Yeah. Go ahead. Matt. The, uh, yeah, I was just going to say. Um, the uh, a lot of scientists agree with you as well with the iron preservation not being um, a valid answer. So they actually came up with, well, maybe you're just looking at modern day recent biofilm that had accumulated. And um, that must be what it is, because you, they're right Their Their paradigm says that they can't last 65 million. So they these must be something else that we're seeing. But you're finding all different types of things. So what would you say against biofilm? Well, yeah, no, I think the, the uh, biofilm theory was a valiant uh, gesture. I think Dr. Schweitzer herself uh, put it uh, to, to rest. Uh, but the theory is that, uh, that uh, this tissue is there laying in the ground, and they, they agree that microbes, uh, bacteria, insects, all kinds of uh, you know, worms, <laughs> nematodes, which are voracious, right? They go after these things. And so uh, they've even published... Uh, a recent paper where they measured the biota inside the bone and the biota in the matrix around the bone. And the concentration of, of organisms was higher inside the bone. Well, of course, there's meat in them, there are hills, you know? So yeah, they're feeding on it still. Uh, but the, the theory is that the, the bacteria that grow in there, they form a biofilm. They form this sticky glycocalyx kind of covering. It's a sugary kind of oozy covering. I've even photographed uh, this in the electron microscope. And, and the, the theory is that whatever they're eating, they literally poop out the same shape, okay? Which would be a Nobel Prize if you could prove that. But, and so let's say they eat an osteocyte or a bone cell, and in their wake, they leave what looks like an osteocyte or the, the biofilm around it, you know, formed this osteocyte. Well. Uh, like I say, we have liberated these. Uh, we've actually stained them with different stains, uh, and they behave exactly like normal tissues do. Remember, <laughs> I was trained in soft tissue work, microscopy, so I understand the staining process. I understand how these tissues should and should not respond to these stains. If these were biofilms, and I've, I've done the experiment, I've, stained, I've unsuccessfully tried to stain biofilms. They don't stain. And particularly with fluorescent stains, it's even more dramatic. So, no, I think the microscopy has settled that issue that these are not biofilms. But, but then I go straight back to nerves covered in fat, oozing fat. I have pictures of lipid droplets coming out in a straight line up to the surface from a compressed nerve that I've compressed under a cover slip pressure. So, no, I mean, that stuff would be eaten up instantaneously by any organism. Uh, and, and what's interesting, we're finding these in limb bones, Permian amphibian limb bones that have been out of the ground for decades. So there's this term in forensic pathology, uh, uh, grave wax. A lot of times these uh, lipids in your body or lipid filled tissues kind of concrete and harden into like a grave wax, which literally coats them in rubber. So no, I think it's it's amazing that we're finding these things. and. You know, I'd, I'd love to go to the Lip Liscom uh, bone beds in Alaska where things are frozen in the permafrost. I mean, maybe I'll find a whole skull there, yeah? Yeah, I actually have seen a video on that recently. They said when they're walking around, they can look over and find a dinosaur laying on the ground. No digging required. Yeah. Incredible. But, uh... Yeah, if I could jump in here, the chat is wild, so I'm having a hard time saving all these questions. We've got over 70 people right now, and everyone's loving this. A lot of great feedback, uh, Mark. And I think given everything that's being said, the bottom line is the fact that, you know, the DNA, red blood cells, the bone, the bone protein and so on should not be found in dinosaur fossils. If they really were millions of years old, they should have obviously degraded by now. And I still can't get over this uh, finding that you're talking about in, in the Permian, because I'm seeing people say, well, you know, if, if we found soft preserved tissue in like trilobites, 
you know, then I'd be convinced. And it's like, wait a minute, 200 million year old preservation is not good enough for you. So, I know we're the big trilobites right here in my home state. So stay tuned. <laughs> nice. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. <laughs> but then if we find that, they'll just, you know, push it back even further. And you, no, you know, that's why I say, uh, really, you know, we love you, but who cares about you, really? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, move on. Shake the dust. Uh, move on. Uh, you know, you look, you look at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, okay? Look at the Sermon on the Mount. Look at what he taught. And then read the rest of the following chapters and see how he lived out what he just spoke. That's our pattern. That's what he calls us to. That's why we've decided to take nothing for the journey. What does that mean? We, we've decided we're all volunteers and we give everything away. Okay. And we depend on him for the resources to do this. And he shows up. When, when you trust him that greatly, he shows up. And that's why we're going out in the towns and villages with this. I mean, look, if we have not just been through a bowl of wrath, okay, I don't know what is. I don't know how how much worse does it have to get for folks to understand we may be winding up these days. We may not have many left, right? And you look at the judgment that is the flood, the worldwide catastrophic judgment because God was fed up, okay? Now, look, like it or not, and you can accept it or not accept it, that's your little red wagon, which you get to pull into eternity. But you are a created being. And I like to tell the students, you know, who are you? Who do you think you are? You know, because the world projects everything on what we should be. And I came up with the term soado, S-O-A-D-O-E, son of Adam, daughter of Eve, combined together, soado. That's who we are. We're in their lineage. And that means we're owned beings. We were created by a creator who did make everything and put things in a garden from the beginning, who did send a flood that destroyed the whole earth. It's obvious. And it was recently because we're walking on this squishy stuff that's still in the ground. Yeah. So then what does he say in Second Peter? People are going to scoff. People are going to laugh. People are going to question the eschatology of Scripture. But he says, don't forget that this is going to burn. It's all going to burn. Why are we noticing the temperature rising right now across? Everybody's alarmed. Everybody's freaking out. Of course, they've been predicting it for 30 years. Who's turning up the heat? I think it's God, because guess what? The second judgment is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to tell God, okay, I give up. I give up already, because it's not working for me. <laughs> the sooner you figure that one out, the happier you're gonna be, the more at peace you're gonna be. But there are dark days coming, and a lot of people aren't gonna make it. And I, I want them to make it. I want them to know that God put his imprint in the flood, it's there. I don't know how he's preserved it for this long, but he gave us some clues, didn't he? He talked about the bones of dinosaurs in uh, in Job. He bragged about them. Well, I see now why he bragged about them, okay? They're there. This stuff is there. It's coming out at this time. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm in the middle of it, but I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to be loving and kind, but I'm going to be pointful and, and direct and honest and truthful and serious. And I will correct folks when they're wrong about the work. Because I want them to understand it as published. Oh, yeah. Amen. What do you think about old earth creationist organizations that actually don't like these findings, like reasons to believe? They've come out and said, well, collagen could probably survive millions of years. But if the environment was devoid of water, oxygen and microbes, what are your thoughts on on uh, creationists even saying that? Well, I think the fact that they're not referencing our published work means that they're not doing their homework. Mm. So I would say do your homework. Yeah. Dr. Lumsden, Dr. Richard Lumsden, who was from Tulane University, was my major professor. I studied parasitology under him. And uh, he wrote an article at the Creation Research Society quarterly decades ago called Error and Worse in Science. And what he called worse was sloppy work. <laughs> but, you know, if you're going to do your work, be an expert at your craft. Uh, don't sit right. there behind brick walls and write books. Go into the lab. Come on a dig with us, okay? We have an open invitation for people to submit a reason why they should go on a dig with us, and we'll take them to the Hell Creek, and they can dig on their own and see for themselves. Yeah. Have any critics taken you up on this? Several people have, yeah. Nice. That's great. 
So no, this, this is this is why I say find this out for yourself. Don't you know if you're if you're defending your position from your office, I suggest you're not a scientist. That's a great response. Amen. I couldn't agree more. Um, here's here, here's one super chat that comes in. I want to make sure I get to this one. This one comes in from Christopher Silvius. I appreciate the support and uh, donation there, Chris. He says at SFT. What is the maximum number of half-lives for DNA that is known by laboratory experiments and published mainstream articles? Well, that's a great question. And I, I'm, I'm not a statistician, but um, you know, the fact that DNA has been published as having a DNA of uh, a half-life of some 525 years or something on that level uh, is astonishing because all you got to count out is like 50,000 half-lives, and, and that's not that's not long from now, you know? So uh, it, it really speaks to the fact that if any nuclear material is found, and I will point out to you that we published a, a beautiful photograph of nuclear material being taken up by some of these tissues that we're recovering. And this is in the blood clot paper, which was September of 2020. Uh, but what we found on the bottom of our collection dish was what we call vein valves. These are little tiny valves. You see them pink there. These vein valves are little, they're like cuspids. They're, they're not bicuspids, they're monocuspids, but they're in your veins because your veins need valves uh, to return that blood to the heart under lower pressure, right? They gotta hold it in place. And so we stained them with an RNA stain and there they are glowing saying, yeah, I have RNA. So, you know, there are there got to be remnants of nuclear material uh, in these specimens. Um, and so more work definitely needs to be done in that area by labs who have that. I don't have that capability. So, you know, as a microscopist, I now we're we're open to having volunteers come and we're, we're searching for volunteers who want to help us in this work. Distry is an open organization. You know, we have an open board and uh, people can apply. Uh, we, we, you know, or just contact us, approach us. Uh, we've got a wonderful couple uh, who are actually driving the rig uh, right now. They're from Illinois and they came all the way out from Illinois to Seattle and, and picked up the rig and they're driving it to El Paso for us, which is a lifesaver for me. I mean, I'm pushing 70 and this is why I need to clone myself because, uh, you know, I'm running out of gas here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, who needs sleep these days, eh, Mark? You're it's overrated. Uh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, what about this one here comes in from Translucency. Um, several questions have come in. I'll, I'll get to one of his. He says, how come we can extract megafaunal DNA from tropical mammals in the ice ages, yet there are no dino equivalents? Uh, what are well, your thoughts I'll say, on that? I'll say yet. Y E T. Yeah. Let's go to the uh, Alaskan permafrost. Yeah, let's dig there. There's digging going on there. Okay, there's science being done at the Liscombe bone bed in Alaska. It's just not being reported uh, unless it's being reported undercover within, you know, colleague to colleague to colleague thing. But uh, no, let's go there. Let's dig there. Let's find out if there are DNA uh, components still frozen in that permafrost. So I think the temperature has a lot to do with it. I mean, when you consider the horn, you know, and all the stuff we found in the horn, uh, you know, we found we found nerves in a condyle associated with the horn. So right in the, in the proximity. So I imagine if we had had looked for nerves in the horn, we would have found it, but found them. But um, uh, no, th this thing was was in a in a, a cycling temperature environment where, you know, you have very, very cold winters with snow and ice on the ground. Very, very hot summers, a lot of wind, a lot of rain, a lot of percolation, uh, a lot of ground uh, plant growth uh, and, and uh, fungal, you know, rhizome growth, big mats. Uh, and, and then, of course, all the rodents and bacteria and, and uh, worms and things that are present there in this environment. The, radi the background radiation that comes out of the ground is known to be highly destructive to tissues. So it's astonishing to me still that these things are here and in the quality that we're finding, it really is astonishing. 
Amen. Well said. I'm, I'm amazed more and more every day. I love the research that you're doing. And uh, this next question, Mark, I know you've addressed it ad nauseum, but it keeps coming up in, in response to this uh, fascinating uh, evidence. But as we know, Second Peter 3, right? There are those that are willingly ignorant, denying three things, the, the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. So we can't really be surprised. But uh, this question has to do with an argument, uh, again, uh, from uh, reasons to believe that, that Matt pointed to earlier. And uh, this specific old earth creationist organization claimed that, um, again, collagen could survive millions of years as long as the, um, inv actually, this is the one that, that Matt just asked, but the other one that, okay, right here, that um, the highly intertwined cross-link structure of, of collagen, so they're looking to the structure itself, is good reason to believe that. And again, they say fragments, even though we can clearly see it's not just fragments, could survive 68 million years or more. Is this wishful thinking, uh, Mark? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, again, I would go back to the fact that uh, the two papers that address that uh, were published by Dr. Schweitzer and other members of her group. Uh, in both instances, they created laboratory conditions which were foreign, completely foreign and unrealistic as compared to uh, the Hell Creek Formation condi conditions that we know are there, okay? You can go there, come on a dig with us, and you can see the conditions. Maybe that'll change your mind. But remember, they only addressed vessels, and they only studied vessels they only measured these connections uh, with very high technology equipment in vessels. They didn't look at veins. They didn't look at vein valves. They didn't look at osteocytes. They didn't look at nerves. Uh, all components of bone, uh, which many of which do not have collagen in them. Uh, you know, we're, when you look at the blood clots and you look at the, uh, the pictures that we're publishing on the blood clots, we showed it to a physician. Because uh, remember, we're doing thin sections, okay? Like this, this, uh, this is a thin section of nanotyrannous vertebra. So we we make these, you know, as thin as a human hair, actually half the width of a human hair, and we examine them under uh, high intensity UV microscopes, and the clots are so evident. But the bone is evident too, because the, the proteins that are still in the bone glow yellow. So we have this yellow combination with blue glowing, showing the iron is in one place and the bone is in another. So all those tissues that are in the bone are separated from the iron, uh, number one. Number two, the bone cells are phospholipid membranes, okay? They're basically fat, and iron would just destroy them. But we're finding countless numbers of osteocytes or bone cells in our preparations. How can they be there? Uh, Dr. Schweitzer made one comment that the blood has access to the osteocytes through the lacunocondylicular network. Well, that, you know, study your anatomy class, uh, but red blood cells are larger than the, can uh, you know, the canalicular layer. Uh, so they cannot fit inside of there. So they couldn't possibly get down to the osteocyte. So it's just a matter of anatomy, uh, understanding that. So no, the blood was sequestered in the, in the vessel walls, okay, in those Haversian canals. It was sequestered in there, it's clotted in there. And when we show these thin section pictures, these thin section pictures of this stuff to physicians, they can identify the actual blood components that are in our specimen. They can see them crystallized in place. So we're, we're stating rather unequivocally and rather resoundingly, and it's up to people to prove us wrong. Go make your own thin sections and prove us wrong that there's no blood clots everywhere and that the iron is sequestered inside the Haversian canals because that's our pronouncement. And now it's up to you to prove us wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing, uh, Mark. I love your passion and energy. Again, I just have to say it. It's a great time to be a young earth creationist. Uh, I could elaborate on all uh, on that all day, but I don't want to hog the mic. So, Matt, go ahead. No, I, I, you say, I don't want to be unkind to those folks. Uh, it's not an issue of salvation, but I'll put it to you this way. And again, I'll go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus concluded by saying, people who practice and teach these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But those who do not practice 
and teach these commands or lead others astray will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Heaven's going to be a long, long time. And I don't want to have the name least on my locale that whole time. So it's a matter of faith. It's really faith over fear. What do you got to lose by trusting completely? Like I say, my windshield is a mess. I'm going 100 miles an hour and things are flying at me left and right. But I can see the path right behind me in my rear view. So take a leap of faith. Trust God in his word. Uh, see if he doesn't open your eyes and your mind and show you things, incredible things like he's shown me. So that, that's what I can share. You know, we love you. We care about you. We want you to be in heaven. And we don't want you to be called least when you get there. <laughs> I love Amen. it. Amen. Love it. I'm actually making a comedy skit, kind of a picture with a cartoon guy. And in the background, it's got like the commandments, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbors, love yourself. And then a, a, a guy in the audience raising his hand saying, but what if I believe all this for no reason? But what, what if I change my life for nothing? <laughs> right? It's, you know, for every person that's standing there uh, being that way, behaving that way, there's five people hiding behind him that I want to talk to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. For the next question, then, I've, I've heard that there's over 18 different biological elements so far that have been found in dinosaur fossils. Um, I don't know if that ac it's that accurate or not, but um, maybe. I think that's way underreported. I think there's much more. Uh, it's, it's like I said, th these bones, to me, they're like pyramids with all kinds of fascinating hidden passages filled with treasures that haven't been discovered before. I mean, just the area of tissue staining, the fact that these tissues re respond to acridine orange, to toluidine blue, to all these standard off the shelf and not even the standard off the shelf uh, 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 stains, uh, markers, the markers that Dr. Schweitzer has used are targeted towards molecules. And so she's actually targeted uh, dinosaur molecules. This is why her work is so astounding. Uh, and it just blows away the biofilm argument because these are actual endogenous, you know, pre-existing, and they belong to the original organism, dinosaur proteins in these preparations. So no, I think it's stunning. Uh, and there's so much work to be done. Uh, that, that's why I encourage people, hey, even if it's just to prove our work wrong, which is science. I mean, that's what science is all about. Instead of armchair quarterbacking it, make a lab, get a lab, join a lab, you know, start doing this work. Uh, I'll even share all our protocols with you. If I'm not right, I want to be proven wrong. Amen. If I'm incorrect on my science, I need somebody to correct that. But so far, nobody stepped up. They're, they're just hurling, you know, mud balls from the, from the <laughs> gallery. So. Well, if I could, um, Mark, we know that the gold standard of science is, is to make testable and falsifiable predictions. And I remember you, correct me if I'm wrong, I remember you predicting that dinosaur soft tissue would be found as a common theme in fossils. Can you elaborate on this? And are we then finding dinosaur soft tissue? As you pointed out more and more, it's probably underreported, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? No, it's definitely underreported because the colleagues that I have in this work uh, who are uh, collecting uh, slide specimens, prepared slide specimens from folks who prep bones, uh, you know, are, are commenting that a lot of this stuff is thrown away because it's got too much soft material in it. So, no, I was stunned. As a, as a soft tissue processing expert uh, uh, working at a state university in California, running a million-dollar laboratory at the top of Chaparral Hall, the, the, the jewel of the biology department at California State University, Northridge, uh, practicing soft tissue processing every day with undergraduate students, graduate students, and professors. I was actually training professors in my laboratory. And then to go to the Hell Creek looking for a femur, not finding it after three days and being so dejected, and then coming home with this ragtag, broken up, fungus filled, root filled, wet horn, thinking I'll never find anything in this, and then to find what was found was astonishing. And so that's why I made that prediction way back in 2012, that this is the norm and not the exception. And I think that's that's certainly what I'm finding. I mean, the phrase we're sharing is every bone every day, predominantly every bone every day. And, and I, I, you know, I've done different experiments whereby I begin de decalcification for like only a day, and then I stop and I start photographing it under the microscope. 
And this is one of the presentations we're going to give in El, El Paso. We're going to see that the clots go all the way to the exterior portion of the bone. Here I have a piece of, this is a nanotyrannous rib. And it's, it's been in decal solutions for a little while. And already, you know, we photographed the clots coming all the way out to the surface of the bone. So now the, the evidence is astonishing with every different experiment that I try. So uh, I think this is the norm. I think it's, it's not prevalent only in the Cretaceous layers. Uh, we've been working in the Devonian, we've been working in the Carboniferous, and people are gonna be shocked at what they see. So this literally is an envelope of death uh, marking the judgment of God on the whole earth uh, that we're walking over and living over and ignoring for the most part. Uh, a lot of people don't know. So that's why our mission is to get out there and share this. And look, there's detractors, fine. I don't mind detractors. Go into your lab, you know, come to our digs, take the same fossils home and you work on them and prove me wrong. Prove me wrong, please. Amen. Well said, well said. Let, let, let's see them match up to the work and research that that is being done. So that's a great response. Uh, Matt, over to you, uh, my good man, if you had a question. Oh, uh, sure. Um, I don't know if you've read Dr. Fuzz Rana's book on dinosaur soft tissue, obviously a critic of the work, but um, I asked simply because I've seen his book being referenced by critics as a solid refutation against young earth creation arguments on dinosaur soft tissue. Have you read well, that? I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just wondering, have you read that and know what his arguments are? Yeah, I was I was actually asked to review that book uh, for uh, the uh, uh, I'm going to have a senior moment now. Uh, the the uh, creation group in Australia, they asked me to uh, creation ministries international for their journal of creation. And I did write a critique. Uh, I do have that available. Uh, just contact through the distry.org contact yeah. and ask for that. And we'll we'll send you that uh, in a PDF form. It's rather large, so I have to send it. Transfer Excel, but just give us your email. We'll send that to you. No, I'm well familiar with the book, and I was. It was uh, surprising to uh, read him already naming me by name in the preface of the book. I mean, he didn't wait to get to chapter one, but uh, basically uh, the critique shows that uh, again his homework was not. It was incomplete. He, he didn't really understand our work, and so uh, I went through I think ten reasons why. Uh, he didn't show our work properly. And when properly understood, I think the work stands on its own and uh, it, it really stands up well against uh, all the criticisms to date. Got it. Well, Mark, as you were pointing out earlier, you've been refuting or addressing these criticisms for, I mean, ad nauseum, years and years and years. So I totally understand what you're saying about who cares about the critics. You know, let's let's show this data. Let's talk about this amazing information and evidence with people who care, with people who have an open mind, people who are on the fence, not people who have hardened themselves to it. No, I'm really interested in, in working with folks who are sincere. Uh, look, the dinosaur nerve work that we found uh, was, was so compelling to the journal that they put it on the cover, okay? So they gave us the cover of the journal for that issue because of the work. And so that's, that is science recognizing the science. And so that's hugely gratifying. And it's humbling, really, to be given a journal cover. That doesn't happen very often. Um, unless you submit pictures to the journal just for them to publish the picture, right? I have plenty of those. But, but to do the work and have it published and have the journal editors recognize the significance of the work uh, by putting it on the cover, I think, speaks for itself. And, you know, as far as some of these critics, uh, a lot of the criticisms go back to the original Acta Histochemica paper, uh, which I think was a, a great paper. I'm still really so proud of it. But here's the thing. Uh, that paper was reviewed by Dr. Schweitzer and several other uh, evolutionary paleontologists, and uh, it passed peer review. In fact, Dr. Schweitzer was later interviewed for Nature Communications, and uh, she uh, stated that the work was fine. She saw no problem with it. So when people start saying, well, this is a bison horn, and this, that, or the other, or you fabricated uh, the location, you know, the location, a lot of people complained about the uh the actual uh, uh, 
I, I forget the another senior moment. I forget the actual term here, but a person who's familiar with uh, latitude and longitude and plot lines in counties and stuff like that. A guy emailed me and said, I walked right to that place. So it's not hard to find. Uh, all you have to do is read the paper and, 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 and study it for yourself. But no, I, I, I actually forget what the whole point of my, my uh, point was. But here's the real point. The science needs to be done. It needs to be continued. Uh, we'd love your support, uh, certainly your prayer support. You can pray for us. You can pray for the labs that we're conducting. But uh, there are some people out there with some very deep pockets who can fund uh, this work, uh, maybe have centers of excellence around the country where different people around the country are doing this work and publishing on it. That's the goal, to publish as much as possible and present this to the world. So uh, that's the kind of support we're looking for. Well, I appreciate that, Mark, and um, I want to respect your time. Time has flown by. You've done a fantastic job, uh, tons of great questions, and uh, awesome, very thorough answers there, uh, Dr. Armitage. I really appreciate it. Can I give it. a shameless plug for our books? Of course. Yeah, take your time, man. No rush. Both yeah. questions about it for bone cell. We've got uh, two issues now. We're working on a third one. These are free. You can download these from the website. If you want printed copies, just contact us from the website because we, we put all the work in here. You can you can share it with your friends. We want you to give these away. If you get one of these and you keep it on your bookshelf, shame on you. I want you to give it away. So you can download those or contact us and we'll get them to you. Absolutely. And it, anything we've discussed today, anything that you've uh, kind of uh, plugged and the papers we've discussed, the information on the blood clots, I want to put that in the description box of the video for people. You know, we've still got 80 people in the chat uh, really enjoying this. And a shout out for you here, um, Dr. Armitage. This is from a, a good brother in the Lord, Dr. James Carter. He's been here uh, a few times before. He's done amazing work <clears throat> debunking abiogenesis. He says, greetings. Please let Dr. Armitage know who I am. I'm still writing my exhaustive review paper on ancient biomatter and would love to collaborate and receive training. So I just thought I'd put that up there for you. Yeah, have, him, have him contact us. Uh, but as far as training goes, sorry, Doc, it's all about the young students right now. Uh, <laughs> if, if you can reverse your age sometime, you're welcome to, bring, to come into a class, but certainly collaboration and you know, until until we get a chance to get out there into these towns and villages, into the community and give kids time to heal, let them know, hey, you can heal uh, from this. You need to heal from this. And you need to realize that these waves of bowls of wrath are probably in your future. And so we're, we want to get them healed up, get them, give them the hope that they need to know that the future is going to be OK if you walk that narrow road. Look, we're all trying to walk the narrow road, right? It's a walk. We're all on the path. Some are a little further ahead, some are a little further behind, but we're all on the same path. And that's what we want. We want everybody to get on that narrow road, trusting Jesus every day. You know, you, you, won't, you won't believe how he shows up in your life when you really start to trust him. I mean, tangibly in Amen. your life, when you really show up. So we want to bring that encouragement to people. We'd love to collaborate with other scientists. There's so much work to do. And uh, so we, we will pursue that. But as far as training, I think let's get the students taken care of her. <laughs> I'll go back to the postdoc and train them also. <laughs> how, long is this, how long is this tour going to last? That you're well, uh, as long as we have the resources right now, uh, after El Paso, we're going to Mount St. Helens Conference Center. Then we're going to Modesto. We have requests for Detroit, for Kansas, uh, for Montana, obviously, and also Pensacola, Florida. So, Wow. I think we're going to be busy for a couple of years, uh, but the, the students need this right now. They need this encouragement. Yeah, that's, well, you've got reward. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say that's a that's a large tour. I mean, you went from Cal Northern California to Florida. You don't get much farther. <laughs> yeah, uh, you drive in the slow lanes. Our freeways are not good. <laughs> well, if, you, if you'd like to volunteer to drive uh, and you have some experience driving a large uh, stretch van. Uh, contact us through distry.org. Uh, again, if, you, if you're interested in going to a dig, now you've got to pay your own expenses. It, it could be, uh, you know, plus, you know, the hotel and food. Uh, it's about $100, $120 a day just to the dig operator. So uh, we want to pay these folks because they're, you know, they're having trouble ranching right now. A lot of them uh, are doing bone ranching. So we want to support them. So uh, we like to take groups with us to help, help the dig operators. But man, what an experience for you to see this firsthand 
and close up and personal. And uh, then if you get to see the results from the lab, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Awesome. That would be amazing. That would be a blessing. Well, before we wind it down here, I should get get this question up here because I, I put out a challenge. We like to leave no stone unturned. And I think we've uh, pretty much addressed everything. Uh, Dr. Armitage, you've done a fantastic job. So here, as we were winding down, I put out a challenge uh, to any uh, skeptic who's on the fence in the chat. Uh, you know, is, is there um, anything else that we haven't addressed uh, that could preserve such a, a amazing uh, biomaterial for millions and millions of years. Just curious as to your final thoughts on um, this comment or, or question, trans Blucency says, well, the ones that seem to get preserved are A, fragmentary, and B, ones that have stronger molecular bonds in lower energy states. Uh, any right, thoughts well, on that, Mark? Yeah, I, I'm not a bond expert. I can't speak to bonds. Uh, if they are bonds, they're ancient. It, it, you know, there's no... I cannot conceive of how uh, lipids are being held together uh, through ancient time. But the, the comment about fragmentary is one that persists. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you see the Permian nerve publication that we're going to submit, some of these fibers are over four or five centimeters long. So they're not fragmentary. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, the vessels were all hardened by the clotting blood and we showed you that picture from the acta paper back in 2012 we first identified those crystallized blood products so uh this stuff isn't fragmentary we're finding when we when we uh when we decalcify some of the permian bones we see the entire blood vessel clotted sticking out like pin cushions sticking out of the bones clotted vessels that's on the website look at those videos with your own eyes so no, I, I reject the fragmentary notion, and uh, I can't speak to the state of the electron bonds, but somebody has to explain to me how Wesson oil can get poured out on the Permian and is still here today for me to collect. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, so much great information, uh, Mark. Again, I appreciate your time. I know how busy you are, as we both agreed earlier. Life's an adventure. So, uh, you know, our prayers go out to you for a safe tour, safe trip. Um, so, again, thank you so much. And any final words, final thoughts, anything you wanted to say to the audience, for example, before we kind of shut it down here? Yeah, I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in a dig, contact us through distry.org. Uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, review of uh, Dr. Fuzzrana's book, Dinosaur Blood and the Age of the Earth. Uh, contact us through distry.org. Download the free books, give them away, download the papers, memorize them, class. There's going to be a <laughs> test. <laughs> uh oh, Matt, you and I better be studying. Uh, <laughs> all good. We'll be ready. We'll, we'll study together. So uh, I appreciate it so much, Mark. We're going to get all those links. Uh, and, and everything kind of we talked about here in the description box. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for being here and joining me as uh, the co-host for tonight. Any final thoughts, final words from you there, uh, Matt, brother? I just had another question um, for the for the audience that, you know, they can't ask probably. Let's say that they're amateurs, right? But they live in uh, Idaho, Montana. These are massive dinosaurs. If they come across a dinosaur bone, um, obviously being an amateur, they might just pick it up. Could they send that to you for investigation? Would you like but, something? But, but here's the thing, um, and you'll see this in our publication history. You'll notice that every dig that we reference is a, is a dig that is known to the literature. So, you know, I, I will say this, in terms of the bone labs that we're conducting, yeah, we go through a lot of bones. Uh, and, and so, because we dissolve them all for the students. But it's important for us to know where that bone came from. In other words, what's what's the progeny of that? What what dig was it found in? What were the conditions? Uh, the other thing is, uh, even though some bones do still retain soft tissues after being out of the ground for decades, and this was proven in a paper published by the Royal Terrell Museum, where they took I think 15 or so specimens out of drawers and they process them for soft tissue and some 75%, 80% of them already st still had soft tissue in them. Uh, it, they're degraded somewhat. So we do, like to, we do like to collect them from the soil and put them straight into a fixative. 
uh, and that kind of preserves everything, keeps it in place, so that later when we do the dissolution, those tissues come out intact. And, and I'm telling you, they are intact and long, you know, up to five, six centimeters for some of these nerve fragments. So, uh, but, but that's probably the main problem is that we don't know the provenance of the bone, where it came from, what, how the dig is characterized, what the conditions were, and that it's out of the ground for a long time. So, uh, you know, contact us if you are on a site where paleontologists have dug and they found actual dinosaurs, they, they have uh, they've classified them as to what taxa they are, and they published. If you're on a dig like that, yeah, we want to talk to you. Right now, we have uh, five digs that we go to. Uh, but in order to really characterize this in different depositional environments, and especially with different taxa, you know, we want to show how many different dinosaur types have soft tissue in them. I think that's a very important thing, and it requires a lot of workers and a lot of bones and a lot of digs. So definitely, if you're on that kind of a dig, please contact us and yeah, we'll work with you for sure. Great response. So much good information uh, in this program, Mark. Again, I appreciate you giving us your time. I'm definitely re-watching this. We still got a, lot, a, a great chat with so many great comments. I just kind of wanted to sneak this in here. James Carter makes a good point. There are unsaturated fatty acids from specimens all throughout the geologic column. Those reactive double bonds would not last, agreed. Also, they aren't more degraded as you go down the column. That's, actually, that's yeah. a good point. Dr. Too. Carter, yeah, contact me through the website and we'll get together. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I, I see so many good comments coming in, guys. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm in the chat. Thank you for so many great questions. Please share this around as the truth is so important. We want this to get out to as many people as as possible. And again, uh, Dr. Armitage, thanks so much. Matt, thank you as well. Great show. Thank you for tuning in to the uh, audience. And Standing for Truth is out. God bless all. Evolution teaches that the present is key to the past. That's uniformitarianism. How things are today is how they were in the past. But if we use this mindset, we would have never guessed that a sloth was over 6,000 pounds in the past, since today we can carry them around like babies. Or that penguins were almost 7 feet tall and could easily walk up and murder you while you're using an ATM. But now we know that these things are true because we have found evidence that they are. So it's more the mindset we have when considering the past that dictates how we view the current. So then, what is the evidence that mankind could have lived a long time in the past? It's not like we can just go to some ancient human and find an ID in their grave and say, oh look, Noah was 900 years old. So we have to look at the genome of both modern and ancient man to resolve this question. Let's begin with what is aging? Why do we inevitably die from old age? Well, there's two major factors that contribute to this, genetics and overall DNA damage and loss. We used to think that genetics only played a very small role, if any factor at all, in determining how long we lived. The numbers changed all the time. We know better now. And the more we learn, the more we see that number grow. Another contributing factor is that of DNA loss. You see, every cellular replication that happens, we lose bits of DNA. Picture this happening like opening a zipper. The metal or plastic teeth along the edges of the zipper represent DNA. As we age, the zipper opens more and more. Thus, the more DNA is lost till eventually too much has occurred and the damage is done and we die. This is called the Hayflick limit. When cells divide, that genetic material needs to be copied. This is called DNA replication. Unfortunately, every replication doesn't bring the full DNA sequence with it. And after 40 to 60 cellular replications today, people die because just too much DNA loss has occurred. So if we're losing bits of DNA every replication and then we die when we lose too much, then logic tells us that if we had more DNA in the past, then we could live longer, since more DNA could be lost before too much damage has occurred killing us. Think of your genome like glass. Now think of DNA damage like a crack in that glass. 
A crack in a small window is catastrophic, but that same size crack on a larger window doesn't cause nearly as much damage and is not as bad overall. So, if our ancient patriarchal ancestors had more DNA than us today, then it would validate that they would have the biological potential to live much longer. What do we see? Exactly that. They had not just a little more, they had a lot more. Nearly an entire chromosome worth more. That's right, they had so much more DNA that it amounts to nearly the size of the entire Y chromosome. Imagine how much more damage the genome could handle with so much more DNA. That's a lot of buffer. Now, we know that a lot of animals, aquatic life, and reptiles never stop growing until they die. So therefore, the larger the shark or reptile, the longer it lived. So if they lived longer in the past, and we know ancient man ate these things, then why is it impossible for us to think that man also did not live longer in the past since they lived at the same time? We know that man lived alongside of these creatures because we found evidence of tool markings on the very bones that came from them scraping meat from these creatures, and then they made jewelry out of them. We have evidence that they ate giant cave bears and sea tortoise and the now extinct auroch. They ate giant deer, giant sloth, and even giant cows, including sharks and dolphins. And we have evidence a giant bird ate a Neanderthal child. Clearly, they all lived together. And yes, cavemen are mentioned in scripture. These people were never missing links in the line of human evolution. The Bible perfectly details who they were. So, we have humans living at the same time when all of these other long-living creatures were, yet for some reason we're told to believe that man alone was immune to these biological effects of a longer life that all of these other life forms seem to take advantage of. That makes no sense. Geneticists who work exclusively on aging all agree that we can live much longer in the future through genetic manipulation. One of the leading aging researchers, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, has said that humans, with the aid of gene editing via the removal of mutations, should be able to live for a thousand years. He even said that person is probably someone alive today. So, if genetically we can get there by using technology to essentially revert our genome back to a mutation-free state, then why is it impossible to think that our ancestors who were more mutation-free didn't live as long as modern-day geneticists are saying that we should live to be. I mean, isn't it a pretty big coincidence that secular science just so happens to throw out the biblical patriarch ages of longevity as our genetic potential? The patriarchal drive study shows that after 10 generations from the flood, Abraham was already dead from old age at 175. That's down from 950 years old in just 10 generations. Jacob, four generations later, died at 145. And by the time of Moses, seven generations after him, we have a 120-year maximum lifespan plateau. So the drop from maximum lifespan to a plateau of 120 was rapid, about 20 generations in all. Not only does the 2012 study show that the father's age contributes the most mutational load to the offspring, which Noah would have passed on the most in history, affecting all of humanity alive today, but we also see the same results in experiments today, and they are identical to what patriarchal drive discovered. We see this in inbreeding experiments. The same biological decay curve happens in birds, rodents, dogs, and fish. So if we see these same results in animal experiments and simulations that essentially are the same as the theme in the Bible and the story of Noah, then why is it impossible to think that this could not be the case? Of course it would be. And the predictive power of the biological decay curve in patriarchal drive is spot on. They even admit that something happened around 5,000 years ago that caused harmful mutations to arise out of nowhere and then explode in the human population. Our world in the past was very different going back in time. There was more magnetism, double atmospheric pressure and oxygen. All of these things are conducive to a longer lifespan. We have 10 reasons to conclude that it is obvious that man lived longer in the past and his true potential was somewhere nearing 1,000. Let's go over them. 
One, genetics is the major cause for aging, and we inherited a genetic burden through Noah and his extreme age, topped with inbreeding. Animal studies and patriarchal jive by John Sanford and Dr. Robert Carter validate this correlation and show an identical biological decay curve that we would expect to see if the biblical story of Noah was true and the ages in scripture were a fact. So, if the evidence corresponds to what scripture says, why not believe that it was true? The predictive power of patriarchal drive shows us what happens when extremely aged fathers do have offsprings, what the results would be. They line up perfectly with what we would expect to see if a human who was 500 years old had children. And the statistical probability of this lining up with the biological decay curve is beyond coincidence. We now have learned that mutations are passed on based on the father's age. And the older they are, the more mutations are passed down, on and on. And it just so happens to line up perfectly with what scripture tells us about Noah and his age when he had his children. And the genetic mutational load he placed on them which would have reduced not only their lifespan, but all future generations, if Noah was truly that old when he was a father. If all of these are not true, then why? Number two, a larger genome in humans allows for more damage to occur. And we now have evidence that we had much larger genomes in the past, which logically concludes that we could have lived much longer from this alone. If not, why not? Three, other cultures mention a time called the Golden Age. It's quite peculiar that civilizations that supposedly never met all decided to come up with this idea that humanity lived to extreme ages in the past. Why would they all invent the exact same ridiculous idea? 4. We have clear evidence that telomeres get shorter every generation, yet the decay rate stays the same, which validates that people had the potential to live much longer in the past just from having more padding protecting the ends of the chromosomes. The logical conclusion with this evidence would be that this allowed people to live longer. If not, why? 5. We literally have genealogies that go back to Noah from different places in the world. These are not biblical genealogies. These are outside lineages of unbroken chains of royalty going all the way back to Noah from different places in the world. Clearly, these were real people. If they were not, when did they stop being real people and turn into myth? Number six, in the past we find more oxygen, more pressure, more magnetism. All have been documented and shown to extend lifespan. So if all of these conditions were met in the past, why could man not have lived longer just from these aspects alone? Seven, aging is related to genetics. There is no doubt about this. Since it is genetic, then genetics gives us an answer to the riddle of human lifespan. If aging is related to mutations, then we can predict that removing mutations is better for us and we would live longer. We see this is true in multiple studies. And now we have entire laboratories dedicated to human longevity, like the Sense Foundation, Unity, i the Methuselah Foundation, and the Longevity Science Foundation, and many more. Our model answers this paradox of human aging, but evolution has many theories trying to solve this riddle and explain the discrepancy. That is why it is a paradox for them, because it makes no sense evolutionarily. Number 12. Mutation rates are too fast for humanity to be very old. In our model, this is easily explained from NOAA, and we can see that these mutation rates and both SNVs and harmful mutations are rising at this time. Number 8. We know mutations are building up and up and up, compiling with no way for the body to get rid of them. There are many names in biology for this, but this mutation accumulation problem has led geneticists to question how humanity could have ever lived as long as it has. How could these mutations, which are lowering fitness, adding disease to the population, and overall harming the system, not be evidence of a longer lifespan going backwards in time? We know mutation accumulation is a real problem, but here's the dead giveaway that it is true. The human genetic mutation database alone tells us this. It adds anywhere from 6,000 to 20,000 new genetic diseases to the database every three months, which is an annual growth of over 24,000 new diseases from mutations on the small side. 
In 2017, over 20,000 new genetic mutation diseases were added at the population level. As of 2017, the total number was 214,158. As of December 2021, we are now at 352,731. Selection is not stopping nor having any effect on this, and beneficial mutations are nowhere to be found to help. What do we see? Genetic degradation and mutation accumulation. And top that with the fact that the average person is missing over 100 genes. How can evolution try to tell us one thing when we're seeing the exact opposite? And if this is what we see, why wouldn't ancient man with less mutation saturation overall not live as long? 9. Removing mutations from just a single gene in mice allowed them to live 23% longer. And they admit that the same should roll over into humans. Now think about this. If they removed mutations from just those 20 longevity genes, that's an increase of lifespan over 460% or 672 years of age. All we actually need to do is remove them from 25 genes, and we now have the potential to live for 1,000 years. This is a 787% increase in lifespan. And this evidence is more proof that an ancestral genome with less mutations was far superior than ours today. If not, why is this evidence wrong? Why are the geneticists wrong? Number 10, fitness is going down over time. This means logically that going back in time, fitness was greater. The more fitness, we know the more likely an individual is able to survive and live longer to reproduce. So I believe people saying that, oh, we don't live long today, so we couldn't in the past, is just like saying, well, creatures today don't live long, so there's no way they were living longer in the past either. Well, of course they were, and we know they were. So the same conclusions we can deduce with humans. Number 11. Inbreeding reduces lifespan, and inbreeding studies follow the same biological decay curve as to what we see when we look at Noah's offspring. Number 12. Humans do not speciate, so we have no way of helping buffer additional mutations added to our genome. There is no way natural selection can save us. Only gene editing can resolve our future extinction. What gene editing does is erase mutations. Since mutations are leading to shorter lifespan, less fitness, and more disease, then we know that removing them is imperative to overall better health and lifespan. If mutations were not a problem for aging and disease, then geneticists would not be trying so hard to figure out how to remove them to extend human life and rid disease. Yet, they are. Why is that? Number 13. Another line of evidence that people could have lived longer is that scripture tells us that the pre-flood people ate a plant-based diet. Meat was condoned only after the flood. And we know today that cooking meat ages the body greatly. It adds carcinogens and what's known as advanced glycotic end products. And the acronym for it is AGE because it ages us rapidly. So again, logically we can conclude that if people today are eating things that are aging them more rapidly, but our ancient ancestors didn't eat those things, they probably lived longer. If not, why? Number 14. Our leading geneticists on biological aging all agree that man could live to a thousand if we remove mutations through gene editing software. Why are they wrong when all of the evidence and actual repeated studies have shown us that we are headed in that direction and that they are correct in this prediction? And why does it happen to just line up so coincidentally with the Bible? That's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed. I wonder, are you familiar with it? There's a paper, one of my favorite papers has to do with translational pausing and how a lot of these redundant elements. And I think uh, specifically with uh, third codon um, variation, third position codon variation, where I've heard a lot of critics say that they can use this because it's neutral variation, it's redundant, it's not really doing anything. And uh, they can build phylogenetic trees, look at these nested patterns, and therefore conclude humans and chimps are related. But now we're finding out these redundant elements are not only there to correct error, but they're also involved in information flow. So we have yeah. multiple functions. And are you familiar with that, Dr. Ron? 
I, I am, yeah. And you know, and for example, redundancy in the in the human or in the um, in the genetic code actually produces optimization that minimizes uh, error that could or, or minimizes the loss of information that could occur as a result of both substitution and framework mutations. And so this is an instance that's related to your point where redundancy in the system is actually producing an optimal system. Uh, and, and, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, synonymous mutations. Yes. Uh, th we're learning that these, you know, where the mutation produces the same amino acid, we're learning that, that this isn't, again, these synonymous mutations are not actually, uh, you know, synonymous because different codons actually can, control the, you know, the rate of translation as you're talking about pausing at the ribosome. And that impacts the folding of the protein, which really produces a, a different type of functional protein or a, a protein with modified function. So, you know, this is, this is really a, a, a profound point because a lot of molecular, the, the theory related, relate, related to molecular evolution is built upon the idea of synonymous and non-synonymous mutations. And if, if synonymous mutations really are not synonymous, that, that is a, has catastrophic implications for um, molecular evolution. Amen. So much great information, Dr. Ron. It's, it's so true. That really is catastrophic because there are specific evolutionary biologists that I've even engaged that thought or that have pointed to this neutral variation, synonymous codons, and therefore the hierarchies that, that result from it. They have pretty well looked at that as just a, you know, absolute evidence for, for ancestry. And now it seems like are we looking at neutral variation or functional variation? Yeah. And therefore, would you say these hierarchies are then there by design? Yes, yeah. yes, I would. And, you know, and, and, you know, the thing is with nested hierarchies, you know, again, where you have these, you know, s these sequences that are groups within groups within groups that presumably reflect an evolutionary history. But if you think about it, uh, let's use the automobile as an example. Uh, nested hierarchies are uh, very much part of uh, of systems that, that are designed, particularly when those designs have a history where the design has undergone uh, an evolution, if you will. You know, uh, and so, like, if you think about automobiles in the very first automobiles, you know, clearly there are certain design elements there that all automobiles share, right? But then it as we look at future generations of automobiles, there might be new design elements and new functionality that's introduced into the automobile. And that that then becomes part of, of, the, of the standard automobile design. And so you know, future generations beyond that point, we're gonna have both of those design features as part of, its, as, as part of their design. And then in the, and later on, when there's a third design element that's introduced, that then becomes mainstay, you now have three design elements that if you looked at all the automobiles through that, that history of automobile design, you would actually group those automobiles within, within a, a groups, within groups, within groups, within a nested hierarchy. And so, you know, nested hierarchies uh, are, you know, found in, in human designs right. all the time. So it, it doesn't necessarily demand evolution is the only explanation. It's consistent with an evolutionary history, but it isn't exclusive to an evolutionary history. It could reflect the design history, which is what we're talking about, right? When we look at the history of life on earth, it's a design history. Well, that's a, a fantastic point, Dr. Rana, because I find it interesting that it, when we start from the Bible, we know that we're made in God's image. So therefore, you know, there's something about us that reflects the divine. And yet we build, as you pointed out, we build systems in these nested hierarchical patterns. And yet we see nested patterns in the biological world as well. It's almost like we're getting an, an idea or a sense into how God designed based on the way we design. Yeah. We're made in his image. Well, you know, it, it's interesting to me because, you know, so oftentimes the argument is that that shared designs, whether the, the designs are in the form of a nested hierarchy or other, some other type of pattern, it, you know, is evidence for an evolutionary history, right? Uh, and, and so you could also argue, well, it reflects common design, 
you know, as opposed to common descent. And oftentimes I hear skeptics say, well, why would an infinite creator limit himself to just certain design features, right? Why would he limit himself to these archetypical designs that might be varied, but still are, are archetypical designs? Wouldn't a, a creator who has limitless resources produce a, an incredible diversity of life on earth? where all the different life forms look different. Well, the, 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 the thing that's, I think, missing in that analysis is the fact that because of shared design features and because of these nested hierarchies, what we learn when we study one organism actually can be generalized and applied to all a, a large number of organisms. And this allows us to, to study model organisms and from that develop general principles about biochemistry and biology. And, and so in a sense, the, the shared features that we see in biology reflect a design that makes biology even possible, uh, uh, you know, as a scientific discipline. You could argue that there's a, that, that biology has been designed for discovery, designed to make it amenable to, to, to learn and make sense of it very readily and very easily. And so I see that as part of God's providential care. Uh, and, and so there's an elegant reason why a creator would, would create things with uh, shared features and with nested hierarchies, because again, it, it, it lends itself to discoverability. Amen. Well said. Well said, Dr. Ron. It makes me excited because it's a great time to be, uh, you know, a creationist, to be an intelligent design proponent because of the models and the possible predictions and discoveries, as, as you've pointed out with, with discoveries. As a quick reminder to everyone, hit that like button. It actually does help. Team Standing for Truth is out. get this question in here before we have to call it a day because of how many times I've gone through your refuting Dawkins book. I think it would be good for the audience to hear because I noticed that Richard Dawkins, Dawkins likes to point to the Lenski experiment as solid evidence for evolution. And I find that you dismantle that really sufficiently in that book. Uh, so the question would be, is that actually evidence for that type of evolution people like Dawkins want to believe in so badly? See, the problem is uh, that humans have such a long generation time, say 25, 30 years, it's sort of impossible to, uh, to look at the at what they want. So what they've done is go to bacteria that can reproduce every 20 minutes or so. And hopefully with so many generations, they might be able to see some evolution happening. But in fact, for decades, you see, Lenski's done this bacterial um, experiment to look at the populations of bacteria, see what he could find. Now, he almost gave up on it because it was so hopeless. So he went to computer simulations, the Avida thing, which also doesn't make any sense either. But it's because he gave up on bacteria for such a long time. Uh, but then he found some things which could supposedly digest something different, the citrate, which it couldn't do before. But what it turns out to be, in fact, is that we have a number of uh, probably about two information losing mutations that that turn out to be beneficial and when we look at it look at a lot of the claimed beneficial mutations they are information downhill they're actually breaking something and not making something of course there are many more ways of breaking something than making something so it's not surprising you see all things can actually digest citrate there's something called the citric acid cycle bacteria have that but most of the time, uh, what we have, we, we do that when we've got oxygen because it's, it's um, wasteful to do it when, it's we, when we have oxygen. We've got other things we can do. Sorry, when we have oxygen, we don't normally use that because it's not as efficient. We have aerobic 
processes. But if we are short of oxygen, then we have anaerobic processes that use citric acid. So normally uh, the bacterium has the, the switch, it's the citric acid thing is switched off when there's oxygen around. And only switch on when there's a lack of oxygen. But what happened, it seems like you have a couple of mutations that uh, turn the switch back on. So it now the citric acid digestion lasts the whole time. So in those circumstances, it's actually a useful thing to have this ability to, to uh, digest citrate whether you have oxygen or not. But it's still, it's a downhill change. The, the main um, mechanisms are already there. They already existed. So all we've done is just turn on the switch so that the switch is permanently on. I mean, you can imagine if you've got a car alarm, uh, maybe you could actually deter burglars if it was on the whole time because who wants to hear that <laughs> the whole time? Right, good but point. Who would really want that alarm because I, mean, I don't want as a driver to have the alarm blaring in my, in my, my ears when I'm driving, you see. So we want to have an ability to switch it on, but there might be a time when a permanent on disabling the off switch might be an advantage. Right. And that's right. the best he's got. You see, at the most, you've got two beneficial mutations that are coordinated. Both of those seem to be downhill changes. That's the best they can do is two, two mutations. Some of these things we, we need to explain um, must require millions of, of tiny changes to build up machines of living things, all things that we have to, to, uh, to live. I mean, so just getting a couple of mutations in huge numbers of millions of generations, and that's the best they've got. It's, it's pretty sad that the best they got, uh, Dr. Sarfati, as you're pointing out, are still reductive or still downhill. And that's a great answer to uh, Richard Dawkins' use of the Lenski experiment, because from my understanding, too, even though there were some uh, organismal or some bacterial adaptations observed, overall, I think his, his uh, bacterial populations are shrinking in functional genome size. I think what yeah. we're observing, even in, in that experiment, is devolution. As, as well, we definitely devolution, because it's going downhill, because uh, uh, the repair machines don't work perfectly, and um, if we're keeping them alive artificially we're not even getting rid of some of the worst things but we're preserving them and then um we get this occasional thing which has a break breaking thing something's broken but it actually does better than something that's non-broken right right and so you're breaking you know, down pre example we've got another thing with antibiotics again uh, some this some breaking of a germ can make it resistant to antibiotics I, I like the way you say that because it makes me think that evolutionists oftentimes want to point to the phenotype when you mm -hmm. actually go down on a molecular level, go down to the genotype and you see, as you're pointing out, Dr. Sarfati, things are breaking down mm. for adaptive purposes, but it's all downhill. It's not it uphill like evolution. I'd say even yeah. on the phenotype level, it's downhill because I mean, you've got things like um, you know, blind uh, creatures in caves. So clearly, there's right. a phenotypic change of loss of uh, the sh eyes are shriveled up, and it, but it's beneficial. You don't need eyes if there's pitch black and you don't really want eyes because you're getting damaged too easily. Right. In a case where natural selection is not eliminating creatures that can't see, and it might even be favoring them because they're less likely to be damaged. But again, it's a downhill change going from sighted to blind is downhill, clearly. Well, I that's mean, why that's a problem. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And that's why I, I look to their arguments. I feel like they have a kind of a worthless view of, of fitness because to them, I guess the way that they define evolutionary fitness, the blind cave fish or the wingless beetles, that would be a gain in fitness. Well, it when is, in fact, they survive, you see, but they do survive. But the thing is, it's still downhill. It doesn't explain how sight or flight got there in the first place. I want right. to see how new things get there, not how some existing things get broken. Right. Like, so, things can be broken. It's very easy. I mean, it's a lot of different ways a human can become blind, for instance, a damage to the optic nerve or damage to the cornea or um, retinal detachment. The optic nerve could be not formed. There's so many different ways that a human could become blind, but not very many ways a human can see, really. It's very fortunate that um, most of us have decent eyes. But it's so many much ways to break it, not very many ways to wake it. It's, it's much easier to break something than to actually build it up to gain something novel, which is all consistent with, with our model of, um, you know, a perfect creation and, and the fall and, and kind of just degradation and extinction. Um, yes, what we see, so everything we see in science is so consistent with creation and fall, but often the critics don't uh, neglect the fall part of it though. 
Right. They will point to something which is not quite working right now uh, and say, well, therefore, but it wasn't made right in the beginning and overlooking the fact that it deteriorated, it deteriorated from its original perfection. I, mean, I think even now we see a perfect concept of design, but in this fallen world, the concept of the site has been marred by you know, thousands of years of deterioration. Exactly right. It, it kind of goes back to your answer to the bacteria and the viruses, you know, where they're looking at some that have maybe crossed. It's kind of like I think of it like a hammer, you know, a hammer can be used for good construction mm -hmm. purposes, building, or of course, it can also be used for bad. And so again, you can kind of use it for bad and for good. In many ways, you can use a hammer for bad. Only one way you can use it for good. We've got a nail there, right? Amen. All right, looks like we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and at Standing for Truth, we are dedicated to defending the truth of biblical creation. We also host debates, interviews, lectures, and more. And so if you enjoy this content, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and please share around this content as the truth is so incredibly important. One of the many ways we defend the truth of biblical creation is by inviting and hosting some really awesome guests on the program. And today it is a privilege to have Jay Siegert here with me for an important show. Today's program is titled Evolution, Probable or Problematic. Jay, thank you so much for giving me your time for today's important program. Yeah, it's great to be on the program. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Jay. I'm doing good. I'm excited for this. The audience is excited as well. Um, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm I'm fired up. I tell people I've been speaking for about 37 years, but I'm just getting warmed up because I get more <laughs> and more excited about this topic. And especially as the world has gone upside down, uh, the truth of the biblical message is needed more than ever. Amen, brother. Well said, well said. Uh, well, before we get into your, I would say, must-watch uh, presentation, I'm just going to uh, give everybody a, a brief bio in, into who you are and also where they can find more about you, Jay. So Jay Siegert is an international speaker and author, and he is the managing director for the Starting Point Project. He holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater and John Brown University. He also serves on the board of directors for Logos Research Associates. He is a former adjunct speaker for Creation Ministries International and has been speaking on the authority of scripture for over 36 years, and might I add, Jay, you're just getting warmed up, brother. Uh, Jay has a passion for helping Christians strengthen their faith, while also offering a gracious ch uh, challenge to the sincere skeptic. Jay, again, thank you so much for giving us your time for today. And uh, before, again, before we do hand it over to you, I do want to give a, a brief overview or, or description of, of your presentation, and then and, and then we'll we'll kind of get started. So. Uh, Today's presentation, it, certain aspects of evolution occasionally seem fairly plausible to many people, even Christians. If we use our imagination, we can envision fish slowly turning into amphibians, with their fins gradually being transformed into legs and their lungs adapting to breathing air. However, when we take a closer look at what actually has to go on inside in the DNA, we see a very different picture. It's like looking under the hood of a beautiful red sports car, only to find that its engine is completely missing. Presenting some cutting edge information about DNA, this presentation clearly demonstrates in layman's terms that molecules to man evolution is virtually impossible. Jay, uh, that is another reason why I'm looking forward to this. This is an important topic and uh, I wanna hand it over to you if there's anything else you wanted to add or we can certainly get right into uh, the presentation. Sure, well again, appreciate the opportunity to present this. This is this is one of my favorite talks because it's very unique. Even if you've heard uh, a number of other talks on creation, this one seems to be new for people. And I also like it because the, the core concepts are really easy to understand and convey to others. I'll, I'll use a lot of analogies along the way. So I'll give a background a little bit. I'm going to start sharing my screen because sure. uh, usually my lips don't move unless I've got PowerPoint in front of me. I don't <laughs> use notes. 
but the, the visuals are really going to help in this presentation. So I will start the process here to share my screen. Absolutely. And you should shortly be able to see uh, PowerPoint in just a second here. And yes. you can tell me, you can see the main too. screen there. Okay, yeah, evolution probable or problematic. Um, the viewers have a little bit of my background. I'm Actually, Jay, if, if I could, before you get going, I apologize. Sure. It, it might be good, I, a suggestion would be at the bottom there, you can see kind of a little window. Sometimes that gets in the way of some of the slides. If you click hide, then uh, okay. you, you won't have to worry about, perfect, perfect. That better. Okay, good. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little bit more background because it'll help you understand how I got into all this and then even background for this particular talk. And then again, I realize that most people don't know me from a hole in the ground. So very quickly, my background, that's me and that's a hole in the ground. Um, I only put that up there as a warning. I have a really dry sense of humor. So you're going to see that throughout the presentation. But uh, I was raised in a Christian home, and you can see very clearly that that is a Christian home. <laughs> and I, I was raised to believe the Bible cover to cover, never questioned it, never doubted it, have very strong Christian parents and sisters. Uh, I went to public schools all the way through high school. When I graduated, I went to John Brown University in Arkansas to study mechanical engineering. I got a degree there, but then I became more interested in physics but they didn't have a physics major there. So I had to leave there and went back to Wisconsin where I'm from, where I still live and went to the university of Wisconsin whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's where my world changed quite a bit going from a small Christian college where my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer to a large state university where my physics professors did not open up in prayer. They were all evolutionists. Some of them were atheists. And they were telling me that everything I believed was wrong. And that made me feel very uncomfortable to be surrounded by those PhD scientists who I, I assumed had a lot of evidence for what they believed. But I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I knew what I believed, I didn't know why. I could not defend the Christian worldview. So God put it on my heart to start looking into these things. So I have been researching and speaking for 37 years. About 15 or 16 years ago, I felt called into full-time ministry. So I gave up my own computer programming business and founded the Starting Point Project. Uh, it's all about our starting point. Everyone starts somewhere with their belief systems. It's impossible not to start somewhere. And that's a whole nother talk that I give on starting points, but that's where we came up with the name. I was also invited to be on the board of directors of Logos Research Associates. It's probably the world's largest consortium of scientists who are Christians and six-day creationists. The founding member, Dr. John Sanford, he's from Cornell University. He's famous for having invented something called the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA, again, worldwide famous for that. And then there's Dr. John Baumgartner. PhD geophysicist. He's built the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. <laughs> Just off the charts, brilliant. And even secular geologists will use that model. And then there's myself and three other board members. And I always say, as smart as these guys are, and they are brilliant, if they were with us right now, they would be the first to admit out of all six board members, I am the tallest. So kind of impressive. But I'm just uh, humbled to be a part of this group, and I get to learn some cutting-edge research that they're doing, and then I put it into something that you and I call English so that everyone else can understand. So that's enough about my background. Uh, this talk, Evolution Probable or Problematic, here's the background of where this talk came from. Uh, a number of years ago, I was invited to a bioinformatics symposium at Cornell University. This was hosted by Dr. John Sanford, the guy I just mentioned who invented the gene gun. I didn't know him well at the time, but this was by invitation only. He couldn't just show up. You had to be invited because I had met him prior briefly. He contacted me and invited me to go to the symposium. So I went. It was 27 lectures in three days. It was intense. Some of the world's leading scientists were there to talk about information and in living things. It was not about creation. It was not about Genesis or God or the Bible or religion or Christianity. It was strictly about information and living things. 
their point was that this all shows intelligent design, but they didn't want it to be seen as, oh, this is just a creation conference. So they just stuck to the science of information and living things. And so I went to this, flew home. I put the talk together that you're going to see, contacted Dr. Sanford and said, if I come back out to New York, could I spend a few days with you picking your brain and showing you my presentation to make sure it's accurate? Well, I did that. I spent two and a half days. I actually stayed in his house. I was like a kid in the candy store. And um, he said, yes, your talk is accurate. And he said, I love your PowerPoint. So I flew home. I finished up the talk and I made a video and DVD out of it. So that's the presentation that we're going to take a look at now. So many of the viewers have probably seen the television program, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? It's kind of a dangerous show to watch because you might find out that maybe you're not smarter than a fifth grader. But we're going to switch this up and ask, are you smarter than a PhD scientist? Now, that's where most people say, well, of course not. Those guys are brilliant. But I honestly believe that after you hear this presentation, you truly will be smarter than most PhD scientists when it comes to the creation evolution controversy because the vast majority of PhD scientists out there know nothing about what you are going to hear. They're very smart people and they're experts in their area. But science is very broad. And when you get a PhD, you're very narrowly focused. So most scientists on the planet don't know anything about the origin of the universe or the origin of life other than what someone else told them briefly because they're studying a different area. They're making rocket fuel, food preservatives, whatever they're doing. And they're really smart, but they don't know anything about this. Even the scientists who study evolution aren't that familiar with this all the time. And those who are a little bit don't really like to think about it much. So uh, that's where we're headed. And since we're talking about evolution, we need to define it because this word is used in so many different ways, so many different meanings. Uh, they'll talk about the evolution of the phone, how it has changed over the years. And yeah, it, it really has changed quite a bit. They'll call that evolution. I don't have a problem with that. They want to call that evolution. That's fine. That's just not what I'm referring to by evolution. And it's not what they teach in our school systems. I'm also not referring to all the different types of breeds of dogs we have on the planet. There's about 350 different breeds. I'm also not referring to different breeds of cats. I'm also not just referring to different beaks on finches that Darwin got very excited about. These are facts of science. Nobody denies those things. But those things have nothing to do with evolution as they're teaching it in our school systems. And it has nothing to do with evolution that I'm referring to in this talk. This is what they're teaching in our school systems. And this is what I'm referring to by evolution in this talk. The idea that about 3.8 billion years ago, dead chemicals came together to form a living cell. And then that living cell slowly turned itself into every other life form on this planet over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions and even a few billion years. This, I believe, is a story. I'm not saying that to be sarcastic or condescending. They didn't see it happen. So they're telling a story of what they think probably happened a long time ago over long periods of time. We also call this molecules to man evolution. And I highly recommend you using that terminology because if you just say you don't believe in evolution, the skeptic's going to look at you and think you're crazy because they're going to say, we see change all the time. Well, what do they just do? They did something we call equivocation. That's where you set two things equal that aren't equal, evolution and change. Now, evolution would involve change, but it's a very special kind of change and not the kind of change that we actually observe. So we don't deny that change happens, but we deny the type of change required by evolution happening that would turn dead non-living molecules into a living cell and that cell would turn itself into every other life form on this planet, including human beings. So the general premise of this talk is that sometimes you see something from a certain angle or distance and it looks pretty good, like this bright red BMW. You envision opening the hood and seeing a beautiful engine there. Well, what if when you opened that hood, you didn't see that engine, you saw this. The engine's missing. A bunch of wires are hanging there. So what looked pretty good to begin with upon closer inspection doesn't look so good anymore. And that's what we're going to see with evolution. Might seem plausible at first, but when you lift the hood, you're going to see there are massive problems. 
And as you mentioned in the description, certain portions of the evolutionary story seem pretty plausible. It doesn't take much imagination to envision small changes happening. If you take a look at these two creatures here, they don't look completely different. It doesn't take much imagination to envision bumps starting to form on that snake and getting bigger and bigger and eventually turning into the legs of the lizard. Small changes over millions and millions of years. You, you could picture that happening. But when you pop the hood to see what's going on inside, specifically with the DNA, that's where you realize this just cannot happen. Here's an interesting quote from Richard Dawkins, arguably the world's leading uh, atheist, very outspoken evolutionist. He said, you cannot be both sane and well-educated and disbelieve in evolution. The evidence is so strong that any sane, educated person has got to believe in evolution. That's a very intimidating statement for students to hear in high school or in college. Um, if you say, yeah, I don't really buy into evolution, you're crazy. And they will call you out because you obviously reject science. And so, again, that's intimidating a lot of Christian students and others remain pretty quiet if they have any doubts at all because they don't want to be labeled as ignorant or denying science. But Proverbs 18, 17 says the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes along and examines him. And we've all been in those situations before where someone says something and at first it sounds very powerful and you think you can't argue with that. But then someone else comes along and says, well, wait a minute. Did you know about this or that or that? You're like, oh, I, I didn't know those things. Okay, I guess that first thing that I just heard, that doesn't sound so good anymore. Well, I facetiously say, Evolution 1 1 says the only one to plead his cause seems right because no one else is allowed to challenge him or present other views. And that's what we have in our public school system. They're only presenting one view. So, of course, it's going to seem plausible because you're not hearing anything else, any other alternatives. Here's an interesting quote from Eugenie Scott, the former director of the National Center for Science Education. This is an organization that was largely established to combat biblical creation. She said, in my opinion, using creation and evolution as topics for critical thinking exercises in primary and secondary schools is virtually guaranteed to confuse the students about evolution and may lead them to reject it. <laughs> So she's saying, you can't give them an alternative option because if you did, they might choose it and reject evolution. You can't have that. And so if someone says, hey, what about the whole creation narrative? She says, thank you for bringing that up. See, now that's a religious concept. Um, and if you want to believe in that, that's fine. Go to church or something to read about that. But you're in school here and we only teach science. And scientifically speaking, there's only one game in town and that's evolution. If we ever discover something else, We'll let you know, but for now, evolution is a fact and it's the only thing going. So that's the only thing they're going to teach. Now, we don't have time for the big picture, but the big picture would involve a number of questions like the origin of stuff. If there's no God, no creator, no designer, how do we get stuff like matter and energy here? There's a lot of it. And once you have stuff, how does that stuff form stars, galaxies, and planets? The laws of physics mitigate against that. And once you have planets, how do you get dead chemicals to come together to form a living cell? Massive problems with that. And then once you have a living cell, how does that turn itself into every other life form on this planet? That's the big picture. We only have time to focus on this last one. How do you get a single cell to turn itself all the way into a human being? So that's what we're going to focus on here. Now, there's a lot of arranging and storytelling that goes on with teaching evolution. For example, I've got four modes of transportation here on the screen. We could align these from simpler to more complex and discuss the evolution of the motorcycle. You see, the smaller wheels at the back of the tricycle got together and formed the larger wheel and the chains of the bike. Then the chains of the bike turned into an electric motor of the scooter, and then eventually the electric motor of the scooter slowly turned itself into a gas combustion engine, and that's how we got motorcycles. Now, Nobody would believe that. That's a silly story. But all I did was I arranged real things from simpler to more complex, and I told you the stories of the small changes that happened over time. Well, it's very similar to teaching evolution. We line things up and we tell stories, like the evolution of the horse, from Eohippus all the way up to the modern horse. I have a very powerful quote from you 
Now for you, this comes from Dr. Niles Eldridge. He's a former curator at the American Museum of Natural History. Keep that in mind. He was a curator at that museum. This is what he said. I admit that an awful lot has gotten into the textbooks as though it were true. For instance, the most famous example still on exhibit in the American Museum, that's his museum, is the exhibit on horse evolution. That has been presented as a literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now I think that that is lamentable. But by the time it filters down to the textbooks, we got a problem. <laughs> so what's he saying? He's saying it, it never really happened and it probably shouldn't be in the textbooks. Well, if it didn't happen and it shouldn't be in the textbooks, why is it okay to have it in your museum? Well, it costs a lot of money to update the museums and all that. So you let the children still file by seeing all these pictures lined up in bones and tell the stories and all that, even though they know it actually didn't happen. And then from the Book of Life by Stephen Jay Gould, he was one of the world's leading evolutionists, died a number of years ago, very prominent scientist. He talked about fish evolving into amphibians over millions and millions of years. Well, what was the transitional form that it went through? Well, they discovered it. It's Tiktaalik. And they got very excited about it. There are reasons why Tiktaalik already doesn't count as a transitional form. It's a different talk. I don't have time to go into that. It's been, been ruled out. But basically, they found a fossil they hadn't seen before. And they look at their current lineup and figure out where could they stick it in. Well, it seems most likely, most comfortably to fit in between these two. So you put it in there. You say it's a transitional form and you tell your story. But doing that isn't much different than doing this, talking about how an Etch-a-Sketch evolved into an iPad. These two things are not completely different from each other. There are similarities. So use your imagination. What would it look like in the middle? So you draw pictures like that and maybe to put it in the textbooks. Um, but you know there's no way the simple internal workings of an Etch-a-Sketch could ever turn themselves into something as complex as an iPad. This is not going to happen because of the complexity of what's going on inside. So how do you make that transition from a single cell all the way to a human being? Well, when we reproduce as humans, um, our children um, do look different than we are. They're, they're not identical like this picture here. There are changes and you can see they might have similar eyes and hair color, but there are changes that occur. That, that's a fact of science. And there are two types of changes, built-in changes and random mutations. The built-in variation has to do with our gene sections on our DNA. And it's somewhat predictable because we learned a lot about our DNA. We kind of know what to expect. The random mutations are unpredictable because they're mostly largely uh, accidental copying errors. We don't know what errors are going to be made. So we'll take a look at each of these really quickly here. Built-in variation. We have two dogs and they both have medium length fur and you'll see they each have two copies of a gene that makes fur length. They each have a copy that makes long fur and a copy that makes short fur. Why do they have two genes? Because they had a mom and a dad and they got one copy from each of them. So we each have two genes for everything because you got one from mom and one from dad. And in these dogs, these genes combined and gave them medium length fur. Well, when they reproduce, they each pass on one of those genes. They don't get to pick which one goes. But if they both pass on a gene for short fur, the puppy will come out with short fur because it doesn't matter which gene gets expressed in its body. They both make short fur, even if they combine. It's going to have short fur. If they both pass on a gene for long fur, the puppy comes out with long fur. If one passes on a gene for long fur and the other for short fur, the puppy can come out with medium length fur if the genes are both expressed like the parents or if only one gets expressed it could have long fur or it could have short fur so you can have all the variations here in one generation and genes don't just make fur length they do other things they give you a large dog small dogs long ears short ears all the features we see in dogs are pre-coded in the genes we learned a lot about that if you look at these two sets of animals set a and b which set looks more similar to each other? Pretty obvious. The animals in set A look more like each other than the animals in set B. And why is that? It's because the animals in set A are the same kind of animal. Ten times in Genesis chapter 1, it mentions that creatures would reproduce after their kind. Can they 
form of variety. Yeah, you can get a nice variety, but always within limits. In fact, you can breed a dog and a wolf and you get a wolf dog. It looks a little bit like the dog, a little bit like the wolf. This is real science, real genetics, and it's what we would expect from scripture. But you can't breed the dog and the wolf and get an ostrich <laughs> because they don't have genetic information to make beaks and feathers. So you can get a variety, but there are limits. You can also breed zebras and donkeys and you can get something called a zonkey. It sounds kind of funny, but it's actually real science. Uh, why can you breed these two together? Are those two completely different animals? No, basically the same animal. One just has a nice paint job. <laughs> you can also breed a lion and a tiger and you get a liger. Why? Because they're both large cats. They're the same kind of animal, just a variety. But you can't breed a lion and a kangaroo to get a liangaroo. That one's not going to work because of the genetic limitations. There are a bunch of other examples you're not going to get would be these here. Uh, this is what happens when you have Photoshop and too much time in your hands, of which I have neither. Um, but they're funny because you know it can't happen. The genetics won't allow it. And biblically speaking, we don't expect something like this. So that was a built-in variation. Let's quickly move to random mutations, these accidental copying errors. We are going to quickly transform ourselves from doing a creation talk to being in a state university where I am a PhD um, molecular biologist and I'm going to teach my students how evolution works. So we talk about having an organism here that's going to reproduce. So it has to actually make a copy of its DNA and pass it on to its children. You can see the children look very much like the parent because it's a copy of the same DNA. Then the children reproduce and have grandchildren that look like the parents and the grandparents because it's the same DNA. Then the grandchildren reproduce and, oh, something's happening here. We have some very significant mutations. Things are coming out looking a bit different. Some apparently are bad, but others apparently are good. The natural selection comes along like a superhero and wipes out those bad changes, but keeps the good ones. Now, reproduction continues. The new good ones reproduce and have more of them, and then the original ones reproduce. You have more of those. And this process continues on for millions and millions and millions of years. Can you imagine the great variety of creatures we'd have on this planet with this process? Now, I guarantee you in that classroom, the non-Christian students hear that and they say, you can't argue with that. That's just clear. It's so obvious that it's a fact. It's proof of evolution. There's no way, no way you could argue with that. But I guarantee you, many, if not most, of the Christian students will come to the same conclusion. It's, it's clear. This is my PhD molecular biologist proving how evolution works. My pastor, he's just a religious guy and reading some antiquated book, and it was never meant to teach us truth like this, just you know, religious things about Jesus. And so they come away thinking evolution's a fact, and they weaken their view on Scripture, and many eventually just walk away from Scripture altogether. Well, we're now going to take a closer look at these mutations. Can they do what evolutionists tell us they actually do? I'm going to make three major points. Number one, that they are random, purposeless, and undirected. Number two, they occur in the DNA. And number three, they are almost entirely detrimental or bad. Start out with number one, random, purposeless, and undirected. Here's a quote from Nova Online. This is a secular source, an evolutionary source, and this is what they say. It's sometimes convenient when trying to make sense of evolution to think of changes within a species of having a purpose, as though Mother Nature has some intended goal that she sets out to achieve. The bacteria want to survive, someone might reason, when thinking about the declining effects of antibiotics, and so they evolve into resistant strains. Of course, there is no purpose in evolution, just random mutations within DNA, most of which are detrimental to the survivability of the organism. Those are the three points that I just made. When I was putting the talk together, I made that uh, previous slide, and then I found this quote after that, and I thought, that's pretty cool. That's, those are the three points that I'm going to be making. So they are admitting, evolutionary source, admitting there's there's not a purpose behind evolution. It's not trying to achieve something. It just copies its DNA, and stuff happens. But the popular literature will give you the opposite impression. Discovery News says, presumably the sauropods evolved large body size as a strategy 
to deter predators. So what are they insinuating? Humorously, something like this. At some point in the past, apparently dinosaurs weren't as large as they eventually came to be. So they're sitting around the campfire one night and they're saying, hey, you guys, we need to come up with a strategy to deter our predators or we're going to go extinct much uh, faster than we're supposed to. Do you have any ideas? And they say, no, our brains are too small. Finally, one of them says, I got an idea. What if we got some machine guns? We could shoot our predators. And the lead dinosaur says, no, we can't do that. They haven't been invented yet. It's okay, good point. Second dinosaur says, what if we hopped onto our motorcycles and we could ride off into the sunset? The lead dinosaur says, no, they haven't been invented yet either. And the third dinosaur says, I have an idea. What if, just what if we evolve really large body sizes? We could scare them away. And the lead dinosaur says, no, that's a good idea. Are we all in agreement? Yes. Okay. And they break and they go get big. There's not an evolutionist on the planet who believes that. They do not believe that a creature needed something, so it evolved it. But the popular literature will give you that impression. Like the fish were swimming around in the ocean for millions of years, but then food started to become scarce. So they needed to evolve lungs to go up on land to find new sources of food. So they evolved lungs. And the students will think, well, they got to do something or they're going to go extinct. Well, wait a minute. How do fish even know what lungs are? And even, even if they somehow knew what a lung was, what are they going to do about it? All they have is genetic information to make fish parts. And even by accident, they could start to evolve a few of the pieces. How do they survive over millions of years as they're trying to develop lungs, but they don't work yet, and now they can't breathe underwater very well anymore? They never get taught those very important details of that transition along the way. So the popular literature gives you the impression a creature needed something, so it evolved it. Second point here, these mutations are occurring in the DNA. I'll go through this really quick here. Most of you are familiar with DNA. It's like a very, 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 very complex blueprint with lots and lots and lots and lots of information on it. Well, let's talk about the storage capacity of DNA. Let's say you had just, just a teaspoon, a teaspoon amount of your own DNA, and you wanted to back that up onto a thumb drive. And we back up our computers in case they crash. So you have a teaspoon amount of your DNA, and you want to back it up on a 64 gig thumb drive. That's a big thumb drive. It can hold almost 10 million pages of text on a 64 gig thumb drive. How much space of that thumb drive would that take up? Just a teaspoon amount of your DNA. How many drives would you need? How about a thousand drives? That would be a lot, but we need more. How about a million drives? That That's unbelievable, but that's still not quite enough. You'd have to have someone give you a million drives every day for 139 years. And then you'd have enough storage space to back up just what can fit in a teaspoon amount of your own DNA. It's incredible to me that that screams design, but some people want to believe that just happened by accident. So DNA, it's like a set of encyclopedias that we don't use anymore, but you probably still know at least what they are. And the rungs on the ladder, that's what we call nucleotides. Those are like individual letters from the set of encyclopedias. When you group a bunch of rungs together, a bunch of nucleotides, you can create words. When you put thousands or tens of thousands of these rungs or nucleotides together, that would make a chapter, one chapter out of the whole set of encyclopedias, and that's what we refer to as a gene. Then when you put thousands of genes together, that's a chromosome. And that would be like a single volume out of the entire set of encyclopedias. And then when you consider the entire set of encyclopedias, that's what we call the genome. For people, we call it the human genome. A little bit of biology 101. Most people probably already knew that. So the last portion, which is going to be the most interesting, because so far it's been pretty, uh, pretty plain, actually. Well, we're going to really pick things up here and it's going to get exciting and fun and just absolutely incredible. These mutations are almost entirely detrimental or bad. So here's the story of evolution. Again, not trying to be sarcastic. Let's say that the amount of information in a biochemistry textbook is about the amount of information we find in a single celled organism. That, that's actually true. It's about how much information is in a single cell. But remember, we have to turn that cell 
all the way into a human being, which means we need to make changes to that cell. So here's a book. This is Biological Information, New Perspectives. This is a book that was put together after that conference at Cornell University. So we're just going to open up to a single page here and highlight some text and put that text off to the left. We can't just copy this book over and over and over. Otherwise, millions of years from now, we'll just have a lot of copies of the same book. If we want to turn it into something much better, like a human being, you'd have to make changes to it. Well, what are these changes? The changes are going to be mutations. And evolutionists admit mutations are the only game in town. It's the only way to get the raw uh, information required by evolution. So let's take a look what mutations look like. First of all, we have a duplication mutation. You take the word level, you put an extra L in there. We're duplicating that letter. It doesn't spell level anymore. Now, chances are if you were reading a book and you saw that, you'd say, oh, it's just a typo. It's level and you'd move on. That's not how our genes work. It would see that and say, I've never seen this before. It's useless. It destroyed that piece of information. Then we have a deletion mutation. You take the M out of model. It doesn't spell model anymore. That's a deletion mutation. Then we have a substitution mutation. You take the P out of probability, put a Z in there instead. It doesn't spell probability. Here's what's interesting. You could ask a five-year-old child what their favorite book is, and then they tell you the name of the book. Then you ask them, if we took your book, closed our eyes, opened up to a random page, stuck our finger on the page, and whatever letter we touched, we put an extra one of those letters in. And then we close our eyes and open up to another page, touch the letter, whatever letter we touch, we delete it. Do it again, whatever letter we touch, we take that letter out and put a random different letter in there. If we keep doing that to your book, what will happen? Will your book get better and better? A five-year-old child will say, no, it will get worse and worse. In fact, pretty soon I won't even be able to read it. A five-year-old understands that. You have to be highly educated to not get this. And what I mean by that is these PhD scientists who truly are brilliant often don't get it or don't want to know about it, and it's largely a spiritual issue. They're spiritually blinded. It's not that they're not smart enough. They're plenty smart. I think they're smarter than I am. But the Bible says that there's a big difference between intelligence and wisdom. The Bible says a fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and many of these scientists, they don't fear God. A lot of them don't even believe in God. So they lack the wisdom and the proper worldview and starting point to use to interpret the facts. They have enough facts in their head. They're just interpreting them incorrectly because of their errant worldview. So the challenge, though, for evolution gets much worse than that. Um, given a lot of back inf background information, this is where it gets fun. Because the challenge for evolution, it just goes off the charts at this point. And it has to do with information structure. Meaning, how is the information actually written on the DNA? When you find out how it's written, that's where you see very clearly the whole story of evolution. It just can't happen. Now, as a simple analogy, let's say you're reading a section of your DNA and it spells out, was it a rat I saw? Kind of a strange sentence. In English, we read from left to right. But you may have already noticed, you can read that backwards. Was it a rat I saw? It's called a palindrome. Not a very meaningful phrase, but it is kind of fun. You can read it forwards and backwards. Well, guess what? This is what we discovered about much of our DNA. Much of it can not only be read forwards, it can also be read backwards. But the complexity challenge gets worse than that because... That's the same message both ways. It's not an additional message. It's just the same message both ways. So the challenge gets worse with this analogy. Take a look at the word desserts. You flip that around and it spells stressed, which is what I get when I don't get desserts. So let's take this message system here and introduce one of our wonderful mutations, which is going to eventually turn that cell into a human being. We'll just introduce a deletion mutation. We'll delete the T randomly. Well, it doesn't spell desserts anymore, but it also doesn't spell stressed. One change messed up two messages because you can read it forwards and backwards. But guess what? We don't see little words in our DNA that you can read forwards and backwards. We see up to entire chapters of complex instructions that can be read forwards and backwards. 
And let me give you an analogy so you know exactly what that means. Let's say you have a job working for a cell phone company. And it's your job to write the instruction manual to give to the manufacturing plant so they can make the phones. That's what you do. So your boss comes to you one day and says, I have a project for you. I need you to write the chapter in the manual that will explain how the phone is going to download apps from the web. You say, yeah, I can do that. He says, thanks. He's walking away and then he turns around and goes, oh, sorry. <laughs> one minor detail. When you write that chapter, you have to write it in such a way, if we read your chapter backwards, it will explain how the phone's going to play music files. And then you're laughing at him saying, yeah, that's a good one. He says, no, I'm, I'm serious. We only have so much room in the manual. Your chapter has to make sense both ways. Okay, that's humanly impossible. It cannot be done. You can't even program a computer to do that. I, I did computer programming for 12 years. It's impossible. But that's what we're seeing in our DNA. Um, back up a second. You read a section, one direction. It's a set of very, very complex instructions that code to make certain proteins that carry out a specific function in your body. Now you read that segment backwards. It's a completely different set of very complex instructions that make completely different proteins that carry out a completely different function in your body. Two major points with this. Number one, particles interacting in nature over time could never create a complex information system that you can read both forwards and backwards. And number two, even if you had an information system like that, when you make random changes to it over time, you will not be improving it. You will be destroying it faster and faster because most of the times you're making a change, you're messing up two messages. But the challenge for evolution gets worse than that. We not only have forwards and backwards messages, we have overlapping messages. Take a look at this phrase, I like choco later that evening. Kind of strange because it's two phrases that overlap. I like chocolate, which is true, and then later that evening. These two phrases overlap in the middle. They share these four letters here. So let's introduce one of our random mutations here. We'll just randomly take the E out and put a Z in there instead. It doesn't spell I like chocolate. It doesn't spell later that evening. One change messed up two messages because they overlap. And this is what we have in our DNA. But our DNA doesn't have just a few letters that overlap. It has up to entire chapters of complex instructions that overlap each other. It is unbelievably complex. But guess what? The challenge for evolution gets worse than that. We also have spliced information. Same phrase again. This time let's underline a few segments and bring them down below. And it spells, I like her hat. It's called a spliced message. This is what we're finding in our DNA. We have spliced messages. So let's introduce a random mutation. We'll just delete the H. It doesn't spell, I like chocolate but it also now does spell I like her hat because it messed up the main message and it messed up the spliced message. But we don't see just a few letters that can be spliced out of our DNA. We see up to long sentences and short paragraphs that can be spliced out. What does that mean? Take a biochemistry textbook, read the whole thing. You just learned a lot of information. Now you go back and you just pull out long sentences from one place and short paragraphs from another place. You keep doing that. You put them all together. You got another chapter of instructions there. It can't be done. We can't write something like that, but that's what we're finding in our DNA. But the challenge gets worse than that. We have embedded messages in our DNA. Take a look at this phrase. Can you show Mike Owen checks from Oliver's latest facts and set it on the desk? Okay, let's circle every eighth letter here and then bring those down below. And it spells, I like chocolate. There's a theme going on here. It's my talk. I can do that. <laughs> this is an embedded message. So let's introduce one of our wonderful mutations. We'll delete the H. What that would do is it would uh, shift over all the letters after that space where we deleted a letter. So now the eighth letters are these letters. You bring those down below and it's completely meaningless. One change messed up the main sentence, but it also messed up the embedded message. 
again, the information structure here is unbelievably complex. But the challenge gets worse than that. We have encrypted messages in our DNA. I actually had uh, three interviews with the CIA to work in their cryptographic analysis division. Kind of a creepy story for some other time. But uh, let's take a look at encrypted messages and what that means. So we have a phrase going across the screen here. It seems pretty meaningless. But what if you found out there was an encryption key? meaning everywhere there's an H, it's really an A. Everywhere there's a B, it's a C. Everywhere there's a W, it's a D. Everywhere there's a Y, it's a T. So those two Ys, those are really Ts. So if you make all the substitutions, you find out it spells this is an encrypted message. Kind of cool. That's one way of doing data encryption. This is what we've been finding in our DNA. There's also encrypted messages. So let's take a second to think through what would be required to create an encrypted message system, keeping in mind there's no God, there's no creator, there's no designer. It's just particles interacting in nature over time. What would these particles have to do to come up with an encrypted message system? This is what they'd have to do. First of all, they would have to be developed develop a language system using symbols. So when you got three sticks like that, if you put them together this way, we're going to call that an A. And if you have three shapes like this and put them together this way, we're going to call that a B. You have to create an entire alphabet by particles banging together in nature. Secondly, you have to be able to create and define words. When you put those four letters together, it's going to represent that object. You have to create an entire dictionary of words and definitions by particles banging together in nature. You have to be able to write meaningful sentences and paragraphs, which requires rules of grammar. How do you create rules of grammar by particles banging together in nature? Then you have to establish the encryption system with that key that I mentioned before. After that, you have to create the system that does the coding and the decoding. And then you have to develop the ability to read and carry out the instructions or the whole thing is useless. There is not a scientist on the planet who can even begin to explain how particles interacting can do any of this. But that's what we're seeing in our DNA. One last time, I'm skipping a few details. You can thank me for that. But the challenge gets worse. We actually have 3D information in our DNA. This is a little bit harder to depict with PowerPoint, but I'll do my best here. When the DNA makes proteins, they're not these little short ladders. They're actually very, very complex three-dimensional folds. And if they're not folded just right, like a lock and a key, they're useless and they're disassembled and the components are reused. So I'm going to put seven words on the screen here, just kind of random words, and I'm going to fold these words, just again, best I can in PowerPoint. You'll just stack them on top of each other. When we stack these words this way, You'll notice going up and down, there's an additional piece of information, the word success. Now, obviously, if you delete letters, substitute letters, duplicate letters, you're going to mess that up. But also, if you don't fold it right, you know, you fold it this way, you lose that piece of information. And that's what we have in our DNA. When it gets folded, certain portions are now on top of each other that weren't by each other before. By reading up and down, there's additional piece of information. And that can even change over time to give you additional pieces of information. It is unbelievably complex. So wrapping this whole thing up, certain things might look pretty good from a certain distance or a certain angle, like the bright red BMW. Again, we envisioned opening the hood and seeing a beautiful engine. Well, we just opened the hood on evolution to find out the engine's missing. There's nothing to drive evolution. There's nothing to give you the astronomical amount of new complex information to turn a single cell into a human being. Here's a quote from a geneticist. He said, genetics has no proofs for evolution. It has trouble explaining it. The closer one looks at the evidence for evolution, the less one finds of substance. In fact, the theory keeps on postulating evidence and failing to find it, moves on to other postulates, fossil missing links, natural selection of improved forms, positive mutations, etc. This is not science. One final quote. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You've probably heard that before. And it's as true now as it ever has been. And the more we look into science, the more it backs up 
exactly what God said all along. It's almost as if God knew what he was talking about. So that's evolution probable or problematic. Uh, very briefly before we go to some Q&A, just highlight resources that we have with our ministry. Uh, everything we have is online. We obviously don't have a table here. I'm not doing a live talk, but we've got currently 11 different DVDs, which consists of about 22 different video sessions. Each session is also streamable. People purchase the physical DVDs. We throw in the streaming for free. I have three books, the book on creation and evolution. I've been told by some of the world's leading scientists, I think it's the best overview that's out there, which I was honored to hear. Another book that came out about four months ago is Faith is Not a Four-Letter Word that deals with the whole myth of facts versus faith, that skeptics are supposedly all about facts and proven things, and Christians, we just have faith. That book graciously dismantles that myth and teaches Christians how to defend their faith without having to have degrees in physics and archaeology and Greek and Hebrew. And then Creation to Christ, the Old Testament in a nutshell. That one just came out about five weeks ago. And it gives you a timeline, the history of the Old Testament from creation all the way up to Christ. Very briefly, it very briefly describes every major event in person, shows you a physical timeline. It is one continuous story. It is not confusing. You'll see the flow from creation to Christ, making sense of everything, fitting where dinosaurs fit in. The Ice Age, was there really a flood? And a lot of questions come up along the way as you're reading that. Well, there are 150 pages of appendices giving you details. Scientific evidence for the flood. What caused the Ice Age? How do dinosaurs fit in there? Why was there so much violence in the Old Testament? Did people live to be 900 years old? What about the strange dietary laws? And on and on. All that's in that particular book. We have a video on it as well. I also give Grand Canyon uh, tours. I just got back from one a few days ago. Uh, we actually raft around this famous horseshoe bend. It's about 1,100 feet down there on the river. It's very tiny if you're looking from the top there. So we've it's it's smooth sailing. It's not whitewater rafting, so it's a family-friendly trip. We spent another day walking on the rim, the Kaibab limestone there up at the top of the south rim, looking one mile down to the Colorado River, giving scientific lectures all along the way, showing there's no way the canyon was carved out by the Colorado River over millions of years. And we make it so simple and so powerful. So you get to see a site that's just phenomenal, but then it ties it into the authority of Scripture. You can trust the Bible cover to cover, even the Genesis flood account, chapters 6 through 8. There's so much uh, evidence. It's just overwhelming. You get to see it for yourself. Uh, we also stop and see some dinosaur footprints, which is really cool. It's on an Indian reservation. You can walk right by the prints. They're right there. And then we also stop and get a photo op. There's this massive rock. We get the whole group from the bus to go out and get a picture before it falls over and kills everyone. <laughs> it's, it's very stable, but it's just kind of a fun picture and memory for the trip. Some people stay a little longer. and There's a lot uh, of other things to do in the area. This is famous Antelope Canyon. I took this picture with my phone. Um, I stayed uh, extra time with my sister and brother-in-law. They came on one of my trips. So there's a lot of other things to do there. I'd say grab a brochure but you're not at a live talk right now, but you can go to our website and get all the details if you're ever interested in doing something like that. We have a one of everything special, blah, blah, blah. Keep moving here. We have a free email newsletter. You can sign up right online. It's free. comes out once a month. We have a lot of interesting information in it. You'll also see my speaking schedule. Um, I speak a lot of places all over the country and, and out of the country. Uh, I have live stream broadcasts that I've done, and we've archived all of those on our website. We talk about climate change and COVID and supposed evidence for evolution and a lot of, a lot of topics, a broad range. You can watch all those for free. I write uh, a question of the month article to get you to think a little deeper. One of the questions was, should you take the Bible literally? I always tell skeptics, no, I don't, I don't take the Bible literally because they say, well, you're, you're a Christian. You take the Bible literally. And I say, no, I don't. And Christians are like, what are you talking about? You don't take the Bible literally? I say, no, of course not. And then I tell them I take it contextually, which means the portions in the Bible that were written as literal historical narrative, I take very literally. The portions that are written as poetry, I take poetically. 
I also take it very seriously and I take it truthfully. And I think the Bible is true from cover to cover in everything it says. But sometimes it conveys truth to us through poetry. When it says God protects us with his wings, it's not trying to teach us God has feathers. It's trying to teach us he protects us, but it's using poetry. So I take that portion very seriously and it's teaching us truth, but it's using poetic language. So you need to take the Bible by its context the same way you would take any other book out there. If you just tell the skeptic you take the Bible literally, they could call you out on a lot of portions that you don't take literally. And you say, okay, well, maybe not that portion. Okay, well, maybe not that portion. So you're better off tell, telling them you believe the Bible cover to cover. It's completely true. No errors. You take it all seriously. But some of that's conveyed through historical narrative. Some of it's conveyed through poetry. So questions of the month will get you to think a little bit deeper. That way they're all posted online as well. And then engagement requests if someone ever wants me to speak somewhere. 37 years I've been speaking, have never charged a penny, and never will. We just simply ask that um, travel expenses be covered and we accept honorariums, but there's never a charge for the engagement. Uh, again, we just ask that you cover for me to get from where I live in Wisconsin to wherever the speaking engagement is. And if I speak once or 10 times, there's never a charge. So you can get that information on our website, which is just thestartingpointproject.com. So all the resources are there. You can sign up for the free email newsletter. You can see some videos there. You can read all the questions of the month. With that, we will go into a short segment of Q&A. You can ask any question you want, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and go back to video here and uh, hopefully be able to answer any questions that you might have. So we should be uh, stopped at this point and, and back to Donnie. <laughs> Jay, fantastic Jay. presentation. Yeah. I love the visuals. And I love the PowerPoint presentation. We've had a ton of good uh, feedback in the chat. We've had uh, over 80 people enjoying this uh, presentation live. So uh, I've got a ton of questions. I, I could comment all day on uh, all the amazing points you made uh, dismantling evolution. One thing I'd like to comment on was something you said at the very beginning of your presentation in regard to the 27 lectures <laughs> that you got to uh, enjoy and, and benefit from in three days. I mean, that's three yeah. days and, and you're an expert at that point. So. Well, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, anyone sitting through something like that, it was coming from all different areas of, of science. And I took a lot of notes, but I needed help with some of that. And that's why I went back out to visit Dr. John Sanford to help me fully understand some of those concepts. But then I like, once it, I get it, I can put it into an analogy to help other people understand it as well. Right. Right. And, and, and I like your style. Uh, again, lots of good feedback from the, from, from the chat, Jay. Um, one thing I guess I'll ask before I get into some of these uh, audience questions has to do with the, with Dr. John Sanford. I highly recommend his book, Genetic Entropy. And, you know, he's been a huge blessing. And this, this idea of uh, genetic entropy, right? Genetic degeneration, most mutations, you pointed this out, Jay, in your presentation that the uh, vast majority of mutations are, are deleterious but they are uh, what's called effectively neutral or, or nearly neutral, as in selection can't see them. They're invisible. So they build up over time and they lead to uh, extinction, degeneration, genetic sickness. Um, I've heard, and I'm sure you have, the evolutionist tries to say, well, this isn't necessarily a problem because natural selection will remove these, these deleterious mutations. But as we've pointed out, they're invisible to selection. So they'll say, well, enough will build up, Jay, to the point where eventually selection can see them and then remove the, the damage from, from the equation. Do you believe that that's a, a plausible solution? It's really not. I mean, it's what's, what it's called is a rescuing device. And there's nothing wrong with a rescuing device. What all that is, is when you're challenged in your belief, you try to come up with some reason why that's really not a challenge. You come up with a rescuing device. The question isn't whether or not you have a rescuing device. It's, is it a reasonable rescuing device? And when they say, okay, you're right. Most of the, the mutations are, are negative or deleterious, but they're only slightly bad. That's actually the problem. It's like buying a brand new car and you're driving down the road and one molecule oxidizes and turns into rust. 
is is that a negative thing? Yeah, but it's only slightly negative. I mean, you're not even going to know. Um, so it doesn't really make a big difference. Well, then another molecule. Is it is it bad? Is it negative? Yeah, but it's just small. Well, eventually they start to accumulate and you can see the rust and then your car starts falling apart. So it becomes a problem. Like you said, natural selection doesn't weed it out. And what that means is these small negative effects don't stop the creature from reproducing. It can still reproduce. So it's passing on these negative effects. And one Russian scientist said, how come we haven't died a hundred times over? Meaning if we've been evolving for 6 million years from an ape -like creature and we keep adding maybe a hundred or more of these mistakes to our DNA, we shouldn't be able to function. It's called error catastrophe. You take Microsoft Office software and you make random changes to the code. You can do that a little bit and some of the features might not work anymore. Eventually it won't even boot up anymore because you reached error catastrophe. Well, we should have reached error catastrophe in the human genome a long time ago with accumulation of these small detrimental mutations. So even if you get a rare, 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 rare positive mutation, you've got so many more negative mutations, you're gonna kill the thing that happened to have that positive one and it was only one and you'd need you know, millions of them really working together to produce you know, new structures and all that. So it's, it is their response, but it's not a, a plausible response. Amen. Amen, Jay. It, it's a rescue device, as, as you put it. And, uh, you know, the, the, it, it's a fact that this reality of, of genetic entropy puts shelf lives on genomes. So if, if species cannot persist for millions of years into the future, they could not have persisted for millions of years into the past. And so you mentioned at the end of your, your presentation there that you have uh, books and material answering a number of important questions. And one of them is, did man live to 900? Well, with the reality of genetic entropy, if we've accumulated many harmful deleterious mutations, if we go back to a point in time where we have a, a lesser genetic load, would this have been a time of, of increased longevity and therefore maybe a time where, where man did live a lot longer than, than they live today, Jay? I, I think it's a partial factor, but probably not the biggest factor. Some people tend to say, well, you know, you had the flood. The flood comes and the atmosphere was very different after the flood, and which, which is true when they say that caused the lifespans to, to drop off. Well, if it was the atmosphere, Noah would have died shortly after rather than living, you know, 300 or whatever years after the flood. And his sons lived quite a long time. So it certainly couldn't have just been the atmosphere. It seems like very likely God allowed, did something or allowed something to happen with our genetics, specifically something called telomeres, which are on the end of the chromosomes or little hairs. Every time a cell reproduces, they get chopped off and you can only chop them off so many times and then the cell can't reproduce, which is a good thing because as these cells get mutations, you don't want them copying forever and ever and ever. That's one of the major problems with cancer. You get bad cells and they just keep copying themselves, passing on the, the harmful effects. So that's what seems to limit our lifespan of these telomeres. So if the telomeres were longer before or whatever it was, you could easily have people living longer, less mutation buildup to a different atmosphere, maybe causing less mutations. At the time of the flood, something seems to have happened with with our DNA. And then after that as well, you probably do have more harmful effects due to, in a sense, more initially inbreeding a smaller gene pool that you're working with. It was not a moral problem at that point. They needed to marry their own offspring, you know, uh, the children marrying their you know, cousins and things like that until you get to a certain point. And later Moses said, okay, not necessary anymore. And you're not supposed to for a number of reasons. That was a much longer time later. So initially, yeah, the atmosphere is a bit different, maybe more harmful radiation coming through. They're going to pick up mutational rates, but also a limited gene pool, which is going to cause issues as well. So all that combined uh, could easily answer the shortened longevity of lifespans. And it's interesting when you plot the lifespans before the flood, they're all, you know, way up there and then you know, generally 900s. And then after the flood, they just taper off. And when you actually plot it, it forms a curve. And the curve seems to match the degeneration that we're seeing today with mutations. So you either have to think that Moses made up ages to try to match some genetic curve that would be there in the future, or 
Moses recorded their actual ages, and it's following that curve because it matches what's happening genetically today that we're discovering through modern science. So it, it just all fits in beautifully. And that, that book, Genetic Entropy, is very powerful that Dr. Sanford wrote. Amen. Fantastic response. I appreciate how thorough you are. Uh, Jay, a perfect biological decay curve. So, you know, either uh, the, the biblical patriarchs, the authors fabricated this data, but to do so, they'd have to have advanced knowledge in, in mathematics and in biology to do that. So I, I've heard the critics say, because you mentioned inbreeding, and I've heard them say, well, Adam and Eve, you know, we would have started 6,000 years ago with, with two people. And so they'll say, well, then you would have an, an inbreeding problem. And we know the consequences of, of inbreeding, how it reveals the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. But you pointed out in, in your presentation that um, in, according to the design hypothesis, the original created kinds, for example, they would have been uh, front loaded or, or they would have had built in genetic diversity. So the question is, would this have been a problem for the creation model if there were no hypothetically mutations at creation to come to the forefront? Sure. Great question. And again, a skeptic may say it's a silly Bible story. You got Adam and Eve and they have Cain and Abel and Cain kills Abel. Who does Cain marry? Well, then you could point out, well, Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. OK, so Cain now has brothers and sisters. Say so you you going to tell me Cain married his sister, and many Christians haven't really thought about that. They didn't realize that, and they cringe. Like I have to say that I believe that Cain married his sister. Like how could I do that? That's so immoral. And but when you think it through, we believe that Cain most likely he married his sister for three reasons, and it makes so much sense. Number one, uh, he didn't have any other options. The only other woman around the planet at that point would have been his mom, and she's already taken he would have only had sisters. So number one, he didn't have any other options. Number two, it was not a moral problem. Cain would have never said, oh, I can't marry my sister, that's gross. No one would have ever said that, would not have crossed his mind to think there's anything morally wrong with it because God never said that. Thirdly, it was not a genetic problem because Adam and Eve had perfect DNA. Even after they sinned, I didn't touch their DNA and when they had Cain and Abel, they could have easily had perfect DNA. Eventually, a mistake probably crept in here or there or whatever, but it's a very, very small amount. So as you marry a close relative, it's not a problem. Um, fast forwarding really quick. Today, if a brother and sister marry each other, other than being, it's definitely a moral issue now, but other than that, it's a genetic problem because they both got their DNA from mom and dad. So you got mom and dad copying their DNA and giving it to their son. Mom and dad copy DNA and give it to their daughter. Mom and dad have quite a few mutations in their DNA. So they're giving all those mistakes to their son and their daughter. The son and daughter have similar mistakes. If they marry each other and they combine their genes, they can each have the same mistake. And now when that gene is needed to develop the valve in the heart, it doesn't matter which one the baby is going to use. They're both bad. It can't develop the valve in the heart. The baby will die. So that's what causes genetic problems today is similar mistakes. But if you marry a distant relative today, which we're, we're all related, we all go back to Adam and Eve. And after that, we go back to the three couples coming off the ark. We are related. But if you marry a distant relative, you have different mistakes. So you might have a mistake to make the valve in the heart, but your spouse doesn't. So when the baby develops, and in a sense, it kind of looks like, oh, this one's messed up. Let's not use that one. We got another copy over here. That one's good. We'll use that one. And the vast majority of times, it does that perfectly, and the baby's fine. That's why today it's a genetic problem, and it is a moral issue because God gave Moses the laws in Leviticus. You don't marry your mom's uh, husband, your dad's wife, your sister, your brother. All those things came in you know, well, well after Noah. So it's a moral problem. It's a genetic problem. And you'd you have other choices. You don't have to marry your sister. But initially, didn't have a choice. It was not a moral issue, and it was not a genetic issue. Another fantastic answer, brother. And this is especially why I believe that evolutionist, evolutionary theory has, has such a major problem. A, a fatal blow to evolutionary theory is the fact that this inbreeding, this accumulation of, of uh, typographical errors over time is a sneak preview into where species are going genetically uh, genetically in, in the future because it's the evolutionist that explains all novel variation 
as a result of, of these mistakes over time. But as you're pointing out, according to the design model, Adam and Eve would have had perfect DNA, no, no mutations. Mutations would have come about uh, after creation and, of course, after, after the flood. Um, I'm going to put this question up on screen, Jay. And again, I really appreciate the answers here. So this comes in from Jamie Johnson. And Jamie says, I found this really interesting and he made it easy to understand. I completely agree. I love your slides as well, Jay. Uh, would love to see more. Amen. So Jamie asked, can I ask, what's the deal with people saying we have 50% matching DNA with a banana? And, and then they'll say, you know, we've got 98 or 99%. Uh, shared DNA with chimpanzees and, and so on and so forth. And any thoughts on that, Jay? Sure. It's something that's thrown out there a lot. Um, most school systems and universities are probably teaching that we're 98, 99% identical in our DNA to a chimp. And I don't believe that those teachers and professors are lying because to lie, you have to know something isn't true and say it anyway. I think what happens is a lot of these teachers and professors, they haven't heard, they haven't been updated. And so they're just teaching what's been in the books for a long time and what's in articles. So I, I try to give them a break and realize they, they probably have only heard one side and they're probably really excited about being teachers and professors and they're nice people. They're not out there specifically trying to lie. Somewhere, I'm sure someone is, but most of them, no, they're just teaching the only thing they've ever heard and it, it makes sense to them. So with the, the DNA similarity to, to chimps, um, that's complete myth. When they initially came up with those numbers, they had a pretty good bead on the human genome, our own DNA that kind of mapped it out fairly well. They understood it fairly well. They didn't get too far with the chimp DNA at that point, and they were trying to compare. And what happened was any segment that they compared, if they didn't match up well, in a, in a sense, they just tossed out. The ones that were similar, they matched up and then they came up with 98, 99% similarity. Well, you're going to do that if you're throwing out the stuff that doesn't match. And we would expect a fairly high percentage of similarity because most of what life does is similar. All life forms have to take in food, whatever their food source is. They have to, you know, nutrients, they have to digest it, whatever that means. They have to get rid of waste. They have to be able to repair their DNA. They have to be able to produce proteins. They have to be able to reproduce themselves. All these things are identical. So if you have to copy DNA, why would that code be different in every living thing? If it was different in every living thing, someone could say, can't be just one God, otherwise you'd see the same design here, but there's multiple designs, so there must be multiple gods. And it don't make sense. If you come up with a design that works, you're going to use that. In multiple places so when you see that we expect a fairly high percentage of similarity and our latest findings are maybe closer to 80 percent similar to chimps which we should be pretty high again because we're doing the same functions yes we look different on the outside but it doesn't take a large segment or genes to produce something that might look visually very different most of the DNA is handling all the internal stuff that's going on the inside. Some statistics show us down to maybe only 70%, but whether it's 70 or 80, that is a massive, massive difference. If we have 300 million, 300, uh, 3 billion, sorry, 3 billion, you know, nucleotides in our DNA or letters, 1% different, that's 300 million. 300 million is 1% of 3 billion. So conservatively, if we were only like 1% different, there'd be 300 million differences in our DNA between chimps and humans. And there's an article called The Waiting Time Problem by Dr. John Sanford, Dr. John Baumgartner, and two other scientists that blow that away saying you cannot, even in the millions of years of evolutionary history, get the required differences that we see between chimps and humans today. And with the similarity of bananas, yeah, when you look at it at a certain angle, there's about 50% similarity because the banana has to take in nutrients and process it and repair its DNA and copy its DNA. So all those things bring you up to maybe 50%. The other 50% accounts for the massive, massive, diff massive differences between uh, bananas and humans. <laughs> Again, Jay, another fantastic answer. That is what I call clip worthy. You know, I, I could take that out and, and just do a whole separate clip. Why do humans sure. share uh, DNA with, with bananas? And uh, you brought up so many good points. 
including this waiting time problem. I mean, 300 million DNA differences. That's a lot of uh, DNA differences to fixate in, in a short amount of time. And one observation uh, that I find most evolutionists don't want to discuss when, when they're talking about this DNA similarity is specifically uh, the Y chromosome, which is uniparentally inherited DNA, right? We get that from, from our fathers. Well, it turns out when they sequence the chimpanzee Y chromosome, it's only about when you consider overall architecture, gene content, and size differences, Jay, it's only about 35% the same. <laughs> so that is a ton of, of genetic differences so, and just massive yeah, chromosomal massive. rearrangements to account yeah. for in, in just six million years. Yeah, and the whole thing that relates to secular scientists making the claim that they believe that we all on the entire planet, we have all come from one male and one female. Now, before you think that sounds like the Bible, they're quick to say, no, this isn't the biblical Adam and Eve. Don't get excited. Yes, but there was one male and one female, but there were other people living at the time, but their genetics didn't get passed on. Just the one male and one female. And they initially said this male and female didn't even live together at the same time, which sounds kind of funny, but it could work out genetically. Theoretically, you'll skip that. But as they studied it further, the breaking news is, surprise, uh, Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve actually apparently lived together at the same time because they're looking at more realistic mutational rates and all that. And they know we came from one male by studying that Y chromosome. They can tell we all share that one Y chromosome. And then the female side, uh, there's some, some DNA in the mitochondria of the cell, which is the powerhouse of the cell, and only females pass that on. So by studying Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, they've determined one male and one female, and now they realize that they did live together at the same time. And when you take into account real mutational rates, not theoretical, you go back about 6,000 years. They also believe that in our not too distant past, almost <laughs> everyone became extinct and only right. a small group survived to repopulate the planet. Now, before you say, well, that sounds like the flood, they don't get excited. This isn't the Genesis flood and the acute arc story um, because this happened further back in history and blah, blah, blah. Well, why would they even say that? The reason they say that is when you look at the genetics of everyone on the planet, it should be very widespread if we've been evolving right. for at least six million years from an ape like creature. But when they examine it, it's very narrowly focused. So they said rescuing device. Okay, what happened was it did spread out over millions of years, but then a catastrophic event occurred where almost everyone died out and a small population survived to then start repopulating the earth. And that wasn't too long ago, so it hasn't widened out very far. What's interesting is that's the genetics of people. Then they said, let's take a look at the genetics of animals. They came to the same conclusion. It seems like almost Every animal on the planet today was almost wiped out in the past. A small group survived to repopulate about the same same time that people were repopulating the planet. Well, surprise, I have a talk that's called Surprise. The Bible explains that, and that's one of them. That the Bible explains why they're seeing that, because there was a biblical flood where you had eight people survive, six of which repopulated the planet. And from what I've read, it seems like you can also divide up the genetics of people across the planet into three major categories, which... You had three couples coming off the ark, so maybe that accounts for that. Amen. Amen. So many great points that everybody needs to hear. Some of the most amazing evidence for uh, biblical creation. Uh, Jay, actually one of my favorite topics, so I'm really glad that, that you brought that up. It's such powerful evidence for our position, and no surprise to the biblical creations. I mean, the Bible says God created two people, Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, that restricts what? Genetic diversity. Today, humans have low genetic diversity. As you pointed out, every single human being, we're about 99.999% the same. There should be a, a much higher levels of genetic diversity if, again, as you pointed out, we've been evolving for millions of years from the Australopithecines to Habilis to Erectus to Homo sapiens. And what do they do? A rescue device, a, a hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck, some near extinction event that we have no evidence for at all, really. And um, one of my favorite studies that, that you just pointed to, Jay, uh, that, that says over 90% of all species have arisen at the same time because of, again, low levels of, of genetic diversity. So uh, some of the best evidence for, for a literal Adam and Eve is where? It, in our genetics. We've literally discovered the, the first couple. 
So great responses, brother. Um, okay, so the, this next question that comes in uh, is kind of similar to the uh, DNA question, Jay. And what the evolution evolutionists will say is, well, it's it's a little more complicated than that. It, it's it's the fact that what we see in the biological world is is a nested hierarchy, right? Why are humans more similar to chimpanzees? in morphology, anatomy, and genetics than humans are to, let's say, a fish or a dog. You know, why did God create like that? And they'll say that, that this observation is evidence for descent with modification. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that, I guess, the nested hierarchy argument? Sure, you could look at things that way. And if evolution were true, you would expect us to be more similar to a, a chimp than a duck or a worm that you would expect that and typically that's what you see we are genetically more similar to a chimp than a worm if god created things you would expect us to be more similar to a chimp than a worm because physically our physiology is more closely related to a chimp than a worm you would expect that so you have two expectations right up front and then you look at the real world what's going on with the dna and um, you can try to make an argument to support the evolutionary narrative. You can make an argument to support the biblical narrative. When you try to support the evolutionary narrative, you have to pick and choose because sometimes you see data that backs up two things should be similar, and they are. Two things shouldn't be, and they're not. But there are too many times when things are more similar to each other than others that shouldn't be. And so you don't get this nice, clean, what they call the, the Darwinian evolutionary tree that branches out. It's so crisp and clean. And they've got uh, ends, uh, real creatures on the ends of all those branches, but where they come down to the nodes where they split off, they don't have the creatures there. They theorize there was something that split off into this, into that. And when you map it out genetically, you don't get this nice clean tree. You get this tangled up bush and you get, they say, well, maybe the genetics went sideways and this and that. So it's not this crisp, clean picture that we've seen with the Darwinian tree of life. It's this branching hierarchy in, in um, bush that's kind of messed up but it still fits in cleanly with scripture that things were designed to carry out certain purposes so if you have two creatures that are going to do the same thing you know walk on two legs and eat fruit or meat or whatever you would expect the dna to do that to be very similar it's consistent with a design model um, but it's inconsistent with the evolutionary model Sometimes um, the, the study of homology, the similarity in creatures, you look at the, you know, the bat wing and the, the five digits, and they say these creatures have evolved from each other because they have similar structure. Right. They, they would have similar structure if they have evolved from each other, but they would also have similar structure if they were designed by the same designer and needed the same purpose. So you could use similarity to support either view to a certain extent. If you can use certain evidence and it might fit somewhat comfortably on both sides, then it's not evidence for either side if it can be used to explain both sides. Right. So in a sense, to a certain point, homology shouldn't be used to prove one side or the other. If you get deeper in it, especially with genetics, then you see the consistency breaks down on the evolutionary side because they can pick and choose some to support, but they can't look at all the examples because it totally goes against what they would expect. Amen. The perfect answer. And a lot of the lines of evidence, uh, Jay, that they do point to, like homology, you know, shared structures in, in the biological world, as, as you've pointed out, it, it's non-discriminatory evidence. It's agnostic to the debate because for the most part, both models can can explain it. But but it's the inconsistencies from the evolutionist explanation that, that are manifested so frequently. Like you said, you can get totally different trees depending on uh, the various structures or, or genes. Even the Y chromosome we were talking about, it actually turns out that the uh, chimpanzee Y chromosome and, and the human Y chromosome and the gorilla Y chromosome, the human and the gorilla have a more similar Y chromosome than the humans and the chimpanzees. Well, I thought we, we split from, from a, a a common ancestor with the chimpanzee so you know there's one break in, in the hierarchy or this idea of convergent evolution i'd be curious as to your yes. thoughts on that where you've got like the ichthyosaur a shark and a dolphin they've got these you know streamlined bodies they look like they're built for 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 the ocean but yet evolutionists invoke independent origins for these structures and traits convergent evolution but yet just looking at them you'd think that that, that these structures are homologous when they're not 
Yeah, that's a huge problem. Uh, when they find two things that they believe evolved from a common ancestor, they will point out the, the similar structures and the similar genes that produce that similar function because they had a common ancestor, so it got passed on to both branches. But like you pointed out, sometimes we see two creatures, they don't believe evolved from a common ancestor. They each had their kind of their own roots, but they have the same genes. So they have to believe that they just coincidentally evolved by accident, random actions of nature, the same traits and the same genes, even though they're not related to each other. And that that's a stretch of the imagination to believe that that just happened. So they call it convergent evolution. They just accidentally evolved the same thing <laughs> without any rationale behind it. There's, and there are a lot of examples like that where they cannot explain it, but they, they will pick and choose data. And that's what ends up in the textbook. So you see an example and you think you can't argue with that. It's like, wait a minute, show all the examples. And then you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't look good at all. How come there's not consistency here? Amen. Amen. And, and for our model, the design model, the separate ancestry model, that fits perfectly. We would say creatures that they have to invoke convergent evolution for, like the ichthyosaur, the shark and, and the dolphin, they belong to independent ancestries. The, there is no no relationship. We don't have to invoke these, as I like uh, the, the way you put it, Jay, rescue devices. Um so I, I just noticed the time and it's a blast talking to you. You're an encyclopedia of, of information. Jay, you're a jack of all trades. This is awesome. Uh, so I want to respect your time. We are coming at the hour and a half mark. We still got over 80 people in the live chat. So um, I, I think you're going to be a fan favorite uh, at this point. Your presentations are, are so great. So we'll kind of wind it down with, with this last one or two questions that have come in from the audience. And again, Jay, I want to thank you so much for your time. So this one comes in from Cool Jesus. I appreciate the question, Cool Jesus. And uh, he asks, question for Jay. If an animal kind diversifies into a different species, so let's say, you know, a, a cat archetype off the ark, and, and from that archetype you get maybe leopards, lions, tigers. Uh, the questioner asks, doesn't that require beneficial genetic mutations? Great question. How do we account for the great variety that we have on this planet? Um, I'll just use one example. I'll keep it brief. We've got 350 breeds of dogs on the planet today. Um, all scientists, virtually, virtually all scientists, whether they're atheists or Christians or in between, they believe that all the dogs we have around, the domesticated dogs, these breeds, came from wolves, which... Some people say, well, wait a minute, that sounds like evolution. You don't believe that, do you? No, I, I believe that. But the way you get a Dalmatian or a Dachshund or a Labrador, um, get those from wolves, is not by taking the genetic information in a wolf and adding new stuff to it to get a new species. You generally are getting rid of information. So a purebred Dalmatian or Doberman they might look cool. You might like the looks of it, but it's not as healthy as a wolf because a wolf has a great variety of genetic information that it can adjust to different, you know, environments and all that. But when you get down to a purebred, you can breed Dobermans until you're blue in the face. You'll never get the wolf back. You have lost genetic information. So is a Doberman different than a wolf? Yes. Do we call it a different species? Yes. Did we get it by adding new information? No, we got it by losing information. So we can produce a variety, still always within limits, and we are going downhill to do so. It's not a mutation that's creating new information and getting new features and, and greater and greater over time. It, we're going downhill. We can see that with the dogs. The dogs are getting less and less healthy over time. It is a change. And they can call it a different species. And I don't have a problem with them saying there are new species on the planet because we see that. They have a hard time defining species because they'll say it's generally a group of animals that can't interbreed with another. But dogs, dingoes, coyotes, and wolves can all breed together. But they say they're all different species. But you can breed them together. So it, it's kind of a struggle for them to even define species. So we get varieties. We've used this word species, which is fine. But you have to ask, how did you get the new species? Did you add new information? No, it's headed downhill every time. Again, I got to say, and I mean it, the perfect answer. I mean, the evolutionary community and even your your big time old earth creation or theistic evolutionist ministries like BioLogos, they'll oftentimes claim that, you know, young earth creationists believe in more evolution than them. 
right? We believe in hyperevolution. But as you're pointing out, no, the, the new varieties that we see is actually due to a downhill process. We're going from a greater state of DNA diversity to a lesser state of, of DNA diversity, a reduction in uh, you know allelic variability to get fancy here, I guess. Uh, but the evolutionary community, they require increases in phenotypic complexity. They require lots of time to build up these DNA differences through mutations. While our model, as you've been pointing out, our model starts off with, with the DNA variety that selection can, can call upon. Uh, so it's not hyper evolution by, by by any means, really. Uh, that's a great response, Jay. And uh, we're now up to 90 people in the live chat. So I, I hope you, we can have you on again in the future uh, because you are a blessing. Love your, your presentation. And I love how you uh, respond to these great questions. So, Jay, I do want to hand it to you uh, for some final words, final thoughts as we uh, as, as we work towards wrapping it up. Sure. I'll close with this. I'll keep it brief. Um, the stuff we've covered today is, is cool. It, it really is. But I really want to encourage all the viewers, our ultimate authority is in Scripture. And the only real power is in Scripture. God doesn't guarantee us that when we tell others about DNA that it's going to do anything. We're dealing with a spiritual issue. These skeptics, almost all the skeptics I meet are really smart people. They're very sincere and they ask great questions. They are typically not lacking facts. They're lacking the proper foundation to interpret those facts because facts don't speak for themselves. They need to be interpreted. We should spend more time discussing their starting point, their worldview. If they realize their foundation is, is weak, they will conclude themselves. They shouldn't use that to do their interpretations. Rather than us putting Band-Aids on these other issues, we need to be talking about the ultimate source of authority, which is God's Word. So there's no guarantee mentioning DNA is going to do anything. No, God can graciously use that as part of the communication, so there's nothing wrong with talking about that. But here's the cool thing. God guarantees us when we share his word, when we're actually sharing scripture, it will never return void. That's Isaiah 55, 11. It says God's word will never return void. It will always accomplish what he wants. And the way I see that is when you share scripture, it will either be used to convict and convert someone, which is what God wants, but he's not going to force that. Or secondly, it will be used to condemn them that they heard the truth, but they chose to reject it. And it's not up to us to force their decision. We're just the middlemen. We're there to share God's word. If they have a problem with what we're saying, it's really not with us. It's with God's word, and they will be accountable for that. So share as much scripture as you can. Don't start out talking about DNA or age of the earth or stuff. Try to share the only hope we have in Jesus Christ. If they push back and say, I don't believe the Jesus stuff because the Bible is wrong with its creation account and the flood, then you can ask them, is that a serious hang-up for you? And if they say yes, then you can step into that temporarily with the idea to get back to Jesus. So the, the, our authority is really in God's Word. Study it and know what it says. Stick with it. Uh, there's never a conflict between science and the Bible, only between some scientist opinions and the Bible. So I would encourage you greatly with that and be looking for opportunities to share your faith. That's the only reason we're here. Otherwise, when you become a Christian, God would just zap you up, take you to heaven, be done. That'd be <laughs> better for all of us. So look for those opportunities. I appreciate you taking time to hear me go blah, blah, blah. And I look forward to being back on the program again sometime. Well, I appreciate those very important final words, uh, Jay, and I could listen to you all day and, and so could the audience. So I do look forward to having you back on. And uh, we're not necessarily called to win arguments. We're called, we're called to win souls. And uh, presentations such as yours are here to you know provide the truth to those willing to listen and hopefully plant a seed. So Jay, again, thank you so much for your presentation and your very thorough answers. I appreciate your time as I know how busy you are. So anybody in the chat, please uh, check out the description box of this video. I've got all the relevant links to uh, Jay's series of videos, his YouTube channel, his website, and where you can go to uh, check out his books and, and purchase his, his material. So again, to the audience, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for being so engaged in this important topic and a lot of fantastic questions. So uh, until we meet again, Standing for Truth is out. This is Biblical Creation Basics, 
Episode 5, The Mother of All Living. The Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. The Bible is extremely clear when it comes to human origins. Genesis 1:27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Jesus Christ himself in Mark 10:6 said, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. God created the first two humans, Adam and Eve, just thousands of years ago. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And Genesis 3.20 says, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Bible tells us that man was specially created and did not come about through evolutionary processes. Humans are an independent creation made in the image of God and are not related to any other form of life including the great apes. If the Bible's claim of human origins is indeed true, we should be able to test its claims to the empirical scientific data. We have actually discovered our first couple in our genetics. We have two amazing DNA sections known as the uni parentally inherited DNA compartment. These important pieces of DNA can answer this question of ancestry and tell us whether the Bible's account of human origins is true or not. Our mitochondrial DNA is the non-recombining DNA compartment that we only get from our mothers. And the Y chromosome, another non-recombining piece of DNA we only get from our fathers. In the process of creating sperm and egg cells, chromosomes line up and exchange genetic information. This is recombination. What this means is that offspring will have differing combinations of genes on each of its chromosomes than its parents had. This is an important way to generate genetic variety. In this episode, we will focus primarily on the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA does not have a partner to recombine with. This is why these unique pieces of DNA, the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, get passed on nearly unchanged from generation to generation. We will focus on the details of the Y chromosome in a future episode. The mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome give us a way to look deep into the past and answer the important question of ancestry. Those that hold to deep time evolution and reject a biblical creation model of ancestry have based their dates off of indirect lines of evidence. They use the assumption-based method and as a result, end up calibrating the data. The molecular clock, which we've mentioned before, is based on the idea that mutations occur in empty DNA at a pretty regular rate. But since that rate of change isn't the same across all of humanity, the clock needs to be calibrated. The clock needs to be calibrated. The clock needs to be calibrated. The other non-recombining stretch of DNA, the Y chromosome. And when it comes to how far back this Y chromosome goes, the latest molecular clock calibrations, 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 they assume common ancestry. They assume human evolution is true and they assume deep time. And then they calibrate the data with the assumptions of their paradigm. They will say mitochondrial Eve lived about 200,000 years ago in Africa. This is based off of geology and archaeology. Indirect, 
lines of evidence. They are not necessarily determining this answer based off direct genetic evidence. We can measure how quickly DNA changes or mutates over time. For example, if we were to look at my DNA and my kids' DNA, or my DNA and my parents' DNA, we would see genetic differences. Mistakes happen from generation to generation. In mitochondrial DNA, mistakes occur. And when we measure the rate of this change, we find that it is fast. A lot faster than secular evolutionists would have expected or predicted. We can take grandmothers and granddaughters, or we can even take two ladies who we know share a common great, great, great grandmother in the distant past. We can look at their DNA sequences, their mitochondrial DNA sequences. And by comparing them, we can determine a mutation rate. This is through straightforward and empirical means. The answer we have is very much inconsistent with deep time evolution and universal common ancestry. The rate is far too fast, as has been indicated. The number of DNA differences and also the mutation rate itself fits perfectly with the biblical model of ancestry. The data that we have for this specific uniparentally inherited DNA compartment has actually led to an active research program in determining the history of civilization and even making novel testable predictions on mutation rates in people groups whose rates have not yet been measured. And the results have been fascinating. These amazing results have been possible simply because the reality is that the history of humanity only goes back 6,000 years. There did not have to be evidence for one female ancestor of all people on the planet today. Eve, the mother of us all, has a unique piece of DNA that is exactly what we would expect if the Genesis account of human origins were true. There was every conceivable reason to have learned that this unique piece of DNA, this mitochondrial DNA ancestor was not so unique. This mitochondrial DNA ancestor could have shared many lines with chimpanzees if we really did share relationship with them. If human evolution were true and humans were indeed related to the great apes, this should have been reflective in the mitochondrial DNA. Stay tuned for an episode focusing primarily on the Y chromosome. Biblical Creation Basics, Episode 6, Y Chromosome, Noah. The best evidence for the biblical model of ancestry and the special creation of Adam and Eve, the first couple, is in our genetics. Episode 5 of Biblical Creation Basics, the mother of us all focused primarily on mitochondrial Eve. There exists overwhelming evidence for the one woman of whom we have all descended from. The one female ancestor of all people on the planet today. What we know about the mitochondrial DNA is exactly what we would expect if the Genesis account of human origins were true. There is no disputing the fact that there is one single mitochondrial DNA ancestor and one single Y chromosomal DNA ancestor of all people today. This episode will focus primarily on Y chromosome Noah. The Bible in Genesis 1:26 says, And God said, Let us 
make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Genesis 2, 7 says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, made it clear that Adam and Eve were the first two people created just thousands of years ago. Mark 10, 6 says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. There exists a unique piece of DNA called the Y chromosome. This DNA compartment is unique in the same way as the mitochondrial DNA, as it is also uniparentally inherited DNA. It is also non-recombining. We get this piece of DNA, the Y chromosome, from our fathers, if we are male. This piece of important DNA is passed on unbroken from father to son. Every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical. There is extremely low genetic variation in the male Y chromosome. And every single Y chromosome in the world can be traced back to one single Y chromosomal ancestor in the not so distant past. From time to time, a mistake occurs. And every time this transpires, a new branch in the family tree is generated. This is where we can examine all the branches in the world and determine that they go back to a single person. This single person is not a chimpanzee, it is a man. And this man lived a few thousand years ago. Who is this? Evolutionists have coined our last Y chromosomal ancestor, Y chromosome Adam, but in fact, it is Y chromosome Noah. Since we now know the Y chromosome mutates fast, a lot faster than the evolutionary community has ever predicted, there ends up being on average three mutations per generation. And there ends up only being a few hundred mutations separating people worldwide. Then, our last Y chromosomal ancestor, Noah, existed just 4,500 years ago. This is all inconsistent with human evolution and common ancestry. The human Y chromosome is also very different from the chimpanzee Y chromosome. There are massive size differences between the human and the chimpanzee Y chromosomes, as well as major differences in architecture and gene content. Again, this was not expected by the evolutionary community. As we have seen, one of the best lines of evidence for the first couple, Adam and Eve, is in our genetics. Both mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Noah have been discovered by modern science. Our actual common ancestor probably lived as early as 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. All this shows that we are so closely related, more so than we could ever imagine. There is no disputing the fact that there is one single Y chromosome ancestor and one mitochondrial DNA ancestor. This is exactly what the Bible has predicted. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Biblical Creation Moments. If you are not yet subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And please share around this content as the truth is so important. God bless. As a quick reminder to everyone, 
hit that like button. It actually does help. Team Standing for Truth is out.